Order, please. The topic for late debate at the moment of interruption this evening has been forwarded by the Honourable Member for Sydney Member 2. Whereas the Nova Scotia Government is committed to phasing out coal by 2030 and it is crucial that workers and communities are at the heart of the transition with training, skills development, jobs in renewable energy and opportunities in the green economy. Therefore, be it resolved, the Government will focus on equity by ensuring communities that have traditionally been left out of the energy transition have the opportunity for skills training and new careers and jobs in the green economy. Submitted by the MLA for Sydney Member 2 at the moment of interruption. Moving on to daily routine. Presenting and reading petitions, the Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to table a petition from residents of East Stuyak, approximately 90 signatures, and the operative clause reads such. We, the undersigned, request the Government of Nova Scotia, and in particular Department of Highways, commit to the residents of East Stuyak area that they will review much needed road work this fall, prioritize and allocate budget dollars for work completion in the spring summer of 2022 for the Cloverdale Roadway from the corner of Alton Road heading east towards Middle Stuyak to where the paving presently ends just beyond the Bates Road and the graveling and repair work where needed continue beyond this point. I have affixed my signature uh, to this petition as per the rules of the House. The petition is tabled. Presenting reports of committees. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of Law Amendments, I'm directed to report that the committee has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 68, an act to amend Chapter 155 of the Revised Statutes of 1989, the Executive Council Act, and Chapter 376 of the Revised Statutes of 1989, the Public Service Act. Bill number 71, an act to dissolve tourism Nova Scotia. The committee recommends these bills to be favorable consideration of the House without amendment. Ordered that these bills be referred to the committee of the whole House on bills. Tabling reports, regulations and other papers. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And on behalf of the Minister of Housing, I'd like to table this uh, document. On a previous day in the House, the Minister was asked about uh, tabling uh, the, the number of uh, accessible buildings and houses uh, with, to do with his uh, portfolio. And on behalf of the Minister, I'd like to table that today. The report is tabled. <laughs> Statements by Ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Minister, Minister Gaelic Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whereas Mickey McNeil of Jamesville, Victoria County, is a cherished native Gaelic speaking elder and tradition bearer whose fascinating and entertaining Gaelic story, Lauren and the Mermaid, was recently published in both Gaelic and English by Braden Press in Dartmouth. And whereas fellow Gales, Dr. Seamus McDonald, friend and apprentice to Mickey and Miss Emily McDonald, illustrator and artist, contributed via Gaelic editing and graphic illustration of Mickey's story. And whereas the publication of Mickey's story provides a valuable resource to Gaelic language speakers and learners, and offers a keen insight into the cultural arts and expression and world view of the province's Gales. Therefore, be it resolved that the House of Assembly recognize and congratulate Mickey McNeil, Dr. Seamus McDonald, Emily McDonald, and Braden Press on their collective work to share Nova Scotia's rich Gaelic language and culture to the Gaelic community in the province and beyond. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution, whereas the foster care program is the backbone of Nova Scotia's child welfare system. And whereas the province has made small improvements to the program, but there is much more to do to create an enhanced system where children in care and foster families receive the supports they need. And whereas Nova Scotia looks to implement a new model for the province's foster care system that will include culturally relevant programs and placements and maintain and attract new foster families to accept children into their homes. And therefore, be it resolved that the redesign of the foster care program will provide better outcomes for children in the care of the province where foster families and children of diverse backgrounds will get the support they need to flourish. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for a waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Gaelic Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whereas Thai Skal Nadrakach, an independent Gaelic immersion school in Mabu, is the very first school through the medium of Gaelic to be established in North America. And whereas project team members Kenneth McKenzie, Joanne McIntyre, AJ Fraser, Dr. Seamus McDonald, Carmen MacArthur, and Kieran Walker diligi diligently work to plan, fundraise, and promote the opening of Thai Skal Nadrakach in September 2021. And whereas an independent Gaelic immersion school will provide an opportunity for school age children in the Mabu catchment area to learn through immersion in the language of the Gales in Nova Scotia and their cultural arts and expression. Therefore, be it resolved that the House of Assembly recognize and commend and congratulate Kenneth, Joanne, AJ, Dr. Seamus, Carmen, and Kieran on all their work, dedication, and commitment in bringing this historic Gaelic language and cultural development in the province to fruition. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please signify by saying aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Advanced Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Nova Scotia Community College provides students with industry-driven training for today and tomorrow's workforce through its 14 campuses across the province, and whereas NSCC teaches nearly 20,000 students each year and has a graduate success story whereby 94% of those NSCC graduates live and work right here in Nova Scotia. And whereas NSCC is celebrating the 25th year since the Nova Scotia Community Colleges Act was proclaimed, therefore be it resolved that all members of the House congratulate the Nova Scotia Community College on a successful 25 years, as we all look forward to seeing what they will accomplish over the next 25 years. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> Introduction of bills. Oh. We'll revert back to notices of motion. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas generations of young Nova Scotians have benefited from learning self-confidence and practicing a wide variety of life skills through the many opportunities offered by the 4-H program. And whereas the birthplace of 4-H in Nova Scotia is Heatherton, Antigonish County, which will celebrate 100 years of 4-H in 2022. And whereas today, November 3rd, is 4-H Show Your Colors Day, when thousands of youth, volunteers, alumni and supporters from coast to coast wear green. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the House of Assembly celebrate the month of November as 4-H month and acknowledge the program's important role in creating the agricultural, business, government and civic leaders of the future. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. But all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. 
contrary mind it nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Public Works. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Department of Public Works make makes every effort to ensure our roads are safe for all road users. And whereas, although Nova Scotians have enjoyed unseasonably warm weather this fall, winter is coming. And whereas our staff and winter maintenance equipment are ready to go to keep our roads safe to drive this winter. The province has over 400 pieces of snow and ice clearing equipment, and during storms they run 24-7 until the roads are clear. Therefore, be it resolved that now is the time for Nova Scotians to prepare for safe winter driving. This includes installing winter tires, checking road conditions before you head out, driving to conditions, slowing down, and leaving extra space between your vehicle and the one in front of you. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. Now we'll move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995 to 96, the Education CSFP Act, respecting a mental health curriculum. The Honourable Member for Fairview Clayton Park begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Election Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education CSAP Act, respecting a mental health curriculum. Bill 78, an act to amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education CSAP Act, respecting a mental health curriculum. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to table a bill entitled An Act to Establish Nova Scotia Recovery Bonds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Establish Nova, <coughs> pardon me, Nova Scotia Recovery Bonds. Bill 79, An Act to Establish Nova Scotia Recovery Bonds. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce an act entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 197 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Health Services and Insurance Act respecting free birth control. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 197 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Health Services and Insurance Act respecting free birth control. Bill 80, an act to amend Chapter 197 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Health Services and Insurance Act respecting free birth control. Order that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce an act entitled An Act Respecting Free Menstrual Products. The, the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting Free Menstrual Products. Bill 81, an act respecting free menstrual products. Ordered that the bill be read a second time at a future day. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Dartmouth. 
Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 246 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code Respecting Bereavement Leave for Pregnancy Loss. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Dermis begs leave to introduce a bill entitled an Act to Amend Chapter 246 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code, respecting bereavement leave for pregnancy loss. Bill 82, an Act to Amend Chapter 246 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Labour Standards Code, respecting bereavement leave for pregnancy loss. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill called An Act to Ensure the Safety and Readiness of New Schools, a.k.a. the J.L. Ilsley Bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Ensure the Safety and Readiness of New Schools. Bill 83, An Act to Ensure the Safety and Readiness of New Schools. Order that the bill be read a second time on a future day. Notices of motion. Statements by members. I recognize the Honourable Member for Argyle. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize the community of East Pumnico on its very first Pumpkinville. In true community spirit, residents came together to create an impressive assortment of pump pumpkin people displays, from a pumpkin fisherman hauling aboard a pumpkin mermaid, to a Cruella de Vil with some of her pumpkin puppies, to a Dr. Strang pumpkin person, and many more. Several categories for the judges, including most comical, community spirit, biggest display, and most creative. To add to the festivities on October 17th, the community also held a craft market and chili takeout at the local community centre. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the Legislature to join me in congratulating the residents of East Pumnico on the success of their first Pumpkinville. We look forward to next year's creations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize an incredible volunteer uh, that started Birdland Community Garden at the DJ Butler Park on Flamingo Drive. Last November, a small group of local residents proposed an idea of a community garden. After approaching the city for guidance, fundraising and a generous donation by Councillor Catherine Morris, this vision became a reality. They have purchased wood, soil and other supplies to build garden beds and are uh, almost done construction on their shed. I had the opportunity to visit recently and I'm so impressed by this initiative, uh, Mr. Speaker. Anyone in the neighborhood is welcome to apply for a garden bed, uh, while preference will be given to uh, uh, residents with limited means of growing food themselves and newcomers to Canada. Mr. Speaker, I would, uh, I would ask that the House join me in recognizing this group of volunteer residents who are helping make Clayton Park West an inclusive community for everyone. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pear. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In honor of Music Week, I want to recognize all music teachers. Music education is vital to our education system for many reasons. Music is a part of what makes us human. It is a way to express and communicate our thoughts and feelings. Music lasts a lifetime. Studies have shown that Alzheimer's patients who have diminished speech capabilities are able to sing lyrics of songs from their youth. Working at Maple Hill Manor, Mr. Speaker, I remember residents who sang in Gaelic every day. Music teaches people valuable life skills. It requires commitment, it teaches cooperation, teamwork, and patience. Music teaches body awareness and eye coordination through clapping, st stomping, and playing an instrument. Music, like mathematics, is universal language. Some people need coaching or coaxing. However, everyone can make music, Mr. Speaker. I ask the House and join me in recognizing our hardworking music teachers who encourage every student to make music. 
The Honourable Member for Hans West. Mr. Speaker, it is with pleasure that I rise today to offer sincere congratulations to Wim Windsor pharmacist Krista Trotter for being named the 2021 Bolov Hyja Award winner in the Nova Scotia Pharmacy Association. This award recognizes pharmacists who possess outstanding records of civic leadership in their communities. Many pharmacists work long hours and still make time to perform very valuable contributions to our communities. The Windsor Elms Village describes Krista as a demonstrating leadership by working closely with residents, which is evident in the role she believes pharmacy can play in geriatric care. I would ask that all members congratulate pharmacist Krista Trider on a truly deserving award. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clare. Mr. Speaker, every year the Taste of Nova Scotia Award recognizes the people and products at the heart of the Nova Scotia culinary industry. This October, the award for service was given to the team from La Cuisine Robichaud. For those of you who have not had a chance to enjoy a meal at La Cuisine, this is Nadine and Scott's restaurant located in a renovated old house that overlooks St. Mary's Bay in Sonyville. The team, many there since the restaurant first opened 10 years ago, welcome their guests as friends dropping in for a visit and a meal. Often they are friends of the restaurant returning to enjoy yet another meal of a local seafood or raw pier. I want to add my congratulations to the team from La Cuisine Robichaud. Their attention to service adds so much to the dining experience at their restaurant. Merci. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Speaker, a bar mitzvah ceremony celebrates a Jewish boy's 13th birthday on the Hebrew calendar and his elevation to, elevation to adult status in Judaism. It is typically a time of prayer and celebration, and like so many things, Mr. Speaker, Jewish communities around the world found their traditional ceremonies affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. For the Mursky Westler family of Halifax, their two sons are celebrating a combined bar mitzvah this coming weekend for sons Boaz and Dove. Boaz, as the oldest, had to wait so, so that the worst of COVID was over, and now the boys will share in the reading of the Torah for fr friends, family, and community. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members to send their best wishes to the Mursky Wexler family for their upcoming celebration and to all Nova Scotians catching up on important milestones. The Honourable Member for Victor West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Sharon and John Stewart on the recent sale of their business, Sharon's Place Restaurant. The Stewarts have owned and operated this popular Picto restaurant for 20 years and are looking forward to a well-deserved break and spending more time with family. The Stewarts are more than just local business owners. They are also good friends. Located across the street from my constituency office, I have frequented Sharon's Restaurant many times. It has been a popular place for local and visitors to dine, especially during our annual Lobster Carnival. As it states on their Facebook page, it is a place where people enter as strangers and leave as friends. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank Sharon and John for their many dedicated years of service and wish them luck with their new adventures. I further wish to congratulate the new owners and hope they have many years of success as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, today I rise to celebrate a very important birthday milestone in the community of Point Edward. Mr. George Sidney Grant, affectionately known as Sidney, turned 90 on Friday, October 29, 2021. A small gathering of friends and family were together to celebrate this great man. Sidney is a retired deputy fire chief of the Westmount Fire Department and spent his entire life uh, in service to his community. I would ask the members of this assembly to please join me in celebrating and congratulating uh, Sidney on his 90th birthday. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, I've risen before in this House to highlight the outstanding work done by the Nova Scotia Brotherhood Initiative, a program providing culturally appropriate health care for black men. Today, I want to focus on a key member of that team, Mary O'Roll, who was recently awarded the Mental Health Association of Nova Scotia's 2021 Outstanding Healthcare Provider Let's Keep Talking Award. 
Originally from the Bahamas, Mario moved to Nova Scotia in 2009 and has since volunteered for an impressive uh, volunteered and worked for an impressive list of community groups, including the Association of Black Social Workers, Ceasefire, Seven Step Society of Nova Scotia, Health Association of African Canadians, New Start Counseling, and Dartmouth, Nor uh, Dartmouth Public Good Society. Mario is currently the health service manager, health services manager for the Brotherhood, where he continues to support and empower Black men. And in that role. He also is an important member of a network of organizations that support vulnerable people in Dartmouth North. I ask this House to join me in expressing gratitude to Mario Roll for his hard work, dedication, compassion, and advocacy, and congratulate him on this exciting award. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we encounter many biases in our day-to-day -day activities. Uh, they surface in many ways and in a variety of circumstances. We encounter racial bias and cultural bias, religious bias, political bias, just to name a few. If not recognized and controlled, we will be the weaker for it. In this House, we have diversity. We have racial diversity, cultural diversity, religious diversity, political diversity, and diversity of personalities and backgrounds. When accepted and welcomed, we're the stronger for it. There is great strength in diversity. And I want to take a moment to acknowledge the diversity that's in this House. I want to acknowledge the strength that comes from it and look forward to seeing the positive changes that will emerge for our province as a result. I rise today to appreciate it and to celebrate it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize uh, an exceptional young curler from my constituency, Kate Fitzgerald, who, along with her teammates Taylor Stevens, Lauren Ferguson, and Allison Umla, will be competing at the National Junior Championships in Saskatoon later this month. And uh, if successful at the tournament, which I, of course, hope they will be, hopefully they'll be competing at the World Championships in Sweden in February. Uh, Kate has represented Nova Scotia on three previous occasions, has won two bronze medals, and I'd ask all members of the House to recognize Kate and her teammates for their dedication, hard work, and wish them good luck. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to recognize Whitney Pier Music Foundation. The Whitney Pier Music Foundation is a division of the Ethiopia Community Club at Mendicall Association. The foundation's mission is to provide an opportunity for people of all ages to learn and play music together. It brings together accomplished musicians with music students, creating opportunities for them to practice and perform, building confidence and skills. Mr. Speaker, the Whitney Pier Music Foundation provides students with the ability to work in small groups with an instructor, partake in jam sessions, and dress rehearsals. It also provides students with the ability to have live showcases and specialized workshops on a variety of topics. Mr. Speaker, I ask the House to join me in recognizing Whitney Pier Music Foundation on all their accomplishments. The Honourable Member for Queens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2016, a group of Queen's County parents of children with autism and other needs asked their community to address the lack of safe places for their children to play. This led to the innovative idea of Queen's Universally Designed Play Park. Supported by partnership between the Region of Queen's and Autism Nova Scotia, the fundraising budget was set at $450,000. Since that time, committee lead Debbie Wombold and her team have worked tirelessly to keep their cause at the forefront. Through a variety of fundraising initiatives by people of all ages and from all walks of life, they have collected donations and contributions. On October 29th of this year, it was announced that fundraising had surpassed $593,000. The groundbreaking, groundbreaking ceremony will take place later this fall, and a grand opening of the park is planned in spring of 2022. Mr. Speaker, I am so pleased to congratulate Debbie and her team and applaud all who have helped them attain this goal. The people of Queen's have shown again the power of community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Annapolis. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize New Albany's Little Free Library, the best nonprofit organization winner at the recent Valley's Best Awards. Valley's Best is an initiative of the Annapolis Valley Chamber of Commerce, and the winners are selected by the residents. Recipients can take great pride in knowing that their efforts are appreciated by so many in the community. 
New Albany's little free library was created to inspire a love of reading, build community, and spark creativity by fostering book exchange around the world. Over the last three years of operation, they have gifted more than 1,200 books at Christmas, 200 books through the summer reading program, 1,500 books, movies, and puzzles through their free giveaway. I invite all members of the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Elizabeth Llewellyn and the New Albany Little Free Library team on receiving this award and in thanking them for their commitment to giving back to the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. Mr. Le Président, aujourd'hui, je voudrais reconnaître Ballade d'Art, an effort collaborative entre l'Alliance Française de Halifax, uh, the Galerie de l'Art de l'Université Mount St. Vincent, and Canadian Parents for French. Au cours de la thé et le tome, ils ont offert des tours d'art public à Halifax, y compris au jardin public dans ma circonscription. C'est une façon de rendre l'art quand se trouve à Halifax plus accessible à des gens francophones. Monsieur le Président, je invite tous les autres membres de la maison de, à me joindre en félicitant ces organisations pour leur tour bilingue qui promouvent l'art local et les deux langues officielles canadiennes. Mr. Speaker, today I would like to recognize Belle Art d'Art. It's a collaboration between the, the Alliance Française of Halifax, the Mount St. Vincent University Gallery, and Canadian Parents for French. This summer and fall, they offered public art tours across Halifax, including in the public gardens in my constituency. Mr. Speaker, I invite other members to join me in congratulating these organizations for their bilingual tours that promoted local art and both official languages of Canada. The Honourable Member for Hans East. Mr. Speaker, it's a dream of many youths to reach their highest level in their sport. For another youth from East Hans, he's achieving his dream one goal at a time. Duncan Ramsey recently heard his name being called out at the U.S. Hockey League Phase 2 draft, getting selected by the Sioux City Musca Musketeers. His work ethic is visible in practice and games, and his hard work continues to play off, pay off. Duncan plays defense and is a force on the blue line, with his six-foot-two stature being an intimidating presence on the ice. Mr. Speaker, I had the honour of watching Duncan Ramsey help East Hans Penguins bring home the Pee Wee AAA Provincial Banner several years ago, and now wish him all the best with his new team, the Sioux City Musketeers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to my place to recognize a former member of this House, as, we, as many of us do uh, uh, from time to time, and I want to recognize Kevin Murphy. Uh, Kevin Murphy was the Speaker of this House from 2013 to 2021. He was a leader, not only here in Nova Scotia, for, for advocating for, the, for, for more accessibility in our communities, but also he was a leader in the international community, uh, on the Committee on Accessibility, trying to make legislatures more accessible across the Commonwealth. He is the champion of the legislation that we passed as a province to make Nova Scotia accessible to all by 2030. And I rise... And I rise in my place to recognize him uh, for the work that he has done for his time as Speaker of the House, as a gentleman, as a family man, and as my friend. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton East. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to commend Donnie McRae of Howie Centre, who recently delivered his 10,000th meal with Meals on Wheels. The 75-year-old Cape Bretner has been delivering meals for almost 20 years, despite a recent cancer diagnosis. A couple times a week, Donnie arrives at the headquarters for Meals on Wheels, where he has said it feels like working with the team. He also notes the reward is the people you deal with and knowing they are getting a nice meal. I look to stand here today to congratulate Donnie McRae for such valuable community uh, work, and thank you for all of his efforts. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize Ron Driscoll. Ron is a talented citizen who built the Masthead News, a community newspaper and business built from scratch. The publication, founded in 1991, has survived the past 32 years and remains today an independent monthly free newspaper that continually shares the community stories from Timberley to Lunenburg. 
Ron has always been an avid reader, writer, and advocate of higher learning and learned journalism skills that would later become his career while covering stories for the U.S. Armed Forces. Masthead News has always incorporated much community flavour, events, people, photos, milestones and celebrations as possible and focused on local people and their successes. In later years, Ron became an active supporter of several underprivileged children in third world countries. His daughters recall the refrigerator and walls of his home covered with smiling foster kid photos. Mr. Speaker, I'd like the members of the House of Assembly to join me in recognizing Ron for his entrepreneurial spirit that drove his business, supported his family, and served many in other communities. As many friends, neighbours, readers and supporters join the family in wishing Ron a happy and restful retirement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Shelburne. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Walter Nickerson, a lifelong resident of Lockport. Walter, who turned 75 this year, is, is an international dory rowing champion, winning 17 international titles in his 50 years competing. Walter started rowing in the 1960s at age 24, and he's been rowing and competing for the last 50 years. Walter and his first partner won five championships until, I quote uh, from Walter, I lost him to a girlfriend. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Walter now rows with Willie Wells from Lunenburg, who is a 10 years his junior, and they have won three of the four championships of the past five years. During the winter months, Walter bicycles eight kilometers to watch and help with high school basketball, his winter sport rarely missing a game. Mr. Speaker, I respectfully ask all members join me in recognizing Walter Nickerson, who is an inspiration to many of us. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Preston. Mr. Speaker, I rise in the House today to acknowledge the amazing volunteers that contribute to the Poppy Campaign at the Centennial Legion Branch 160, which I am proud to say is in my riding and they utilize over 700 volunteers. The Legion relies on several community groups that have shown up every year to cover 13,000 volunteer hours in 13 days. Some of these groups are in the 117 Preston Army Cadets and the Girl Guides 2nd Brook House, who also helped decorate over 12,000 veterans graves at Memorial Gardens, the Better Together group who spend tons of and hundreds of hours helping with the poppies. And I'm very honoured to say that this Friday I'll be helping out this organization on the Sobeys Pana Vista Drive and I'm very honoured to contribute in some small way to in remembering the veterans. I ask the members of this House of Assembly to join me in thanking all the volunteers that recognize the importance day of Remembrance Day and keep contributing year after year. At least we forget. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Andy Ganesh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, recently the Anaganish Chamber of Commerce celebrated local small businesses. Small businesses have had to adapt and change how they do business in order to survive in these uncertain times. I rise today to recognize those who were recently presented with small business awards by the Anaganish Chamber of Commerce as they celebrated Small Business Week. Heather Scott, owner of Happenstance, was presented with the East Coast Credit Union-sponsored Outstanding Customer Service Award. The Emerging Business Award, sponsored by RBC, was presented to Tarek Hadhad of Peace by Chocolate. Jacqueline Throop Robinson of Spark Engagement was presented with the Export Achievement Award, sponsored by RBC. The Ian Spencer Excellence in Business Award, sponsored by C CBDC and Noble, was presented to Matthew McDonald on behalf of the Anaganish Farm and Garden Co-op. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the Legislature to join me in congratulating these award winners and wish them continued success. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to acknowledge North Brewing Company. North Brewing opened in 2013 in the north end of Halifax, founded by, uh, founded by Peter Burbridge, Rosina Darvish and Josh Herbin. They opened a small brewery and retail shop selling cans and growlers to go. They couldn't keep their beer in stock. Since then, the team has constantly worked hard to provide great beer to their huge fan base in Halifax and Dartmouth, all the while opening a second shop in the basement of Battery Park, but eventually moving locations to Coal Harbor in January 2019. Coal Harbor, they say, has been so gracious to them and kind to them, especially through the pandemic. Their kitchen, named Side Hustle, participated in Burger Week, showcasing three burgers. Uh, however, the Smash Burger, which they have, which is a must try, Mr. Speaker. On their behalf, I'd like to announce and, and uh, wish that they have all the success in the opening of their new tap room in Timberley. Thank you, Mr. Bur the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to recognize Mr. David Blair of Wallace Bridge. David recently retired as a senior engineer from Nova Scotia Parks this past July after working for the province since 1996 when he worked as an engineer for the Department of Environment. David has a passion for the parks and ensuring that they were accessible, maintained and enjoyed. David put his passion into the parks so that others could enjoy the many amazing parks such as Amherst Shore Park right here in Cumberland North. Now that David is retired, he will be focusing on his own business, Blair's Sales and Services. Please join me today in thanking David Blair for his years of service to the Department of Environment and Nova Scotia Parks, and we wish him well as he enjoys his retirement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Toro Bible Hill, Billbrook Salmon River. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize the incredible works of Enigma artist Gerald Glode. Mr. Glode of Millbrook First Nation has created a series of historical pieces for Parks Canada and the federal government, which were used for signage, interpretive panels to foster the knowledge of Indigenous histories, cultures, and traditions. Mr. Glode's work is also being celebrated with his second, with his second coin in the Creatures of the North series by the Canadian Mint. Most recently, Mr. Glode has displayed an impressive 30-piece show in the Colchester East Hants Public Library. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the members of the House to join me in congratulating the efforts of such a talented artist. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank a celebrated member of the Fairview Clayton Park community, Mr. Russell Walker. Russell has been involved in our community for decades. He began his career as an industrial arts teacher at Clayton Park Junior High, where he also coached the hockey team. He then moved into public office, serving as local HRM counselor for 27 years. He was a tireless champion for our community and was a trusted voice on council for thousands of HRM residents. After retiring, Russell was diagnosed with cancer, but I'm happy to say that he has finished chemotherapy and is enjoying a well-deserved retirement, as well as enjoying his beautiful new grandson, Emerson. Russell still volunteers in the community and was recently recognized by the Canada Game Centre, who renamed their community room after him. He started as my teacher, he then became my friend Laurel's dad, and when I entered public office, he ended up being a mentor and a really like a dad figure to me. And although I give this title freely in the chamber, he really is my favorite Tory. So I ask all of the members of the House to join me in thanking Russell Walker for his tireless service to the residents of Fairview Clayton Park. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, we have been speaking a lot about aquaculture at this session in the House, but today I want to talk about a way cooler aquaculture. That is the hip-hop R&B solo artist turned band who teamed up with DJ Uncle Fester to create the album Bleeding Gums Murphy, which is nominated for a Music Nova Scotia Award for R&B Soul Recording of the Year. Bleeding Gums Murphy, which takes its name from the Simpsons character of the same, is an album of rich and powerful lyrics laid on top of Uncle Fester's innovative music and beats, resulting in a truly beautiful and catchy album. It's a follow-up album to Aquaculture's Legacy, which was long listed for the prestigious Polaris Prize in 2020, and many of the tracks feature guest artists, including Ghetto Socks, Ambition, Nilla, Tai Chi Chi, Corey Wrights, and Andre Fenton. Commissioned by the Mayworks Jabuktuk Halifax uh, Festival, Aquaculture and Uncle Fester, who makes his home in Dartmouth North, created a live performance of the album, which featured a huge onstage band and many of the guests from the album with musical direction by the great Aaron Costello. Uh, I ask all members of this house to join me in congratulating Aquaculture and DJ Uncle Fester on the exceptional musical accomplishment of Bleeding Gums Murphy and for its Music Nova Scotia nomination. The Honourable Member for Kings West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the time and commitment made by Ms. Charity Huntley to make our community a safe and welcome place for everyone. Charity has been a strong voice in our community, promoting diversity and inclusiveness. She has been instrumental in organizing several events, supporting and educating about the Black Lives Matter movement, and is a strong ally to the BIPOC community. Some of the events she's organized include a Black Lives Matter peaceful protest march, a Solidarity for Black Lives Matter concert uh, with uh, my good friends, the amazing band Shoulder to Shoulder. She's also organized a town hall panel discussion focused on racism in our communities and how we can stand together in unity, which myself and more than 75 other people attended. 
Charity is also looking to help others find their voice in our community and has been instrumental in the town of Berwick for creating change. Mr. Speaker, please join me in thanking Charity Huntley for educating our community and advocating for diversity and inclusivity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our journey through politics connects us with many hardworking, selfless individuals that aim solely to serve the people of our province. I had the sincere pleasure of working with one of these individuals, the Honourable Member from Annapolis, who served as my constituency assistant in King South for nearly three years until he decided to put his name forward to be the next MLA Liberal candidate in Annapolis. The member charted through some of the most challenging days as a constituency assistant when the pandemic emerged, answering hundreds of phone calls, showing dedication to the people of our community, the desire to fact-find, information share, and help our constituents in every way possible. I'm honoured now to serve with him in the House, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to thank him for the years that he worked in my constituency office. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating the member on becoming the elected MLA for Annapolis, and I wish him all the best in his political endeavours. The Honourable Member for Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Richmond Amateur Baseball Association was able to have a baseball season this summer, albeit a shortened one. The RABA, as it's known in the straight area, held their league championship tournament on the September 10th to 12th weekend at the Petit de Gras ball field. There was no league play in 2020 due to COVID restrictions, so it was especially nice to have some great baseball being played this year. Congratulations to the Petit de Gras Red Caps for winning their second consecutive RABA title by defeating the Ilmadam Mariners in the finals. Bringing a sense of normalcy to the area during a challenging time was welcomed by fans and players alike. We will all look forward to a full season of the RABA baseball in 2022. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cold Harbour, Dartmouth. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to thank an incredible student volunteer who worked tirelessly this summer on my campaign. Allison Flewelling, an NSCC student, bravely agreed to accept the role as chair of the Get Out the Vote campaign. Allison worked tirelessly every day for one month, knocking on doors, collecting and recording voter data, making phone calls, and arranging election day transportation to the polling stations. Mr. Speaker, every year, HRM holds an awards ceremony during National Volunteer Week, and in 2018, I was honored to present Allison with the Halifax Regional Municipality Youth Volunteer Award for District 4. Youth volunteers bring to our communities energetic perspectives and new ideas. And for this, I ask the members of the House of Assembly to join me in thanking Allison Flewelling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for sackville cobequid Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to thank the team at the Sackville Business Association in Lower Sackville. This past summer, on Sunday evenings, the Sackville Business Association, in conjunction with local musicians and sponsors, hosted free concerts at Acadia Park. Featured musicians from various genres entertained the community by sharing their musical talents. Since the pandemic start, down, sorry, since the pandemic shut down so many events, these concerts were very well received. It was refreshing to see so many people tapping their toes or clapping along to the beat of the music. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that all members of the House of Assembly join me in thanking the Sackville Business Association and our local musicians and sponsors for bringing the community together again after a very long time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thanks, everyone, and uh, I, I'm so glad to receive that enthusiasm because I'm equally as enthusiastic about my member statement, which uh, we're all very enthusiastic to see sports and activities come back online since the pandemic. And I want to recognize both the boys and the girls uh, cross-country teams at Madeline Simons Middle School. Uh, they were successful in making provincials that were hosted in Bridgewater 
uh, on October 25th. Our girls placed 13th and our boys made it to the top of the podium bringing home the title and the provincial banner for one of the first times, if not the first time, in school's history. Uh, the coaches Ashley Fever, Lisa Richardson, Richardson, excuse me, Lindsay McDonald, all encourage their students to do their best, as I know uh, volunteers and teachers do all the time. And I'll ask the team here at the House of Assembly to join me in congratulating the boys and girls at Madeline Simons. The Honourable Member for Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand today to congratulate the Suburban FC under-17 AAA girls soccer team on their provincial championship win. Four of the team players, Maya Archibald, Emma Crow, Isabel Gonzalez, and goalie Ellie Lancaster are residents of the Fall River area. The Suburban FC under-17 AAA team had an unbeaten league record of 13 wins, zero losses, while outscoring 95 goals and surrendering zero for their 2021 summer season. Mr. Speaker, please join me in congratulating this remarkable team on their record season and their championship win. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this time to celebrate the work of Blue Nose Fundraising in Halifax. Blue Nose Fundraising is a family organization in the business of helping people host and supply fundraising. From helping set up the fundraising camp camping to invest how to run it. Blue Nose helped people achieve their fundraising goals. When working with the Blue Nose, you can expect to be treated like a family. For over seven years in this company, has been working with the community groups, schools, and individuals to organize the process and supply the back, good, or any other needs. Mr. Speaker, I wish to celebrate a family-owned Nova Scotia business that works behind the scene in fundraising across HRM. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton East. The Honourable Member for Picta West. No, I'm done. How about the Honourable Member for Hans East? Oh. Eastern Passage. The Honourable Member for Eastern Passage. You lost a lot of time there. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge the Truck Convoy for Special Olympics. Saturday, September 18, 2021, marked the 10th anniversary of the convoy. The community's very own Leo J. Baisley was able to participate, and I thank the whole community for coming out and supporting this wonderful event. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. The time for statements by members has expired. Move into orders of the day, oral questions put by members to ministers. The time is now 2 o'clock. We'll finish at 2.50. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I've been asking uh, throughout the session and uh, trying to cajole the government to start to increase uh, seats uh, for nursing students at our universities. This has worked in the past. Uh, and we'll continue to work, Mr. Speaker, like making the 70 seats uh, for RNs permanent at Cape Breton University in Yarmouth, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and when I asked on October 21st, uh, will the Premier commit to more seats for nurses, CCAs, LPNs, and other health professionals? Uh, he said yes, he will, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask uh, the Premier today, given that we still have uh, students, uh, and I'll table that, um, just learning that we have lots of students that are actually want to enter this field, uh, some of them with averages over 90 percent uh, not being able to get in. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Premier when and what universities will have uh, seats for nursing. Thank you. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for this uh, important question. I read the media report today as well. We have lots of uh, young, smart, uh, ambitious Nova Scotians that want to enter the healthcare system. We want them there too. Uh, we also know from, uh, from our minister and I had a call last week with a couple hundred nursing students and they express, express some concerns about getting their clinicals and getting through the program. So we have lots of, lots of uh, factors to work out, uh, but certainly we want more seats. We want more people uh, being educated in this province entering our healthcare profession, but we got to do it in the right way. The Honourable Leader at the Official Opposition and his first supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate that. And we want the government to be successful in their goal to uh, to get to that 2,000 new uh, nurses in our system, Mr. Speaker. We have other provinces investing heavily in their post-secondary, and we have that opportunity to do that here. We have staff shortages at long-term care uh, facilities as well. 16 long-term care centres have staff shortages that need to find uh, new nurses. So we need these seats. Uh, we proposed uh, 270 new LPNs. That's what the evidence showed uh, when we asked. And so uh, the work is there. All they need to do is approve the funding at some of these uh, sites. So if we want to have LPNs in our system, uh, we need the seats in today. These are two and four year programs for nursing. Uh, will he commit to putting the 270 seats, increasing those seats in Nova Scotia Community College? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there's no question we need we need to, uh, to educate more people for health care in, in this province. That's part of the solution. So is re recruitment. Uh, but above uh, above all else, we need to we need to retain the people we have working in the health care system and, and support them. So uh, the opposition would have seen this week some some moves by the minister uh, on on to get recruiting the recruiting wheels uh, rolling. We have a lot of work to do, Mr. Speaker. We have a lot to catch up on. There's been uh, a lot of neglect in the health care system for a number of years, and we're doing our very best to, uh, to reverse that trend, and we'll keep on it, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the Honourable Leader at the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And one of the things that changed uh, when we came into government is the relationship with our post-secondary institutions and the value that we put in them. Uh, the previous government, the NDPs, cut uh, funding to universities. We increase it every single year. Uh, so this does go beyond healthcare, and it, it really speaks to how the government sees the uh, opportunities of our post-secondary, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to ask the Premier if he is committed. This isn't just a, the people want to see investments now, not just $1.7 million to recruit uh, people that we don't have, Mr. Speaker. We need seats in these schools. I'd like to ask the Premier how he sees the relationship with universities and if he is prepared to make the significant investment in the post-secondary that we need now. The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, and, and of course, we're, we're, I think we're very proud in this province of our post-secondary institutions. Uh, they're, they're important, uh, they're critical to a number of uh, communities across this province. There's no question about that. Just go to Anaganish, go to Wolfville, go, just go. you'll see the impact of our, our post-secondary institutions on, on this province and, and on the economy of our province. We, we, as a province, as taxpayers, have been investing in these, these institutions for a long time, and that will certainly uh, continue. We, how the, the answer to the question of how we see them is we see them as partners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Yesterday, in an in exchange about the minimum wage, the Premier said that he thinks that uh, working people have the right uh, to be able to make enough to be able to afford housing and pay for their groceries. Uh, now, this, this key word here, enough, uh, there's an important economic number has been published today to define that. In the 2021 Living Wage Report of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, the answer is Halifax, 22.05 an hour, Cape Breton, 18.45 an hour. Mr. Speaker, how does the Premier think we're going to get to a living wage in Nova Scotia if the government won't establish a minimum wage that will put us anywhere within striking distance of the goal? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if the member is advocating now for a $22, $22 minimum wage or an $18 minimum wage, or yesterday it was 15 But I think uh, irrespective of, of that, the reality is, is that we, we, do, we do believe that uh, this, this should be a province where everyone can, can achieve their opportunities, seize their opportunities and, and thrive. And, and we do know as well, we have multiple shortages in our workplace. I talk to employers every single day that are offering $20 an hour, $25 an hour and just can't find the workforce. So there are opportunities in this province. Do we need to do more to create more opportunities? Of course we do. And that is exactly where we'll continue to focus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party in his first supplementary. The living wage report published today that I'm speaking of uh, draws heavily on the work of economist David McDonald on this very question, uh, labour shortages in a low-wage sector. And, and the thing that Dr. McDonald indicates is that it's not so much a matter of a simply shortage of workers. It's a shortage of workers who are interested in working for the wages that are on offer. And he, and he explains and points out 
uh, that a higher minimum wage uh, will draw more people into the service sector and thereby prevent a lot of businesses from having to close. Uh, Mr. Speaker, how does the Premier think businesses are going to get the employees that they need when he's telling everyone that a minimum wage that's practically $10 below a living wage is acceptable somehow in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as, as, a, as a fact of matter, I would never tell an employer what to pay somebody. Employers decide what to pay people. The minimum they can pay is a certain amount. They can pay whatever they want. So this is this is not a question of, of the government telling anybody a maximum what to pay. Uh, they'll pay. Uh, the market will will supply itself. Uh, will will balance itself when it finds the uh, the, the labor is there and the wages are there properly. There's issues in the marketplace right now, no question. I think that most of the issue, issues are on the, a shortage of labour side as opposed to an abundance of it. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on his final supplementary. Speaker, but the government establishes the minimum wage. Now, now, yesterday, when I questioned the Premier about Ontario's introduction of a $15 minimum wage, he indicated that he didn't think Ontario's and Nova Scotia's situations were comparable. And in some sense, that's true. Uh, Statistics Canada has said recently that this fall, the uh, inflation rate in Halifax is actually a full point worse than it is in Toronto. But, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier explain why he thinks that a person who's working for, say, Walmart in Amherst or in Antigonish, it doesn't deserve the same wage as a person who's working for Walmart in Sudbury or Sarnia. The Honourable Premier. Because the cost of living, the living situations are different. I mean, that's just pure, but that's just pure market economics. Maybe the members don't think it is. But I'd ask, I'd ask you, I'd actually return the question with a question. Why does the member think that the most an employer can pay is the minimum wage? It's actually not. It's the actual minimum they can pay. If the market, if the market wants to pay more, they can pay more. That's the simple mathematics of it. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And today, on the due date of my first child, I'd like to ask a question about uh, midwives. My uh, question is for the Premier. As a regulated health profession, uh, midwives practicing Nova Scotia have gra graduated with rigorous universe from a university programs and are in integrated into provincial health system, working collaboratively with physicians, nurses, and other professionals. There is currently 17 registered midwives who work within the health system in Antigonish and so short and around the Halifax area. But you cannot access a midwife if you live in other parts of the province, whether it's Cape Breton or Annapolis Valley or other regions. Will the Premier commit today to expanding coverage across the province? The Honourable Premier. Uh, well, I thank the member for the question, and I have to say I'm super happy for you. You're going to be an awesome father, so congratulations. <laughs> I'd uh, also like to offer the member, if he wants to leave now and be with his wife, he can... <laughs> me later and ask any questions you want. Uh, but listen, this is an important issue and I know I know the member put forth some policy uh, during the election campaign uh, on midwives and we're, we're happy to work with them on that to make sure that that's balanced across the province. Yeah. The Honourable Leader is the official opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I won't take that offer uh, just yet. There's still a lot of work to do in this session. Uh, midwifery Oakham data highlights the excellent clinical care provided by midwives. Midwifery care results in improved health outcomes for parents and newborns at significant cost savings. Midwives in Nova Scotia prioritize priority populations for midwifery care, including Indigenous and African Nova Scotians. However, there are currently wait lists for those wanting to access midwifery care in Nova Scotia. Will the government invest in midwifery by increasing the number of midwifery positions in the province? Good job. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I agree with the member opposite. We need to we need to um, increase access, uh, and we need we need more of them. I absolutely agree with the member on that. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. As Minister of Regulatory Affairs, lowering costs for businesses that are starting out is a key to their future success. As a recommendation from the Economic Growth Council, we had committed to eliminating government startup fees and regulatory fees for new businesses. Is the Premier willing to commit to helping Nova Scotian businesses by not increasing or creating new fees in the next budget? 
the Honourable Premier. I said no. <laughs> I like your style, but the Minister of Finance said don't commit to anything before we actually have budget consultations. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. I'll thank the uh, Premier for that um, non-answer. Um, but Mr. Speaker, businesses should not be burdened by unnecessary or outdated government regulations. Since 2017, the previous government had reduced um, up to $50 million in red tape in the province. And we were committed to even more in the years ahead. And this is also something uh, that was recommended by the Economic Growth Council. Since the Premier kept this office, what measures will the Premier take to reduce future red tape, and what will the new target be for this office? The Honourable Premier. He just whispered something else, Mayor, but I'm not going to say that one. Uh, but listen, re reduction of red pay tape is is is, 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 yeah, <laughs> uh, is incredibly important, and I do and I do tip my hat to the the former government. They did a lot of good work on red tape reduction, and I and I, I have a, much respect for that. But what I would say is also, I mean, don't discount. I know we've had some talk in this chamber about the better paycheck guarantee, but I, I urge the members opposite. Don't don't discount how important that can be to help uh, businesses pay more money to their workers, put more money in their hands, uh, which will lead to greater success for our, for our business community, for our economy, but for the workers of Nova Scotia. Don't discount it. It's important. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Dartmouth. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, in the Deputy Premier's mandate letter, it states the Minister will implement an additional provincial deed transfer tax on any Nova Scotian property purchased by individuals who do not pay taxes in Nova Scotia and impose a levy on every non-Nova Scotian taxpayer property in Nova Scotia. I'll table that. The PC government has a goal to double Nova Scotia's population by 2060, and I'll table that. And we're already seeing out-of-province homeowners disapprove these additional taxes, and I asked the Minister of Finance what the purpose of these additional deed transfer taxes are and how the government plans to attract people to this province with this added tax. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, the simple issue is it's not, is the, the simple issue is for people who are moving here, it's not an issue uh, because they will live here. Uh, so it is something that we're looking at. Uh, it was a campaign commitment, a platform commitment. Uh, it exists in other provinces. It's found in Prince Edward Island in New Brunswick and British Columbia. Uh, we've seen a lot of interest in property here by people who live outside of the province. So it's something we're looking at and reviewing. And uh, in good time, I'm sure we'll come forward with something. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Dartmouth. In Pictou County, deed transfer tax for the last fiscal year brought in $1,793,492. This deed transfer tax was first put into place in Pictou County to generate income to pay the capital costs associated with building the Pictou County Wellness Centre, and I'll table that. What is the Minister's plan to utilize this additional deed transfer tax in a way that directly benefits respective municipalities in Nova Scotia who actually provide municipal services to these properties? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I think it's safe to say we hear ideas on how to spend money every day from the opposition. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and there are lots of good things where we could spend money, Mr. Speaker. We're about to go through a budgeting process where we'll have to look at everything, Mr. Speaker, and how we're spending money as a government, and how can we help people, in, in, because the reality is we don't have a limitless pot of money to work with either. Uh, so this, uh, this is a possible revenue generation idea for the province. Uh, we're trying to solve issues around housing. We're trying to solve a lot of issues that municipalities aren't responsible for, but we are responsible for. Uh, and, and we have to keep that in mind. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Community health centres are an important collaborative model of health care delivery that is community-run, oriented and directed. They are an important solution to our primary care conundrum. We can see an example of the incredible work that community health centres do in the North End Community Health Centre in Halifax. Community members and health care providers in Dartmouth North have been working to establish a community health centre for quite some time. Mr. Speaker, acknowledging that collaborative community health centres are vital parts of primary care and upstream health care, what action will the Minister take to support the establishment of more community health centres across the, the province? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for the question. I actually had a, a meeting with uh, the group this week and uh, have site visits planned uh, in the, once we get out of the house to go over and visit and understand how best to look at the services they provide and where we can possibly um, improve those and where we can roll them out across the province. So there's certainly more to learn. Uh, we have a similar health centre in my community and it does an incredible amount of work. So those uh, discussions are early, but we're very interested in understanding how they pay, play a role in offering primary health care in our province. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, the community health centre model is unique because it's community governed and focused on the upstream conditions for health, such as food security, housing and social inclusion. But the centres are chronically underfunded and not able to reach the full potential of care they could provide. This is why the Nova Scotia Association of Community Health Centres has a long-standing ask for a one-time stabilization fund of $4 million so that they can address key operational gaps and participate fully in the collaborative care conversation in Nova Scotia. Uh, Mr. Speaker, will the minister commit funds to stabilize and support community health centres so they can be full participants in solving the health care crisis in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So what I would say is that in this role, we continue to look at how we best, uh, in, you know, in different communities, how we provide primary care and primary access. So I would say that we are looking at all different types of models across the province. We want to be person-centered. We want to understand what communities need, and we'll continue to look at that model uh, across the province going forward. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister uh, of Department of Natural Resources and Renewables. Uh, Halifax Atlantic has many residents, including myself, who are still very concerned about Williams Lake. The lake is quite simply disappearing. The dam, as I have said before, needs to be reconstructed now. What is the update on the dam for Williams Lake? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the, the member. I know it's very important to his constituents, and he's brought this uh, before the House uh, uh, earlier this session, and, and I know that he's uh, communicated to myself and, and my colleague at Public Works. Uh, the, the quick response is we are looking at it. Uh, I know that it was an all-party commitment during the election. Uh, the two departments are wor working together. They're, they're going to different levels of government, and I, I hope soon to have a, have a response back for that member. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Good answer. Uh, during the election, I will remind the uh, minister, all three parties promised on video to address this issue right away. So my question is again to the Minister of Natural Resources and Renewable. Will you keep us updated on a time frame and as soon as you hear, will the residents of Halifax Atlantic care? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order, please. I'm going to ask the member not to say you refer to the minister. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Maybe you can table that video. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I just joke. In all seriousness, uh, I, the, the, the member opposite has brought this to us. We've had we've had quite a few conversations about this. The simple answer is uh, is uh, <laughs> the simple answer to the member member opposite is uh, we're certainly going to work work with you on this. It was an all party commitment during the election, and very very pleased. I did say you, I apologize. Very pleased to, to let the member know that uh, he'll be one of the first ones to know so he can share the information with his uh, constituency. Thank you very much. Just, just to lighten that up a bit, he did say you, but he was saying the member and the community. So. <laughs> the, the Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are seeing a problematic trend across the country when it comes to impacts to our labour numbers with mandated vaccines in our healthcare system. Uh, the minister has recently said that they are expanding the deadline uh, for public service workers in Nova Scotia uh, who have received their first dose. Is this because we are experiencing a labour crunch here as a result of this policy? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'll thank the uh, member opposite for the question. It is, in fact, um, related to the NACI statement. So on October 22nd, the NACI statement changed, so the interval between um, immunizations uh, was different. So as a result of that, we have moved it forward to give people some time. Additionally, we saw in the uh, once the proof of vaccination and as well as the mandate uh, was uh, announced, people increased, there was an uptick in, in vaccination. So as I said in the media today, we certainly don't want to be, uh, we don't want to penalize anyone uh, if they are moving towards vaccination. We want to work with them. So it's 
it's a bit of both. We want to keep people in the workforce, but we're also following the recommendations of NASI. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are experiencing a labour shortage in our health care system here. Uh, we are going to be very focused on ensuring that service delivery is not impacted by any government policies. Uh, this is why the reporting on the vacancies is so critical. Uh, I know the, the Minister has said that she will report uh, on these vacancies. Uh, she said to the, the, uh, the media that that could happen as early as this Friday. Uh, in order to ensure the Nova Scotians are informed enough to know what services may be impacted, whether it's surgeries, emergency departments, long-term care, will the minister commit to reporting on the specific uh, job descriptions that might be impacted by a labour shortage related to this issue? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much. So we will. We'll be working with the employer specifically. That information needs to go to public health by the end of this week so we have a better understanding of where services will be impacted. So I think what we'll have to do is look at which parts of the sector are impacted, which areas. I don't think it will be just across the board. I think there will be small places where we'll need to lean in and support. And certainly we'll work with employers and communities to ensure that happens. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth on a new question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the people of Yarmouth have been overjoyed to see the Cat Ferry return uh, to our harbour. Uh, it's, been, it's been three long years without the ferry service running. This is a critical uh, piece of infrastructure, not just for the accommodations sector in Yarmouth and, and the Tri-Counties, but indeed across the province. Uh, there is some real concern, legitimate concern, uh, for the people of Yarmouth around this government's commitment to that ferry service because of the rhetoric that was used, because the, uh, the party did take Bay Ferries to court. My question to the Minister of Public Works, uh, can she please tell the people of this province if this government is committed to this international ferry link uh, or not, please. The Honourable Minister of Public Works. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my honourable colleague um, for the question. The honourable member would know, uh, be well aware that we, as a province, are in a contract till 2026. We would expect that both parties that are part of this contract would meet up to the uh, standards of the contract. And I wish the operator a successful season. There you go. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, for sure there's people, particularly in the tourism sector, that are, t that are taking a a sigh of relief uh, from that from the minister's answer. Um, it is really important. The and I and I will I will be frank. The rhetoric used by the members opposite, while well in opposition, has turned a lot of Nova Scotians against the service. Uh, it has affected uh, public perception of it. Um, this is a service that does uh, bring in tourists that spend twice as much what other tourists spend. Uh, it's 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 our link to one of the largest tourism markets in the world. That is a vital piece of infrastructure not just for Western Nova Scotia, but for indeed this entire province. So can the, can the minister please tell us, will she provide her full-throated support of this service so long, so long, as, it's, so long as it's producing uh, the numbers that we needed to? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Public Works. Thank you. I'm glad I wore a turtleneck today, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. As I said previously, we are in a contract till 2026, and we expect both parties that are in that contract to meet the conditions of that contract. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Skills and Immigration. The Office of the Abundsman conducted an investigation of the island employment based on complaints made by workers. The resulting report made a number of recommendations for the Minister's Department. These recommendations included revising policies, developing new accountability framework, and implementing a process to respond to the complaints about Nova Scotia Works agencies, and I'll table that. The Office of the Abundsman did not recommend the closure of island employment. However, on October 1st, 30 pro program employees received notice that they would be permanently laid off. Mr. Speaker, why did the minister choose to close island employment instead of working with the organizations to implement the recommendations? The Honourable Minister of Labour and Immigration. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for this important question. One thing that's really important is the decision to close the organization wasn't a government decision. Our contract was with the funds, and that is one thing that we made a decision around was to close the contract early based on the results from the Ombudsman report. One thing that I really want to be able to say to the employees is that we're listening and we really do care about the work that they were delivering. We are working very hard to make sure that there is a new provider in place, and that is one of our commitments, and we're moving very fast to make that happen. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. Mr. Speaker, the Office of the Ombudsman investigate the allegations under the Public Interest Disclosure of Wrong Act, Nova Scotia's whistleblower legislation. This act is designed to encourage public servants and others to expose perceived wrongdoing and to protect whistleblowers against reprisals. Workers at Island Employment had been asking the province to look into financial mismanagement for years. Now, Island Work work staff who are not responsible for the fiscal management have been laid off. Will the minister admit that her department's decision violates the protections provided by our province's Whistleblowers Act? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Labour, Skills and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member opposite for the important question. And so we're working again very hard to make sure that there is a new provider in place and so that the employees know that there will be positions for them under that new service provider. We're working very hard and moving fast as possible. Again, we want to know or let the employees know that we realize that this was a hard decision and an important one to make. The results in the Ombudsman were significant and substantial, and that was the reason that the department made the decision that we did. And again, to the employees, we see them and we hear them, and we know that it is important for them to know the good work that they were doing, and they can continue to do that under the new service provider. Here, here. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture. Spell agriculture. He he's stepping into the ring. He's got his fans behind him. In recent years, the wine... In recent years, the wine industry in Nova Scotia has emerged as a significant economic sector in the Annapolis Valley. Unfortunately, COVID has caused significant labour disruptions both in the vineyards, the tasting bars and the restaurants, dis despite increased wages and bonuses. My question is, has the Minister met with representatives of the wine industry and are there plans in development to assist the wine growers and wineries with the labour shortages experienced by this important agricultural sector? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite for the question. Uh, yes, we have had meetings with some members of the industry, and uh, as different members of this government have said, nothing's off the table, and we're willing to listen. The Honourable Member for King South. The Honourable Member for King South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I guess the food is on the dinner table. Nothing is off the table. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the wine industry has faced an unusual problem this year, an extraordinary grape-growing year resulting in banner production. While we have extraordinary award-winning wines, there's now a growing challenge in marketing our wines to the world. What plans does the minister have in taking the marketing and promotion of our wines to the next level? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks again to the member opposite for the question. Um, again, these are, uh, these are conversations that we are having as a department. Uh, I'll defer to the Minister of Health on what day it is in the new government, but these are early days and there are lots of plans in the works. <laughs> Thank you. The Honourable Member for Preston. Mr. Speaker, last week I asked the Premier kindly and kindly answered um, regarding the Central Nova Scotia Correctional Facility, and I thank him for that. But I would like to ask the Minister of Justice, under the previous government, there was a commitment to transition the East Unit at this facility into a separate facility to specifically address the needs of women in custody. Is this government committed to creating a separate facility, and what updates can the Minister provide this House on the status? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you, the member, for the question. Um, we are uh, we are aware of that. The commitment is still there, and there are a number of opportunities that uh, that the department's looking at. We don't really have anything concrete yet that we want to uh, bring back yet, but we are looking at that and recognize that that was a commitment. So, the honourable member for Preston. 
I want to thank the minister and look forward to the updates on that. Um, and also, Mr. Speaker, earlier this year there was a disturbing video. An inmate located in the east unit of the central Nova, Nova Scotia Correctional Facility was released on social media. The video is of a female inmate placed in health segregation in a cell needing medical assistance as she was suffering from a diabetic low. DOJ said that they would be investigating this matter from a privacy perspective, but not the practice of segregation. My question is to the minister, what steps is this government taking to address the mistreatment of inmates and what safeguards are being put into place for inmates in health segregation? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Once again, thank you to the member. Um, I do know that uh, the correctional officers uh, at the facilities do uh, continue to uh, receive ongoing training. Um, specific to this particular case, I'm not aware, but I can certainly uh, find out some more information and let the member know. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recently, I went to visit uh, my daughter at CBU and drove past uh, a lot of incredible construction twinning the highway uh, around Antigonish. I'm so happy for the people there. But meanwhile, back in Cumberland County, people are still paying an extra tax to drive on that same Trans-Canada Highway. The Premier has shared that he's going to remove the tolls, and I'd like to ask the Minister of Public Works today, what date can we expect the, to the tolls and the extra tax to finally be removed for the people north of the Cobblewood Pass. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister for Public Works. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable uh, colleague for the question. Um, I'd like to say that we have listened to Nova Scotians. On uh, September, uh, we gave was the first step in uh, removal of the tolls. We gave the bondholders notice that we would pay them off. Last Friday, October 29th, we paid them off, and I will tell the member opposite and all Nova Scotians, change is coming at the Cobblewood. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to, um, we'd love to have a date. I get asked every day by people like, when is it going to happen? He said it was going to happen. Why hasn't it happened yet? Um, and I do want to officially ask the minister if I could uh, be the one that drives the bulldozer or excavator to actually remove the pass. Um, but in addition to the uh, tolls, the people that live in the Wentworth Valley have been asking um, for the speed limit to be changed back to what it should be based on the classification of their road. So when the pass was built, the, the speed limit was artificially lowered to entice people to, to pay the toll and go through the pass. And people are asking for, for that uh, to be placed at the same speed limit that anywhere else in Nova Scotia would be placed based on the classification of their highway. Can the minister give us maybe a peek into the exact date that we can expect the tolls to be removed and also a commitment to uh, put the speed limit back where it should be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Public Works. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank the honourable, uh, my honourable colleague for the question. Um, we have an interdepartmental committee right now in place. They're actually meeting again today, um, and uh, I'll be able to give you a date soon, um, but that committee is still working through the process. It's not as simple as just switching off the light switch and everything goes away. Uh, there's, you know, safety issues, there's jobs, there, there's a lot involved into what happens um, when you're looking at removal of tolls. Uh, and as far as the speed limit goes. A uh, member from Cumberland South has brought that to my attention and certainly uh, we'll be looking at, uh, we'll, we certainly can look at that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Uh, Mr. Speaker, education was always a priority for our government. Thanks to the significant investments we made into programs such as pre-primary, which the current government opposed, Nova Scotia leads all provinces in education spending as a portion of GDP. Woo! Mr. Speaker, can the Minister commit to ensuring provincial education spending as a percent of GDP will remain the same or increase under this government. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks to the member for the question. Um, I, I, that seems to me to be a really unusual way to determine spending. I, I would expect and would, uh, would apply the, the principle of, of looking to needs and uh, determining spending based on that. So that'll be my approach. Whether that aligns with the numbers that the member has asked about, we'll wait. We'll just have to wait and see. The Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask the question because we're concerned because previous governments cut. 
Uh, when we came in, when we came into power, we invested well over $65 million in the program. We invested in inclusive education. We hired over a thousand new teachers, and we signed an historic deal for t an average of $10 a day childcare for our children across Nova Scotia. So, so I am concerned about the response from the minister, and I'm concerned when the next budget comes what it means for our children uh, in schools in Nova Scotia. So, my question, my follow-up question. Order, please. Order, please. The member for Sydney, member two, has the floor. So, so, some forget they were in opposition not that long ago asking these questions. Um, so, so, so Mr. Mr. Speaker, my next question to the Minister of Education is that we have signed an historic deal with the federal government that, that is considered the best in the country when it comes to providing child care for our children. As part of that was increased wages for our ECE workers across Nova Scotia. We provided a $500 upfront payment uh, as a sign of good faith. Question, my, please. my question to the minister is, is uh, I'm looking for an update on the negotiations uh, and when can the ECEs expect their wage increases. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am very proud to have taken the first operational step towards implementing that agreement with the issuances of uh, EOIs. Um, last week. Um, so we're really excited to continue that work towards implementing the agreement and ensuring that Nova Scotia children, Nova Scotia families have access to quality, affordable, accessible child care. And we are very committed to making sure that that happens. Um, I want to shout out to the department who's done an incredible job standing up uh, pre-primary uh, pre programs, which is the initial question that was asked, to the program providers for the work that they do, and also for the school teams for implementing a really different model, um, but wrapping their arms around those kids. So uh, I, wanna, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say that uh, shout out to those groups because they've done a great job. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I've got a few numbers for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development as well. Um, Hammonds Plains Con Consolidated School has a capacity of 508 students. They presently have 617 students. Kingswood Elementary has a capacity of 625 students. They now have 899 students. Madeline Simons has a capacity of 635 students. They now have a enrollment of 797 students. There are 16 portables across those three schools, Mr. Mr. Speaker. And I would ask the Minister of Education if she feels that a boundary review with the new schools will be enough to alleviate the enrollment challenges in my community. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Um, we've heard repeatedly about the needs of schools in growing communities, and, um, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Speaker, the member has my sympathy that the prior government didn't align the uh, growth, um, growth planning with the schools planning. Um, so I must say, though, that the department and the regions have done an incredible job of adapting to that, of, of adding modular schools and, and doing planning around that. Uh, I can say that our government is committed to growth, and more than that, we're committed to supported growth. And to that end, we have a cross-department committee um, that's planning strategically for growth, and the Department of Education is at that table. So we will make sure that continued growth and expansion happens with school planning in mind. Um, with respect to the question of boundary reviews, we are very hopeful that the boundary reviews will resolve current issues, um, and we do expect to be rolling into boundary reviews uh, in the very near future. Once that plays out, if there are continued needs, we'll look at those. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you to the Minister, I, I appreciate uh, her consideration and that response. Um, my, I think my my follow-up question will be directed uh, to the predominant question that I get uh, from, from parents, namely parents, related to the use of portables as a means to alleviate those challenges. While I appreciate that those can be a tool, those have been a tool since I was going to elementary school at, ha at Hammonds Plains Consolidated. And the people in my community want to know that there are other options on the table. Can the minister commit to using an alternative method other than portables to help alleviate some of these challenges. The Honourable Minister of Education. 
Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member. Yes, um, I acknowledge you know, some of those portables have been around for years, eight years or more. Um, and <laughs> so uh, I fully appreciate um, the desire and interest in seeing what alternatives exist. Um, we have, um, we've seen modular, uh, modulars added um, to great success. Well, that's one option. Um, but I'm more than happy to meet with the member to talk about um, any of the specific issues around schools in his area so that we can share what's being done and, and what the options are. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford South. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, during the campaign, one of the best experiences I had was visiting Northwood, the Northwood facility in my riding of Bedford South. And I did get a chance to speak to a woman there who was younger than most residents. She was actually in her early 40s, had been there for a few years. And she told me she often felt you know, alienated and alone and, and, and lonely and that the system was not designed for people in her age group. So I would like to ask the minister, uh, what policy or programs does the department follow to make sure Nova Scotians of all ages feel included in long-term care? Thank you. The Honourable Mem Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for that question. Um, it's something that doesn't get talked about very often. My own cousin, who after he was in a car accident, lived there for many years before he passed away, and he was in his 30s. So it is a problem. We fully recognize that. There aren't a lot of solutions on the table right this minute because the focus has been on older seniors, but across the province we need to have a better strategy, especially considering that there are so many who have intellectual disabilities who are also looking at being moved out of the institutions into the community. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Bedford South. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the Minister for that uh, response. I felt the same way. It was something that I had not considered, honestly, until I, until I spoke to this woman, so I appreciate that. Uh, second question, I actually knocked on someone's door during the campaign as well. He was on his way out to, to see his wife, who's at a long-term care facility, I believe, in the Minister's constituency, actually, which is about 45 minutes away from, from where he lives, obviously a long way. Uh, for him to go every day. So I, I'd just like to ask the minister um, what the policy is. He's been working very hard to try to get his wife a bit closer to home. What the policy is to make sure that loved ones are kept as close to their, their loved ones as possible. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Seniors and Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, an excellent question. The ability for people to transfer to a closer long-term care facility should have been um, expedited, but it hasn't been. There are almost 2,000 people out of the almost 8,000 long-term care beds who are waiting to be moved to another facility, and that is one of the top priorities of our department, is to make those transfers happen much quicker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Service, Nova Scotia and Internal Services. Um, at the height of the third wave of the pandemic, I worked with restaurants to implement a cap on the fees that third-party del delivery companies could charge. This has helped many restaurants survive the pandemic. It's now clear that COVID will be, be, be with us for the foreseeable future and that many restaurants have no choice but to use or to continue using third-party delivery services to survive. However, when the state of emergency expires, restaurants will face charges of up to 30% to use these delivery apps. Will the minister commit to making the necessary regulatory and legislative changes to maintain this fee cap? The Honourable Minister of Service Nova Scotia and Internal Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from my colleague opposite. Uh, I haven't had a chance to get fully briefed on that particular particular issue, but certainly something I'll bring back to the department, get briefed, and have a chat with the, with the member opposite. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. And to continue the, the camaraderie between me and my, my uh, predecessor, I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Um, it's clear that the many great bars in this province are continuing to struggle. Prices are increasing, it's hard to find staff, and many people are still choosing to stay home due to the threat of COVID. Based on consultation with Nova Scotians, Nova Scotia bars and restaurants, our government allowed takeout cocktails during the state of emergency. This change helped cocktail-focused bars survive, and regulations on what could be offered for takeout help ensure, ensure safe consumption. Is this a commitment that the minister will make to reviewing again and possibly reinstating? The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia and Internal Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My understanding is that maybe the uptake on that particular, particular program wasn't as high as expected, but I certainly have those ongoing discussions at the department and engage with my uh, other colleagues uh, at the, around the co cabinet table. Thank you. 
The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables. As the Minister knows, the moratorium on drilling for oil and gas on George's Bank expires at the end of 2022. That moratorium has been in place for over three decades because successive governments have recognized that this lucrative, multi-species fishing ground must be protected from any possible pollution from oil and gas activities. Mr. Speaker, many Nova Scotians are asking for clarity on this question. Will the minister commit to legislating a permanent moratorium on oil and gas activities on George's Bank? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the member opposite for the question. It's uh, it's a very important uh, fishing grounds. We we know that there is a moratorium that that exists. But it, as I brought up in the house yesterday, it, it it's a, a federal and a provincial level uh, discussion that has to take place to to even extend that process that's go going on right now. Um, I did commit to the house uh, yesterday that I certainly am going to look into those details, and I'll be happy to share that as soon as those conversations do take place. The honourable minister, uh, member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With respect, we're asking again because that assurance does not seem sufficient. We're asking for the minister to press the case of a permanent moratorium with whoever he needs to speak to at the federal level. But to go further, as mentioned earlier in this session, Nova Scotia is a mega sponsor for an oil and gas conference taking place in Morocco this spring. And that conference, Mr. Speaker, explores geology that formed before Nova Scotia and Morocco separated millions of years ago. In Nova Scotia, the two areas of relevance for oil and gas in those geological formations are Sable, which we know is done, and George's Basin which the Canadian Nova Scotian Petroleum Board recently referred to as underexplored. Mr. Speaker, George's Basin sits beneath George's Bank. Does the minister really believe that we can protect the bank while ushering in exploration in the basin? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and I'll, I'll re reaffirm. We're committed to making sure that that moratorium stays. I'm committed to having those conversations at the federal level. And, and if, if, if the member opposite is curious about the, the sponsorship for, for the, the, the process that's going on in Morocco, uh, we may ask the previous government as it was a commitment in 2020, not in 2021. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is for the uh, Minister of Labour. Um, as we heard earlier, the um, Island Works uh, organization in, in Sydney has just been decimated. Uh, we've not only have the workers who are out of, out of work, but also hundreds of files that are kind of in limbo right now. So I'd like to ask the Minister, um, what is the plan in transition for those hundreds of files for people that are, uh, are needing that service? And also, with regard to the workers, was there a commitment to those workers that they will be moved to the new organization? Thank you very much. The Honourable Minister of Labour, Skills and Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite. I know how important this issue is for the community and for all Cape Bretoners, and we want to just remind the folks who are working at the organization that we are, again, working very hard to have a new service provider in place. So once that call for interest is closed, we are going to make sure that there is a smooth transition because it's really important that there is no gap in services. And so again, under that new employer or new service provider, there will be positions. We really encourage the employees to make sure that they take their talents to to that new service provider. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you, Minister. To the Minister, um, in that answer, I did not hear that the employees are guaranteed employment. What I heard, what I heard was that they're encouraged to take their skills to that to that organization. So taking their skills to that organization, can we get a guarantee from the minister that those uh, employees will uh, will transition to the new organization? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Labour, Skills and Immigration. Ms. Mr. Order, oh. please. The time for <laughs> oral questions put. The time for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. I recognize the Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honour to rise on the occasion of our single opposition day when the power is on and the internet works. Um, I would like to uh, please call Bill Number 26, the Emergency 911 Act. Bill Number 26, the Emergency 911 Act. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Citadel, Sable Island. 
Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to rise today to speak to our bill number 26, a series of amendments to the Emergency 911 Act that would create a province-wide emergency mental health service. Mental health supports in Nova Scotia are insufficient. Despite the 2021 budget investing $336.5 million into mental health, it represented just 6.3% of total health care spending, far below the 10% recommended by the WHO. This actually marked a drop from 6.7% in 2020, showing the investment in mental health care is not keeping pace with overall demand. We need a strengthened mental health system in Nova Scotia across the spectrum of acuity, from mental health promotion to inpatient mandated care. Building a different kind of mental health crisis response in Nova Scotia is a deeply personal endeavour for me. I have previously shared with members our struggle to find mental health services that worked for our family. Without shame, I can reshare with you the dozens of times we needed help to keep our family safe, and the only option was to call 911. This was, in fact, step one on our official mental health crisis plan we had in place with the IWK. Calling 911 to help your child is a, through a mental health crisis is a devastating experience. The fear and chaos that necessitates the call is enough. Then the concern is who will respond and how. In most of our experiences, paramedics would not enter to assess our son without police going in first. So let me just describe it to you. Your child has tried hard to manage through something else that most children can do. A day at school, a doctor's visit, a family walk in Point Pleasant Park. As parents, you have done everything you can to make the day a success, attending to food, water, sleep, comfort, and preparing with social storytelling. Yet your child is now experiencing extreme distress and the whole family needs help. As we were parents of a small child, the vast majority of Halifax Regional Police officers who responded to us when we called 911 responded in a collaborative manner and wanted to work together to de-escalate the situation. Nonetheless, we relied on their goodwill as decision-making was moved, removed from us and from our son. Calling 911 never resulted in increased or more appropriate services. We often ended up in the IWK ER for hours and then were sent home with nothing new in place. In fact, I would say that for all of us, repeat, this repeated experience time and time again increase our overall stress and trauma. For too long, Halifax Regional Police was our mental health service provider, but I know that officers were always concerned about, about responding appropriately and deeply frustrated with a system that provides services, uh, that doesn't provide services once they were done their role. Aside from the stories I can tell and the stories of so many other families that I've been entrusted with, why should all Nova Scotians care about this initiative? Why should all Nova Scotians care about improved mental health response? Firstly, we obviously want to build a mental health care system where these type of crises are greatly decreased through effective prevention, treatment and care. Many folks in mental health crisis end up being a cyclical caller because we have such limited mental health care resources in Nova Scotia. We need to break the cycle. Police do not want to be in situations where they have to use force against someone who needs medical treatment. They clearly see the mismatch of need and response. And police presence can often escalate the situation. The knowledge that the police will come first is often a deterrent from seeking help when it is needed. Finally, I would say that increased contact with the police and potentially the justice system because of mental health crises leads directly to the overrepresentation of undiagnosed and untreated mental health issues in carceral populations. What do we have now in Nova Scotia? HRM has a mental health mobile crisis team. And with all due respect to the people and organizations that manage the program, I contest its name. It is not mobile. On a number of occasions, I have tried calling the, men the mobile mental health crisis team. There is often no answer, or someone answers, but no one is available to respond, or someone can talk on the phone, but they can't come to the scene, or because of the level of mental health distress, uniformed police officers have to respond first. You can see why I usually say it's not mobile, it's not a mental health service, and it certainly does not respond in crisis. 
and I'm so certain of my opinion that if we could use props, I would try calling now so that we could see how the service does or doesn't work. I have only had one positive interaction with the service, where a plainclothes mental health clinician came to our house and de-escalated a situation. That one time literally followed on weeks and months of advocacy by us to have a better response for our family, and it happened once. I also know that my family is privileged and that we live in urban Halifax, about five minutes from the IWK ER. While I was in high school in Canning, my mom saw a restraining order against her ex-partner. I remember calling the RCMP detachment in Numinos and the officer being quite frank, we are 20 minutes away in the best case scenario. So that goes for anyone in rural Nova Scotia who is in crisis. And yes, there are mental health crisis lines, but they're not enough in a mental health crisis. Despite our limited resources as well, demand is increasing. This spring, police in Cape Breton reported a 19.6 increase in 911 calls in 2021 compared to the same period from 2020, with most of the calls related to domestic issues and mental health and addictions. And I've tabled that, that article. Spring visits for mental health and addictions increased from 191 to 458 in the central zone and other zones saw, saw similar increases. And our community mental health wait times remain long. Remember, these are the services that will keep, keep people out of crisis and keep communities safe. Wait times had a brief decrease in 2020, but there has been a rapid climb in wait times in 2021. You can see it for yourself on the Nova Scotia Wait Times website across child, adolescent, and adult mental health services. Wait times are increasing to pre-COVID levels. Health, health zones have a target of seven days for urgent mental health care. And more or less, most zones, aside from Eastern Zone, meet this goal for 90% of patients. The only thing is, this isn't the right goal. The Canadian Psychiatric Society and other evidence-based Canadian mental health initiatives stress that urgent mental health needs need to, be, need to be addressed within 72 hours. So Nova Scotia Health does not have the right target. For non-urgent adult care, with the exception of Yarmouth Regional Clinics, 90% of adults will be seen within a range of 42 to 85 days. And in Yarmouth Regional Clinics, they lead the province with wait times of 20 days for 90% of patients to have their first appointment. For child and adolescent non-urgent care, the average province-wide wait is 75 days for 90% of patients. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that, nine, that 75 days is a long time for a child. It is, you know, conceivably a semester of school where you don't get to go to school. Um, it's a whole sports season. It is quite literally a large percentage of their lifetime. And we don't have clear data from there. For instance, we don't know how long it is, or it's not publicly reported, from the first appointment, which is usually a brief assessment, potentially a, a quick um, intervention, but not likely. We don't know how long you wait again. So you get past the first appointment and you wait longer. And we have limited outcome data, so we actually don't even know if what we are doing in terms of mental health services is working. For emergency mental health response, I would actually suggest that there is a solution. The good news is that communities around the world are already working on building alternative crisis response programs for mental health. Since the summer of 2020, I have been part of the International Reach Out Response Network, an international collective of people around the world that is working on alternative models of crisis response at the municipal, provincial and state levels. Members come from diverse sectors, including mental health clinicians, law enforcement officers, paramedics, community members and peers. They come from all over the world with a concentration in North America. I may have lost track of all of the initiative, but current Canadian ju jurisdictions looking to develop an alternative system include Ottawa, Toronto, Edmonton, and Victoria. The group meets bi-weekly and is collectively developing models, resources, and training to make the idea of rapid, trauma-informed responses that reduce law enforcement encounters and reduces <coughs> unnecessary emergency use. Our plan is um, put forth by this bill is to introduce an emergency mental health service in Nova Scotia that provides true crisis intervention. A model consistent with what mental health professionals, community organizations, anti-racist advocates and police themselves have asked for. Training 
can be undertaken with, within the current 911 system to develop the capacity to identify which calls can be responded to by a mental health crisis team. Most of the programs um, that exist or that are in development have a goal of diverting 75% of mental health 911 calls to a mental health team. Teams can include community paramedics who assess for medical and mental health emergencies, a clinician can attend to the client's mental health needs, a peer specialist with lived experience can help make the connection with clients to gain trust and move them to be more open to care. Proposed services would be community-based. Behavioral health crises are rarely exclude external ma uh, material factors. So after the response call, there is a need to follow up to connect clients to services such as treatment and housing. We can do so much better in Nova Scotia. Better use of our law enforcement and emergency services, better use of our mental health resources, better mental health. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, the, the existing mental health emergency support services are not good enough and Nova Scotians deserve more. There are literally lives on the line. If the government agreed, they would vote, they would vote to pass this bill into law today. Thank you. Um, Laura, Laura, I recognize the, I recognize the honor. I recognize the honorable member for Cole Harbour Dartmouth. Thank you, and you can see the newbies are like, who's first? <laughs> so I, but I, I had this concern. I wanted to hear the minister speak because I know in the mandate letter that he has a plan going forward to respond to mental health services. Um, my concern for a long time, you know, given my background and my exposure to the 911 system, there are some efficiencies that need to be found within that system in itself, because now when you call 911, as we know, many. Uh, first responders arrive. There's firefighters that arrive, there's the police that arrive, and when it's a mental health situation, a lot of them are not trained to respond to that. So I, in essence, I understand what is being discussed here today, but I was hoping to hear more from this government as to how they plan on doing this and how they plan on triaging it. You know, fixing the, you know, health care, the mental health part of it is a big part of it. And some of them are going through the, the 911 system when they really should not be going through the 911 system. There's some, there's some, a way to get to that help uh, that much sooner. Um, you know, we know that, and as I said yesterday, you know, I've experienced that myself, and I'm, I'm grateful that you know I, I received the, the care that I did. But there's a lot of people that don't know where to get that help. We have youth that you know call the nine, you know, the kids' help phone to get that information as to where to go and everything else. So there's a lot of good things being done out there. But it, in a time of crisis with your mental health, it would be nice to know what this government plans to do with regards to responding to that urgent need and when it's happening to the individual. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Lord Lee. I, I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton East, Minister of Communications, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And thank you to my colleagues for their for their words and their knowledgeable uh, comments with this uh, with this area. Uh, first of all, uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to say that I think as a province and as a society, we need to do better uh, for every Nova Scotia living with addiction and mental health issue. Uh, so I think we're definitely in agreement with that for sure. Uh, I recognize that for certain, having worked in the field for many years myself, and I think our government recognizes this as well. Uh, so I kind of work from a registered nurse's kind of standpoint in inpatient mental health and, and you know addiction services and in, inpatient acute psych psychiatric services, right? So. So trust me when I know that people are really struggling across the province, you know, and probably even worse after the pandemic, uh, to, to be quite frank. Um, that's one of the reasons why I ran for public office in the first place, uh, to be totally honest, was, you know, so, so I think we're in agreement with that. I think there's a lot of great things we could probably do together, uh, to, to, to be honest, and I, I sincerely mean that. To, and, um, so I think this, this is why I'm the minister for the department. I think that says a lot for the prioritization we place on this very important issue. Uh, it's very complex, I think, as we all could probably agree with that, you know. 
Um, I think there's been a real lack of focus on prevention and promotion, probably with mental health and addictions for, for decades in the province, to, to, to be honest. Um, I know there was a mention of there's insufficient kind of budgetary resources also allocated for, you know, for mental health and addictions uh, in, in previous years. Uh, I do think it's worth noting that our platform commitments are over $100 million of an increase for addictions and mental health, uh, which is very significant. Uh, and that's something we can definitely build upon as the, we, we progress through, through my mandate, I would say. Uh, so yeah, I've been given the honour of the role to be responsible for addictions and mental health. I mean, when they, we look at this specific piece of legislation, I think when people reach a crisis point, these are very complex, very rapid evolving situations. Um, I know there is the ability when someone calls 911 for a direct, uh, direct transfer to the mental health crisis line, uh, where they're connected directly with a practitioner, uh, triage, and kind of uh, that's kind of how the process works. So. Uh, I think that the, the, and it's also worth noting that there are crisis response teams in all of our regional hospitals across the province. So I mean, anyone in a true mental health crisis should be getting treatment that they need and deserve at that time. Um, is there gaps and insufficiencies with that? I would say probably there is, and I think that's kind of what I'm going to try, try to improve as best as I can with my with my office. Um, so there, there is mental health crisis and urgent care teams uh, across the province and at the IWK. Um, so these allows health professionals. Uh, to kind of address addictions and mental health issues fa as fast as they can, I would say. Uh, I know this specific piece of legislation, I believe, looks at the central zone uh, and the crisis mobile teams that can be dispatched. Uh, so, I mean, oftentimes, in my own experience, I think a lot of times these dispatching calls are often for wellness checks. Uh, so oftentimes there's an overlap of, you know, addictions and mental health care and police services, and both parties are a little bit, you know, there's a bit of lack of clarity, I guess, in what, what the appropriate measures are, right, because there's all kinds of... You know, safety is, is an issue both for the person in question, for the, the family and the, and the healthcare practitioners. Um, so I think it's important to know that there's, um, I guess, a critical part of my mandate is, is that there's supports uh, for Nova Scotians at the right time when they need the supports. Uh, so things don't escalate to a crisis in the first place, right? That's kind of where my head is at, to be honest. Um, I think if you get someone in, you know, the tier one, tier two, tier three sort of situation, you know, the, the whole goal of that is to avoid the crisis. I mean, that being said, I know crisis uh, will happen. It's, you know, it's, unfortunately, it's, it's inevitable, right? Um, so I think, you know, anyone of any age can experience an addiction or mental health crisis, right, which is, is important, right from youth, right up to geriatrics, you know, across the, uh, the continuum. And as a, that's not something that's lost on me, that's for sure. Uh, so I know there's the provincial crisis line is, is available to support clients uh, with addictions. Uh, crises such as police or EHS services, uh, primary care providers, guidance counselors, schools. Uh, I do think it's noteworthy that in my mandate letter I do have the uh, obligation to work with my colleague in education to develop an addictions curriculum in the public school system. Uh, so there's a real lack of knowledge I would say and a lot of stigma probably associated with all of us and probably people as they get educated throughout our school system. A uh, real lack of awareness that it's actually, you know, there's lots of biology that going on with addictions. It's not just a stigma you know, societal kind of judgment, I guess you would say. Um, so I, say, I would say it was, it's clear that the needs of someone experiencing a, a mental health crisis required special responses. Um, so I, I would say that I'm in the preliminary stages of kind of um, exploring increased uh, capacity for community-based treatment uh, across the province. Um, I think a, l a large part of that will involve me coming to, you know, different parts of the province and actually meeting with the, the communities and the practitioners in the specific area, because I think every community is different. Um, I know I've reached out to all the MLAs in the chamber to, to if you wanted to have me out for the day, I'd be willing to come. Um, just especially we know that there's certain parts of the province that have specific you know, needs and interests as opposed to others. So I, th I think that's very important. Uh, I, I would like to, to note that the crisis line specifically is, is staffed by well-trained clinicians. So I mean, they're, they're equipped to deal with you know, addiction and mental health crises. Um, so I think one of their one of their primary objectives is to de-escalate symptoms, you know, temporarily to get the person into treatment that they need. I mean, in any kind of crisis situation, I would say that that's probably the primary kind of objective, I guess, at the time. Um, so I think, you know, with in partnership with the federal government, I think the formulation of the three-digit crisis line is a real uh, opportunity, I think, to to give that single point of contact of service for someone in a true addictions and mental health crisis. Uh, I, was, I was very excited to see that there's a federal minister now in charge of addictions and mental health as well, and uh, she's actually a former physician as well, right? So I think Minister Bennett, uh, I'm really excited to have ministers at both, you know, the provincial and the federal levels that, 
it's kind of a first time in both areas that that's happened, right? So I think there's a lot of potential there to do some really good things. Um, the, the implementation of the three-digit crisis line is very clearly stated in my mandate letter, uh, along with increasing uh, virtual care kind of capabilities. Um, so I think that's a significant portion of the mandate uh, because with the three-digit crisis line, I mean, we'll have kind of rural parts of the province uh, that will need that virtual uh, capacity, I guess you could say, to have accessibility to the service, uh, essentially. Uh, so this is a significant piece of work. I mean, there's, there's two levels of government at play, and there's the CRTC has a role to, role to play as well. Uh, I know there was a, there was a three-digit uh, line implemented in the United States, uh, I believe, within the last two years. And I think their call volume uh, actually increased, I think, over 30%. So there's an exponential increase in calls. You need to staff accordingly, too, because you're going to get this massive influx, right? And then you also have to factor in the post-pandemic uh, impacts, right, on substance use and anxiety and financial hardships and all these other sorts of things. So, I mean, for a simple concept, it's actually quite comp <laughs> complex, to be honest, right, the, the three-digit line. Um, so just, just kind of a couple comments, I guess, just in regards to... Um, I guess access, right? So everything I'm doing in the department is, is, is kind of focused on increased access, right? For youth, for seniors, for you know middle-aged people, like for everyone, right? So you got to get increased access as quickly as possible, and that's, and that's kind of what I'm thinking about every <laughs> every day. So I think it's a, we have an exciting opportunity with you know the universal addictions mental health kind of uh, uh, legislated uh, objective that I have to carry out as part of my mandate. Uh, be the first province in the country to do so. Uh, so there's a lot of work, a lot of pressure, <laughs> a lot of accountability. I, I know that and I accept that uh, for sure. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we have a lot of uh, work, a lot of work to do together. And uh, like I said, if there's any comments or you think there's something that you can contribute, you know, I'm happy to, to speak and kind of you know, do, do that sort of thing. Uh, but unfortunately, the, uh, the piece of legislation here before us today kind of contradicts my mandate, to, to be quite frank. So I can't support it and the government can't. But thank you for your words. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Needham, Halifax Needham. Sorry. Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I just have to say one thing. Well, no, I'm just going to keep saying it. Uh, mental health is real. Like, it's a serious situation for a lot of people. And I, I just had to say that because it needs to be a priority. There needs to be something done immediately, not let's wait on things, all of these other pieces. So I'm going to go into my, my talk today. And I have to say, Madam Speaker, it's an honor to rise today to speak to Bill Number 26, a series of amendments to, to the Emergency 911 Act that would create province-wide emergency mental health response teams. The bill requires the Minister of Municipal Affairs to ensure that 911 is able to dispatch geographically situated emergency mental health response teams across the province. The minister can also delineate the expertise, training requirements, and composition of the teams and define the role of peace officers. Madam Speaker, this is a service that would save lives. When people who are in a mental health crisis call 911, they should do so knowing that they will be met by professionals who are equipped and ready to help, and that they are safe in making that call. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, this is sadly not always the case. And for too many people, the intersection of mental health crisis and policing can be deadly. In the last 20 years, 460 Canadians have died in encounters with police, and an overwhelmingly majority of those people struggled with mental health or substance abuse or both. Tragically, 42% of individuals were mentally distressed at the time of their killing. The situation is getting worse. The CBC reports that the rate at which people die in interactions with police has nearly doubled in the last 20 years. This investigation also found that black and indigenous people are overrepresented in these deaths, and I'll table that. Tragically, we all know the names of too many of these Canadians. In April of last year, DeAndre Campbell, a black man living with schizophrenia, was killed by Toronto police after, after himself calling for mental health help. Weeks later, Regis Korczynski Paquet, a black and indigenous woman, woman with ties to Nova Scotia, 
fell to her death from a Toronto balcony after police were called to her home to help. A week after that, police in Edmonston, New Brunswick, fatally shot Chantal Moore, an Indigenous woman, after being asked to check on her well-being. And just weeks after that, Ijaz Ahmed Chowdhury, a Toronto man living with schizophrenia, was killed by Peel Regional Police after being called to check on his well-being. Closer to home, here in Halifax, a 28-year-old man died after police used the taser on him. They were called to the premises after reports that the man was inflicting self-harm. In 2014 in Halifax, Mohamed Ashak, who lived with schizophrenia, died after he fell from his balcony in the South End while police were in his apartment. They were called there by a nurse after concerns about his mental health care. <coughs> Madam Speaker, this deadly problem is acute for racialized people. We know that structural racism is baked into our justice and policing systems, and it is not a surprising outcome that so many people are met by harm when they desperately need professional help and de-escalation. This incredible problem means, first, that racialized people are at a higher risk of being criminalized, harmed, or killed in encounters with police when they are seeking what, when what they are seeking and what they need is help. In March, we heard from Emma Halpern, the executive director of the Elizabeth Fry Society of mainland Nova Scotia, speak about this at a standing committee of community services meeting. She said, over the past few, year, few years in our work, we've seen some very concerning trends. We see high numbers of African Nova Scotian and Indigenous girls engaged in our programming around trafficking and exploitation. We see the criminalization of trauma and victimization, particularly for African Nova Scotian and Indigenous women and girls. When police arrive, for example, on scene, when an issue has occurred, we see young women and girls being identified as part of the problem, being criminalized for small things rather than recognized for what is actually going on, which is their tremendous victimization and trauma. And I'll table that. This trend of criminali criminalizing people in crisis is fueling the trend of over-representation over of black and indigenous women in the justice system. system. It means that racialized people are less likely to seek help when they are in crisis, if they know or suspect that police might be sent to the scene. So my previous, um, my volunteer work that I do, it's not previous because I still do it when, it, when necessary. I'm a, um, I'm a CMT member, and that means a com community mobilization team member. And community mobilization is a community team that's led with a holistic approach to preparing and responding to violent or traumatic incidences. We work toward preventing violence by reduce, reducing distress, restoring limits, uh, unity and building resilience. So we work in collaboration with the Public Safety Office, HRM, Municipal Services, um, Policing, and any other emergency service providers that are, that are um, called to the scene so that we can make sure that everyone around us is safe and there isn't something that, um, and if there is something that needs to be addressed, we can do that directly. So I say all of this because I'm going to give you an example that happened in my own community. A youth experiencing a mental health crisis. So a youth was triggered by something at home, whatever the situation was, which caused him to move all of his mom's belongings, uh, tables, chairs, TV, um, everything in the household to the garbage. To the gar and it was a bit of a step to the garbage bin. And this young person isn't big. He might have been about maybe not even 200 pounds, maybe 150 pounds. And he wouldn't stop when asked by his mom. And other community members were talking to this, to this young person, and he wouldn't stop. So that caused his mom to react because she was freaked out at the fact that her son was reacting to something, and she had no idea. He wasn't harming anybody, he wasn't doing anything, but he was obviously experiencing a mental health crisis. So mom reacted and came to see me and asked me to help her with this situation. So. I say this because 
Mom had to make the call to 911. Obviously, it was a crisis situation happening, but she was super scared because her interactions with the police haven't always been positive, and she was afraid that her son was going to be harmed. So I took the call, I, I, I made the call, I took the phone from her, and I said to the officer, the 911 dispatch, I said, please dispatch officers that actually have mental health training. Anybody that is, ex that is experiencing mental health, and, and especially young black children or youth, when they see officers, they're going to respond, and it may not be a positive one. So I, 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 I stressed that to the officers when they got there. I, when they came to the scene, they directly came over to me. I, I kind of flagged them because situations was happening. And I called them over, and I said, I just need you to know, this is what's going on, X, Y, and Z. Told them the situation. He's a really good kid. He's nice. He's kind. He's, he's soft-hearted. He's going through something right now. I need you to go in there and reassure mom, but as well, create a safe space for them to be able to deal with the situation. So that happened, that happened, and I was grateful. The officers with the, that came on site had training. They, they had specific training, whether it was the mental health first aid, anything like that. They came in and they stayed for an hour with this young man. The young man was non-responding. He didn't talk, he didn't say anything. He sat in the bathroom with the door locked. Obviously, with our concern that maybe he might be hurting himself, I was able to go into the door and talk with him. Non-respondent, just looked me, looked through me, and it was fine. But the officer said, we have to leave because we have other things that we have to do. But we understand that this is an important situation. This is a phone number to call. Mom called the mental health crisis line, which she had to leave a message. She couldn't have um, anybody call her back. And two days later, she was in panic again because he never left the bathroom, two days. And so she had asked me, should I take him to the hospital? Absolutely. Have officers come, do the exact same situation this time when they come and have them talk to him. And so they had to take him out in obviously handcuffs, but they did it in, a, in an easy way where he wasn't responding and, and reacting. Anyways, long story short, no help was done. He went to the hospital, he was seen. They, they told him that he'd ha mom would have to sign off her rights to him in order for them to do any type of assessments. Then they said it wasn't back and forth. Regardless, it wasn't important enough because he wasn't speaking. He didn't talk. And normally he does talk, but he was in such of a crisis, he didn't talk. So because they thought he was just not saying anything, they sent him to the shelter. Because mom said, I'm scared for my life. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't want him, I, I, I don't know where to send him. Can you keep him here? Can you have him assessed? They were like, there's nothing we can do for him here. And they sent him to a shelter. This young man, to this day, I don't see. Because I don't know where he's at and what he's doing. And mom just prays daily for his care. So, in saying that, another piece. In marginalized communities, in order for an ambulance to respond on site, Police need to be present before responding. So on many occasions during my responses as a CMT member, um, I've had, had to literally beg um, emergency services to come into the community because it, time was of the essence. So I'm not going to go into any more of that because we have limited time and I want to make sure that I get all the points in here. But this government has a responsibility to protect people seeking help in mental health crises and to enable alternatives for the thousands of Nova Scotians every year who find themselves in this position. Madam Speaker, people deserve better access to mental health care in this province, including and possibly most especially when they are in crisis. And that means making appropriate emergency help available to people, not necessarily by police. So all of this, Madam Speaker, is with a key demand of the Black Lives Matter movement is to defund the police from Black Lives Matter Canada. So I'll, I'll table that, but it just, it just says table. Taxpayers spend over 41 million per day collectively on police services across the country. This does not include spending on the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and etc. Customs, fisheries, blah, blah, blah. We believe that black communities and all communities deserve better. The 41 million per day that is being spent on policing is not creating safer, more secure communities. This funding can be reallocated to create safer and more secure societies for all of us and to rid black and indigenous communities of a serious threat to our safety. Mr. S Madam Speaker, reallocating these resources and defunding the police means having systems set up that are safer and more appropriate. This is the spirit behind this bill, and I urge my government colleagues to support it. 
Madam Speaker, it is important to explain a little bit about what the movement to defund the police is about. It's about reallocating resources to community-based and other government organizations that are better equipped to deal with the roots of the nonviolent issues that police are mostly called on to address, such as homelessness, mental health, and addictions. The police are the first to admit that they are increasingly called to address everything from potholes and cats and trees and all that good stuff. It's simply about ensuring that the best and the most appropriate help is deployed that will work upstream to address the root of the problems people these days are experiencing. So police have said they agree they're not equipped to deal with the wide, range, wide and complex range of mental health crises. Um, Chief Dave McNeil of the Toro Police said mental health crisis in, in, in regard to the mental health crisis response that this isn't the type of work we signed on to do. Agreed. And it's not the type of work that we're actually trained to do. Absolutely. We don't call mental health clinicians to respond to break and enters, but unfortunately the police are the kind of a kind of agency of last resort because they're the only 24-7 helping agency in most communities. So I'm going to table all this other stuff. But this means that, Mr. Speaker, it's squarely on this government's set of responsibilities to develop alternatives to the current dangerous and mismatched arrangement that is the case today for so many Nova Scotians in mental health crisis. Police shouldn't be the only 24-7 support agency in communities. So supports need to include trained professionals that can do more than identify, that, that can do more than identify identity when someone is in distress. So as much as we value our youth workers, librarians, public library workers, Tim Hortons workers, teachers, CMT members, we as a government should have proper resources and people in place to do this important work for our province. Which is why, Madam Speaker, I call on all members of this House to correct this historic wrong and support Bill Number 26 with the same effort and gumption as all the other bills that were passed recently because all Nova Scotians should be able to access appropriate mental health supports. So please, I ask to pass this bill as it is a necessity for our province. Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I want to thank the, my colleagues in the NDP caucus for bringing this bill forward and drawing attention to this important issue. It's uh, certainly one that I'm sure all of us here in this House see the need for significant improvements. And I'm confident that the new minister is going to address those in his, in his portfolio. First comment that I want to make in relation to this bill in 911 service in general is what we need in Cumberland North is we need to actually have cell phone coverage. Mm -hmm. So there are pockets in Cumberland North where people cannot access 911 because they have no cell phone coverage. I would estimate probably 25 percent of my constituency has no cell phone coverage. That is an estimate, Madam Speaker, but that is an estimate from me when I'm driving, because I'm often on Bluetooth talking to people. And I know the areas where there is no cell phone coverage. So that needs to be addressed. And interestingly enough, we have not, I don't think we've heard about improving internet or cell phone coverage um, yet by this government. Yet it is a, a huge problem, definitely in rural Nova Scotia and definitely in Cumberland North. So, First step is we need to ensure that all people actually have access to 911 emergency service. <clears throat> the second point that I'll make there, and I know I do have colleagues that live in Pictou area that have a similar problem in Colchester North, where when they call 911 with their cell phone, it goes to 911 in Prince Edward Island or sometimes in New Brunswick. And those provinces will then uh, reroute the 911 call to to Nova Scotia, but that creates a delay. And in the time of uh, fires or other urgent um, heart attacks, suicide ideation, uh, minutes can save lives. So that also needs to be fixed. And I did address that with the with the former minister of municipal affairs in the previous government, and basically he told me that uh, I could deal with it with the service providers myself. And I, I really didn't think that that was uh, a responsible uh, response from the minister because ensuring all Nova Scotians have adequate 911 service is a responsibility of this government. <clears throat> Specifically when it comes to mental health, 
Uh, we all have gaps. There's huge, huge needs for improvement. Recently, I wrote to Nova Scotia Health to ask for clarification of when is the mental health crisis team actually available in Amherst and Cumberland North. And I did ask my assistant, Madam Speaker, to, to send this letter through to the library and they're going to bring it in and I can table it. Um, so is it okay if I just read a quote from, so um, I'll just read. The Cumberland County Urgent Care Team is available Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 p.m. The Urgent Care Team is a multidisciplinary clinical team of three staff, social work and nursing, who provide crisis mental health and addiction assessments in the emergency department at Cumberland Regional Health Care Center. They accept new referrals until 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. I want to just to highlight, so if you have a life-threatening mental health, uh, health condition after 3 p.m. Monday through Friday until 8 a.m. or any time, 24 hours on Saturday or Sunday, you have no access to the mental health crisis team. It's really unbelievable. Recently I had a constituent actually attempt to take their life and then came to my office. And uh, I think my constituents know that I care about them very deeply. They know that I'm a nurse and they often will come and, and seek help um, when they're in distress. But that, uh, Madam Speaker, was, um, it was very upsetting and concerning um, for the welfare of this person. And I'm here to tell you that this person did not have access to mental health crisis team. And I'm committed to working with the minister and anyone who will work with me to make improvements because it's wrong. It's just wrong. When someone is taken to our emergency department, if, if it's after 3 p.m. Monday to Friday or on a Saturday or a Sunday, Madam Speaker, they're often kept in a locked room with no furniture, no communication with staff, except for bringing in food, whatever's kind of the bare necessities. Family are not allowed to be with them. And they have to stay in this locked room, Madam Speaker, until until the emergency room physician or nurse can convince the psychiatrist in Truro or another psych hospital to do an assessment. And sometimes, Madam Speaker, that can take up to four to five days where someone is in this locked room. And then they're often just discharged from Truro with no follow-up, no access to therapy, no access to counseling. And the thing is, this is just what's happening. This just literally happened three weeks ago to someone that I know. And it's happening every day in this province. And there are people dying because they don't have access to the care. And Madam Speaker, if I, if this same person had had a heart attack or stroke or an abdominal aneurysm rupture, they would have been taken to the emergency department and they would have been seen by a specialist that is on call in a shared on-call rotation 24-7. And every attempt would have been to, to save their life. And Madam Speaker, the people with mental health and mental illness are not treated equitably. They are not treated with the same respect. And that needs to change. Just last week, I had someone contact my office who is suffering from alcoholism. They said, uh, I need help. We reached out. They reached out to addictions to get admitted to detox. And they left a message. And I, I asked my assistant a couple of days later, I said, can you just follow up to make sure that person, that everything worked out? And the response was, no one returned their call. No one returned their call. I, don't, I just can't even believe that, it's, that we are in this state and there are people dying 
needlessly in this province because of the inadequate access to mental health care. I do want to acknowledge the social workers and the psychologists and the psychiatrists that we do have working in our mental health system. I do know that uh, firsthand from family uh, and friends that have, that have used their services, Madam Speaker, that they, they do their best in a broken system. And I do want to thank them for everything, every effort that they are making. But we do need to, be do, to do better. And the system is resistant to change. Um, I want to give an example. Back in 2002, I started a collaborative health clinic in Amherst. We had nine physicians, uh, two registered nurses, massage therapists, dietitian. And before I opened that clinic, I had traveled the province to look at different models of collaborative health care clinics. Because I said, whatever we do in Amherst, I want to make sure it's the best. And there was a clinic here in Cowie Hill, Madam Speaker, that had a shared mental health care um, program, I guess you'd call it. And in their collaborative practice, they in this shared mental health care, they had a psychiatrist that physically was at the collaborative care clinic once a month. So all of the patients that were referred by their, their family physicians were seen by a psychiatrist in their own clinic. They also had two therapists working right there with physicians, similar to how family practice nurses work with family doctors, Madam Speaker. And they told me, on average, people waited one week to see the therapist. One week. And in Amherst at the time, and it hasn't changed, it was over a year to see a therapist. They said the longest anyone would wait to see a therapist at this shared care uh, mental health program was two weeks. That was the longest time if a family physician made a referral. So I brought that model back. I invited the psychiatrist that ran that uh, program from Cowie Hill. I invited her to meet our team, including the psychiatrists in Amherst and the leaders there. <clears throat> and they just, they just wouldn't change. Even though this is a model that's clearly working, and my definition of clearly working is that the patients are getting better care. That's what we need to be measuring. It always has to be about the patient and the families, and are they getting access to what they need. And so there was a real resistance, and that was back in 2002. And uh, no matter what we did, we were not able to convince uh, the health authority at the time or the people working in mental health that we needed to move to this model. So. We do need to have strong leadership, and I shared the Minister for Mental Health now. He's, he's got, certainly has a, a large task at hand because sometimes the system is resistant to change. I also want to make mention that uh, the stronger we can make our mental health primary care services with therapists and social workers and psychologists, it will take a large burden off of family physicians. It's well documented that 80% of the work that a family physician does 80% is mental health related. Now, it may not be the first visit that they come in, but as the physician meets with them, it's well documented. So when you look at the intense need for family physicians in this province, if we were able to um, have therapists working directly with family physicians, and family physicians, if someone came in and they're in a marital um, crisis separation or they're having parenting problems and they're asking for help, instead of the physician spending 45 minutes with them counseling, they would be able to say, look, I can, I can make a referral to the therapist, she, can, she or he can see you next week, and there the physician is freed up to see um, another acute medical situation. So uh, it, the therapists and social workers and psychologists are part of the solution, uh, even for improving access to family physicians and primary care in this province. And the last comment that I want to make, Madam Speaker, is just regarding law enforcement. Um, the, the officers that we have in Cumberland North, through the town of Amherst and through RCMP, do an incredible job. And they're often asked to be therapists. And they're often asked to be social workers and trying to fill in the gaps because the healthcare system is not doing its job. And it's taking, it's a, it's taking a toll, Madam Speaker, on our law enforcement. Uh, we owe it to them to make sure that our healthcare system can provide healthcare 
and they can do their job in law enforcement and not trying to be therapists and social workers in our community. So I'll finish off by thanking again my colleagues in the NDP caucus for bringing this forward and certainly I support, so support this bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I recognize the honourable member for uh, Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I ask that you now call Bill Number 19, the Owl's Head Act. Thank you. Have to I'd like to ask the member if, if she, I can put a motion to adjourn debate or if you put a motion, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to adjourn debate on bill number 26, the Emergency 911 Act. Okay, thank you. Uh, the motion is for a second reading of bill, oh, no, just a, Okay, motion, motion is for the adjournment of debate. <laughs> All those in favor of the motion, please say A. Aye. 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 Contrary minded, say nay. nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Could you now call Bill Number 19, the Owl's Head Act? Thank you. And I recognize the Honourable Member for the Leader of the New Democratic Party for Halifax Shabakto. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to speak to Bill 19, the Owl's Head Act, this afternoon. The Owl's Head Act, or more formally, an act respecting parks and protected areas, is in fact a series of modifications to three pieces of legislation concerning protected lands in Nova Scotia. The Provincial Parks Act, the Special Places Protection Act, and the Wilderness Areas Protection Act. It provides, very simply, that where land has been provisionally granted protection or been designated for protection, it may not have that designation removed without a process of public consultation. The purpose of Bill 19 is therefore to guarantee that in future, no protected or designated lands may ever be removed or delisted from that designation in a secret, hidden, or surreptitious way, such as was the case with the Liberal government's disposition of Owl's Head Provincial Park. If ever there were a piece of opposition legislation that recommends itself to the government's support, surely this might be it. Throughout 2020 and 21, the Premier, in his former capacity as opposition leader, had matched the NDP's condemnations of what was done to Owl's Head blow for blow, referring to the absence of due process there as, I believe at one point he put it, as despicable. The Owl's Head Act provides the government this afternoon with an opportunity to plug a democratic loophole so that protected lands in future are always dealt with with more transparency and visibility to the public. Madam Speaker, people will recall that the whole issue of the delisting of Owl's Head Park never came to public light at all until an enterprising reporter determined that some time previous, the cabinet had prepared the land for potential sale to an American developer of a golf course by means of a confidential cabinet mechanism called a minute letter. No sooner had the public had a chance to take this fact in than it was revealed that this process had taken place in the context of private meetings between members of the government and a former Liberal cabinet minister, Michel Samson, whose stated agenda for these conversations, the provincial lobbyist registry revealed, was, quote, acquisition of and access to crown land for lighthouse links, unquote, that was the golf course developer. If I were the new government, 
I would take the opportunity of the Owl's Heads being, uh, Owl's Head Acts being debated today to support it and pass it and thereby have an opportunity to distance themselves as much as possible from the absence of transparency to do with Owl's Head, which they had joined previously in condemning. And not just the transparency. Absent also from uh, what happened at Owl's Head was any sense of uh, the adequate regard and respect for the public voice, for community consultation. Owl's Head didn't just appear uh, on the 2013 Parks and Protected Areas Plan a week or two before uh, it landed there. It had been understood on the eastern shore to be a park, a public park belonging to the people of Nova Scotia for at least 45 years. And its place on the Parks and Protected Areas Plan was developed out of decades of that organic understanding and community consultation. It was over 40 years ago, in June 1980, in volume four, number 24, of Conservation, a then quarterly publication of the Department of Lands and Forests, that Owl's Head was included in the Eastern Shore Park System Master Plan. And during the 2009 Collins Stewart Forest Forum and the 2011 12% Lands Review process, over 2,000 written submissions were brought forward. And input was received from hundreds of people at 17 public open house sessions. In 2012, Owl's Head Provincial Park appeared in the Provincial Parks and Park Reserves map series of the department. And until the park was surreptitiously removed from the mapping of the department following the breaking publicly of this story, Owl's Head also appeared on the online Department of Lands and Forestry map titled Parks and Protected Areas a system for Nova Scotia. It was out of all of this extensive uh, community consultative background that Owl's Head was, was then listed on the 2013 Parks and Protected Areas Plan list, which was developed out of an extensive and historic consultation, uh, an ex historic extensive consultation that was then passed over and disregarded with the appearance of the minute letter to which I previously referred, by which Owl's Head was removed from the designated list. Madam Speaker, the Owl's Head Act is particularly relevant in this moment when land protection has become a matter of such importance. Because there is a, a wide range of areas across Nova Scotia which are in a similar situation uh, to that that Owl's Head had been in prior to its delisting. That is, areas which have been on a list of places under pending protection for some years and which, without the protections of the Owl's Head Act, are going to similarly be in a vulnerable situation. Among them, the Mersey River Provincial Park, Palmquet Beach Provincial Park, Monkshead Provincial Park and Blue Sea Beach Provincial Park, wilderness areas such as the Economy River Wilderness Area and the St. Andrews River Wilderness Area are in a parallel situation, as are the Glenbrook Nature Reserve and the Mulgrave Hills Nature Reserve. There are still over 150 areas that are not legally protected uh, in the 2013 Parks and Protected Areas Plan. And the people of Nova Scotia deserve to know that if there's any change to the pending status of those areas and uh, that pending status, that that change cannot be made without the broad, respectful public consultation by which these areas were put forward for various forms of protection on that list in the first place. And it is, Madam Speaker, um, a significant moment in which the present government could enact the provisions of the Owl's Head Act. The government at this moment is before the House with its Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act. An important component of this act, of course, is, is its goals and its provisions on this very subject about land protection. Now, in the NDP, as we will be speaking about directly, we think that these goals uh, could be properly strengthened. We support a land protection goal of 2030 by, uh, of 30% sorry, by 2030, with an interim goal of 25% by 2025, and, and we support the immediate protection of all the designated lands in the 2013 Parks and Protected Areas Plan, including Owl's Head. In these matters, 
We differ from the government, which has put forward uh, a more modest goal and a goal which does not uh, come complete with interim steps by which to get there. But we share with the government the view that it is very important that those land protection goals, as in that piece of legislation, ought to be in that legislation. And it is true that in that legislation's previous iteration, they were not. Um, and it's an important thing because legislation is an open, uh, uh, a visible, a public matter. You cannot change in our system legislation behind closed doors. By its definition, all legislation is there for all to consider. All legislation is there for all to see. And this is precisely the principle that the Owl's Head Act brings to the range of legislation that covers various types of land protection in Nova Scotia. The principle, namely, that land protection is too important for official changes in the status of designated or pending designated properties to be able to take place without the transparency and respect for the public voice that are required. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's a very important act, and I just want to take a few minutes to speak on this. I just, it's a few things that I want to clear up about. Uh, first, what the member uh, to my left has said, uh, especially around the list, the list of protected properties, the hundreds and hundreds of protected properties that uh, was put in under the NDP government. Um, the thing was, is they had five years to protect these properties, and they did not. They scrambled at the last moment before a 2013 election and put together a list of properties because they were being challenged publicly, publicly on their environmental backbone. They had an opportunity to protect this land and so much more, and they chose not to. Madam Speaker, one of their biggest accomplishments, and listen, I have, I, they've done, they've did some great stuff and lots of respect for the former, I know I can't, <laughs> for the former Premier who I, who I know quite well, uh, Daryl Dexter. Um, but the member of the, for the NDP, the, le the leader of the NDP was part of that government, a prominent part of that government. So we can't erase history here. We can't say that things ha happened or didn't happen and they had nothing to do with it. Uh, Bowwater is one of their greatest accomplishments and they tout Bowwater. They tout the, the, the saving of all that crown land turning it into crown land, taking this private land and turning it into crown land. Well, Madam Speaker, I would challenge anyone here, especially who know the forest industry, to go and see how much of that crown land that they protected and celebrated that they cut, and they allowed to be cut. So it's one thing to say you're an environmentalist and you're here to protect the planet, and it's another thing to actually do it. And so we've seen yeah, we, I mean, what, the members are agreeing uh, that I'm right on this. That's great to know. Um, so their greatest environmental land protection accomplishment was actually saving land and then transferring it over to be clear-cut. Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I would have liked to seen uh, that list that they put together. I just, I mean, I'll get into why we support this bill. But I, I just envision in my mind, very imaginative, days, weeks, minutes, hours before the election. Maybe an email goes out scrambling and saying, quick, grab the land. We need, we need to find something that gets them back on our side. And then hundreds of hundreds of submissions came in. And they just threw it on a list and said, there it is. But nothing happened with it. Nothing happened. This, the previous government, um, I would put our environmental uh, background and, and the achievements up against Anyone, anyone. MV Minor was something that we took great pride in cleaning. Uh, P 
Pictou Landing First Nations and, and, and the environmental racism that happened there and was there under previous governments that did nothing, nothing for those people, for those communities. My own backyard, the RDM site, or the, uh, sorry, the C&D site in Harrietsfield. We begged the former government to do something. Please. Not a thing. The Liberal government gets in. Those decisions are made. Money is spent. And people uh, get the government, the environmental government they deserve. Now, one of the things I'll say about Owl's Head is is that uh, there was no, quite simply, there was no commitment to sell it off. We, cabinet did not proceed with that. That is misinformation. And I see the member shaking his head over there. I, I'd tell him to table the documents if he has them. Um, that's misinformation that was put through during the election. It was an election ploy from members What, we, what was asked is quite simply public consultation. The former Premier of this province, a member for Timberley Prospect, one of the biggest environmentalists I know, and one of the reasons why I supported him was his stance on coastal protection, his stance on the environment, his stance on land protection. I'm hearing a lot of chirping, uh, Madam Speaker, and, and especially from the NDP side. And respectfully, when they stood up to speak, we didn't say a word. So we would afford the same, we would ask for the same. Um, so consultation was to be had, Indigenous consultation was to be had. It would not, the sale of that land would not be approved, would not be approved without significant public consultation. People needed to have their voices heard on all sides. And, and for members that may shake their head or think that's not true, I'll take you back to early years of the Liberal government when we're on the fracking situation. A large percentage of this province didn't want it and a percentage of this province wanted it. It would have been quite easy and quite simple just to say, no, we're not doing it. So what did we do? We went to the public. We allowed the process to take place. We allowed people to have their voices heard. And in the end, we heard loud and clear from the people of Nova Scotia that fracking was not something they wanted. Again, previous governments and their claim to be environmentalists could have done something about fracking, chose not to, I think because they felt it was a pretty divisive issue. Um, we went to the public, we listened to the public. We, there was public consultations held. And the decision was made to move away from fracking. I think it's important that we listen to people and we look at options. I'm not saying that you have to support everything, and listening to people does not mean you have to support, that you have to support uh, the options that are put in front of you. It means that you actually listen to them and, and you, you let them have their say on all sides, ma no matter if they agree or not. I mean, this is democracy. People approach me all the time with ideas that I just don't agree with, fundamentally don't agree with. But you listen to them. You hear them out. And then you make a decision. A good leader makes a decision based on consultation, and listening to the public. And, you know, there, there, it just, it was very difficult 
to have that conversation and to get to a point where, not just on Al's head, but on many different things, where we can have that debate in the public when members of the legislature are villainizing individuals left, right, and center, especially, you know, it's one thing to villainize an MLA, because I guess that's expected, but it's another thing to villainize members of the public, members of the public that you've never met, quite frankly. I know that's not something I'm in the practice of doing, whether I agree with somebody or not. Um, and it became, it did not become an issue for the, for the NDP in particular until an election was looming. I go back to their five years in power. And I think one of the things that people had hoped to see from that former government was more protection, more land conservation. We had the Purcell's Cove backland as a great example in my own community. Um, it took a f uh, the liberal government, the former liberal government, and HRM and different stakeholders in the community to come together to finally protect that land, to make that option available. So my experience before being an MLA was like kind of beating your head off the wall on some of these important projects, some of these important issues for the public. And uh, listen, and Madam Speaker, I understand. I understand that there's a lot of things on government's plate. There's a lot of pressures on them. And sometimes these things get pushed to the side. But they don't get pushed to the side in communities. And I think most people should have a right to have their voices heard. And I would have liked to hear a robust conversation on the subject. I think we know, we're, it was clear, I know from my community, I went and talked to people from all sides on this issue. It was very clear in my community where people stood. And I represent the people in my community, so you know, we, we have to represent their, uh, their wishes and their, their views. But we, we had heard from other members that not just on the government side, but on the opposition side, that there was some concerns coming in, and people would like to hear their voices heard. And I think what happened was, instead of acting in a true democratic fashion uh, and allowing all voices to be heard, we rushed out or Individuals rushed out and silenced or plugged their ears to different opinions and views. And I do think this bill is, is a good bill. I think that um, we need to have an open process. And there needs to be more consultation. But the process can't just be one-sided. The consultation can't be one-sided. And that's what I would remind some members in the House of, and I know where I stand. Uh, I know where the people in my community stand. Um, but I would, I would hope that when they're, when they're thinking of this bill, they're thinking of everybody. We've got to, we've got to be able to have mature, a mature debate on difficult topics without name calling and villainizing and turning people against each other. And that seems to be the norm now with a lot of topics. We, we don't want to sit in a room and have a discussion. We want to point fingers and, and say, you're wrong and I'm right and that's it. And 
I, I kind of blame social media a bit for that. I think people get kind of caught up in their own little circles and, and that's it. Um, I do respect the, the member for Shabakdo and the bill that he's brought forward and we're, we're going to support this bill. We're going to support this bill. Um, we think it's a good bill, but I, I just want to remind people that um, when we're having these conversations, we've got to be able to listen to all sides. You know, these, I truly believe that democracy works uh, and the voice of the people will rise through it all. And we've seen that from the fracking issue. We've seen that from the environmental racism in, in Picto. We've seen it with that issue where uh, very few people in this legislature spoke up on it. In fact, outside of government, um, and a couple of members in this legislature, very few people spoke up on it. And yes, there was members from different parties that spoke up on it, but I would think this would, be a, would have been an issue that brought everybody together. So uh, I want to thank the honorable member from Halibak Shabakto, who's been here quite a while and has done a fantastic job is in his role. And I want to thank you for bringing this forward, and we will be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the Honorable Member for Cumberland South, uh, Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I, I thank my members opposite for, for the conversation on Bill 19. And uh, just, just to make a few points uh, respectfully, respectfully make a few points. Um, our par I know exactly where our party stood during the election on this issue. And I, I know exactly where my colleague, the former critic of uh, Department of Environment, stood on it when, when the issue came to hand and, and there were questions asked in this very chamber um, a number of years back. But uh, we, we certainly disagreed with how the process started uh, with, with this. And we, we certainly made the, the bold statement that when we form government, um, we would certainly look in, into what the previous government had signed and agreed to with that process. And in, in respect of the whole process, we do know, Madam Speaker, that uh, right now that that process is in, a, in an appeal process. And when, when we go back and, and speak in, as department uh, representatives, as ministers, we certainly take legal advice very, very strongly. So I'm going I'm to try very strongly uh, as we go through the discussion today to stay away from the, the idea and the process and how, how we got there. But I do want to speak about the, the bill at hand and, and, and outside of the, the, the title of the bill, th there, there certainly are great aspects in that bill that I don't think that anybody in this chamber could debate. And, and one of my very first, uh, first uh, questions or, or briefings that we had in and around protected lands and, and how lands get there and how lands could potentially come off, um, it was very evident to me that there was a bit of cloudiness in and around that, that aspect of how, how lands could come and go. And, and uh, how it could disappear uh, uh, with, without formal notice, uh, how it gets off the, the wish list, if you will, to an actual protected list, and, and, and the whole process. And, and I know that uh, I've, ha I've had a few uh, conversations with the, the previous Minister of uh, Lands and Forestry when I was critic, and, and th there, there's a commitment in this House. We may debate on the percentage of protection, protected lands, but there's a commitment throughout this House that as a whole body, as the elected representatives of, of Nova Scotia, we have to do better for our lands. And we as a government have said, we can protect lands, but we can also have an economy and a, and a robust, uh, uh, sustainable um, land asset within our crown lands. So I just wanted to recognize that. And I also want to take a minute to recognize uh, uh, the dedicated staff that do work behind the scenes to allow these, these lands to be uh, protected, uh, to, to, to do the studies, to see how it goes to the next level. Uh, th they're very much dedicated to, to the province of Nova Scotia. No matter what government sits on this side of the house, their, their work continues. And it continues to, to, to brief the minister at, of the day of the aspect of, of where their, their uh, studies have brought them to. And it's up for the elected officials, the minister, the government of the day to make those decisions. So I just want to take that minute to, to recognize the, the, the provincial staff that are certainly supporting all the ministers here today and, and, and previous. Now, just, just a few aspects about Crown land and, and the land that makes up a, a Nova Scotia. Uh, Crown land essentially belongs to the people of Nova Scotia. I know it's called Crown land, but it belongs to the people of Nova Scotia. And, 
as, as stewards of our departments, it's, it's our duty to ensure our lands are fostered the way that Nova Scotians want. Our land makeup is about 70% of Nova Scotia is private lands. That leaves 30% of Crown lands to be allocated. This is a vast difference than what we see in, in BC or Quebec or, or even in Newfoundland, where up to 90% of the land mass is Crown land. And we could debate, like I said, the goals of what we want in a percentage of a protected area, but we, we're very adamant in, in the bills that we presented, in the mandate letters that, that the Premier have given to, to uh, myself and other ministers, there needs to be that pr protection aspect. And, and I firmly believe that the protection aspect, we can achieve it through, through lands, through waterways, but the protection of it is for, for the betterment of our climate and to ensure that there is a future of Nova Scotia for our next generations to come. Now, I've been very, it's very clear in my mandate letter that 20% will be achieved in protecting the total land mass by 2030. There is a list of, of parks and protected areas. There are about 100 sites that are remaining on, on this plan, and each site is unique. And as you go and look at each site, there's different aspects and studies that have to go in, into each piece of land, different consultations, and look, when I was critic, I think I criticized the Minister of Lands and Forests many times, did you do enough stakeholder cons consultation? And I know we, we, the leader of the uh, official opposition, I know that I'm going to get re rebuttal with that, did you do enough stakeholder consultation? And I expect that, because our government wants to be held up to the highest, highest critique level of this province, to ensure that we are doing the job that we were elected to do to ensure that we're doing what has been set out in our mandate letters from the Premier. Staff are reviewing many areas. Implementation will take place throughout what is already being written into this, but already things that our department has, has uh, set forward for the protection lands. Credit where credit's due. Some of that was done by the NDP government. The Liberal government took over, bettered it. It's our job as a government to better that process. And I go back to the statement that I made when I first, first opened my remarks. One of my first conversations when I had a briefing on, on protected lands was how can there be so much cloudiness? How can the public have so many different opinions on one issue, such as the title of this bill? And there, there, there was never ever a public consultation process done. Can we go out and talk to every single Nova Scotian? No, but we do have process. There is a process to follow, and, and I'm encouraging staff to come back to me. How can, we, how can we better that process? How can we have a process how that land gets on a wish list? How can we have a process how that land moves on to the protected area? A process that if the land is, and staff have told me um, that on, on those long list of lands, there are actually lands there that don't actually meet the criteria that were put on back in the 50s. They don't necessarily meet the criteria anymore. But are we going to take, just take that off as a government? No, there has to be a process. And public consultation has to be included in that. Government has several tools um, to protect land. And this, this includes different types of uh, designations, and, and I appreciate the, the leader of the NDP for bringing it up. There's wilderness protected areas. Um, which Nova Scotia has over 70 areas. A wonderful example of this is the French River Wilderness Area. We have nature reserves that uh, have the highest level of protection for unique rare species or features. Provincial parks, which I know that every single one of us uh, heard about when we were campaigning. Um, the want for parks to, to be expanded and uh, parks to be uh, further developed. Um, I'm certainly going to look at, look at this as, as the minister, and, and uh, I know that uh, I've had many questions in, in my years in this house about the parks that uh, we find in Carmelan area that, that are, are seen since the COVID, uh, COVID times that are getting more utilized, more utilized. And we should be very proud of it. We have a lot of uniqueness here in Nova Scotia. And every chance I get, I, I, I speak about the UNESCO Geopark from, that runs from Carmelan County to Colchester, and I know my Colchester counterparts would argue that it runs from Colchester to Cumberland County, but the fact remains, we have a UNESCO geopark right here in Nova Scotia. It was announced on July 10th, in, in, to 2020, during the pandemic, 
Um, it, uh, it, it's a storybook of beautiful scenic areas that are shared along our coastline on the, on the Fundy shore, which I say that that book hasn't even had a chance to be opened up yet because of the pandemic. But it's a unique area to our Nova Scotian heritage, the history of Nova Scotia. It's showcased. Some of those, some of those scenes are, are in areas that, uh, that, that can be protected, that can be put on a list. But how, my, my point in talking about the UNESCO Geopark, it wasn't just one body that decided, hmm, we're gonna do a geopark. It was multiple levels of government, it was multiple levels of consultation, many years of hard work of the municipalities of Colchester and Cumberland, uh, many, many uh, years of dedication from the provincial and, the, and federal levels of government. My point is, is there has to be collaboration. There has to be process. And in order to get designated as UNESCO Geopark, there was a process followed. And that process is uh, to, to come up with, with what the topic of hand of protecting lands, there, there are legal aspects on, on achieving that. There are several steps that need to be take, taken. Staff of both my department and Department of Environment and Climate Change are working collaboratively to identify some of those, some of those areas. Values that we consider as a government are remote large areas, mostly natural state with uh, few human contacts or impacts. Representative uh, examples of full spectrum Nova Scotia landscapes. As a government, we recognize the fact that we, uh, we uh, want to recognize the utilization of recreational aspects on our crown lands. So it's not just about protection of, of, uh, of lands and, and aspects. We, we know that we have a, a vast uh, forestry industry and we're moving on to the Leahy uh, model of, of how ecological forestry is done and, 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 uh, and that, that was started by the previous government. We're taking the reins on it. We're gonna move forward on that. Uh, I know I had a discussion with the, the leader of the opposition of how the management guide actually has started to be implemented. There, there's been a little bit of debate on the house of, of uh, the, the past few weeks, whether that has been implemented or not. But there, there's a whole vast usage of our crown lands. Yes, our government's committed to having a, a sustainable resource within our Crown lands. Our government's committed to the re recreational faci facility use of our Crown lands. And our government's committed to protecting of the lands. Part of what's in this bill, as I've stated before, uh, Mr. Speaker, we are committed as a government to, uh, to some of those aspects and some of those aspects in the, in the bill that the NDP have tabled have certainly started to take, take shape and take full within, within our, our government and within our mandate letters. So I, I greatly appreciate the NDP uh, doing their job to hold government to account to ensure that we're moving to the steps to protect land in the proper way and, and understand that we're going to have a process. And I look forward to, to my colleagues opposite uh, in their critic roles to, to have conversations to ensure that to ensure that the, these protected lands are going to move forward with a process, with a process, and, and give, give, uh, give government the tools that they need to work with and have stakeholder con consultation. So at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, public does have their say. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I... I, just, I, I, I rise to move second reading of Bill 19. Order, please. If I recognize the honorable leader of the official of, of the New Democratic Party, it's the closed debate on the bill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I moved a uh, second reading on Bill 19. Recorded vote. Recorded vote. Uh, a recorded vote has been called for. We'll have the vote when. Is it agreed that we have a recorded vote? Okay. Uh, we'll. Uh, There will be a recorded vote. Uh, so we'll wait until the whips are satisfied before the vote will take place. We'll recess until the whips are satisfied.
Order, please. The motion is to adjourn debate on Bill Number 19. Uh, re a recorded vote, yes. The motion <laughs> for a recorded vote. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And we'll ask the clerks if they'll call the names and record the vote. The clerk. Brad Johns. No. Tori Rushton. No. Barbara Adams. No. Kim Masland. No. Tim Houston. Alan McMaster. No. Carla McFarland. No. Michelle Thompson. No. John Lohr. Pat Dunn. No. Tim Hallman. No. Steve Craig. No. Dave Ritzy. No. Brian Wong. No. Susan Corkum Greek. No. Brian Comer. No. Colton LeBlanc. No. Jill Balzer. No. Trevor Boudreau. No. Greg Morrow. No. Becky Druin. No. Larry Harrison. No. Chris Palmer. No. John A. McDonald. No. Melissa Sheehy Richard. No. John White. No. Danielle Barkhouse. No. Tom Taggart. No. Nolan Young. No. Kent Smith. No. Patricia Arab. Yes. Tony Ince. Yes. Angela Simmons. Yes. Zach Churchill. Aye. Ian Rankin. Yes. Derek Momberkett. Yes. Kelly Regan. Claudia Chender. Yes. Gary Burrell. Yes. Susan LeBlanc. Yes. Lisa Lachance. Yes. Susie Hansen. Yes. Kendra Coombs. Yes. Rafa Di Costanzo. Yes. Ali Duale. Yes. Laura Lee Nickel. Yes. Keith Irving. Yes. Brendan McGuire. Yes. Ben Jessam. Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. Yes. Carmen Kerr. Yes. Braden Clark. Yes. Fred Tilly. Yes. Ronnie LeBlanc. Yes. The results of the vote, uh, yes, 22, no, 28. The motion is defeated. I recognize the House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, now move that. That concludes. That, concludes up. that concludes opposition business for today. I'll turn things over to the government house leader. Thank you. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I request unanimous consent to now move into the moment of interruption and conduct the adjournment debate before proceeding to government business. Do I ask is for unanimous consent to move into the moment of interruption prior to finishing the day's business? Is it agreed? Agreed. It's agreed. Our, our topic this evening is moved by the Honourable Member for MLA, the Honourable MLA for Sydney Member 2, 
It states, whereas the government, Nova Scotia government is committed to phasing out coal by 2030, and it is crucial that workers and communities are at the heart of the transition with training, skills development, jobs in renewable energy, and opportunities in the green economy. Therefore, be it resolved, the government will focus on equity by ensuring communities that have traditionally been left out of the energy transition have an opportunity for skills training and new careers and jobs in the green economy. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm honoured to rise uh, in my in my place tonight to talk for a few minutes about uh, the motion that we put forward for debate. I look forward to hearing uh, from my colleagues across the floor, and also I look forward to uh, hearing uh, from my my colleague, my fellow Cape Bretoner, who would have probably the most experience in training. Uh, or one of them in, 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 in this house in his previous role as uh, principal with uh, the community college. So, so essentially for us, this is something that, uh, that has been very important to us. When we are in government now, government uh, is, is moving forward with, uh, with their legislation. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk about that in, in, in German debate. I think I'm allowed under the rules. Can I get clarification on that just quickly? Am I allowed to talk about the bill on the floor? That's... Uh, no? Okay, I'm, I'm seeing him shake his head. That's no. fine. No, that's fine. So, so what I'll say is this, is that everybody's pretty, well, every party is, is, is very consistent uh, on what, uh, ultimately, what, what, what our ambitions are to help promote a, 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 a healthier Nova Scotia. Um, that we know that the transition from, from coal and, and more traditional energy resources is happening. Um, that's, uh, governments are making decisions based on that. A lot of that's being uh, directed by market conditions more than anything else, but of course government is going to adjust. Uh, I had the privilege of being the Minister of Energy and Mines, what, uh, formerly, what, which is now the Minister of, uh, which is the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources. And uh, uh, so I, I, I had the opportunity over a couple of years to see firsthand some of the changes that have been made to help promote um, the work that we're doing in Nova Scotia continuing to be an international leader in, in GHG reduction, um, but also looking at what the future held because there was a concern coming out of particularly rural Nova Scotia and communities outside of, of HRM about what that en energy transition looked like and what that meant for the hundreds of employees that may have been employed uh, in various, uh, with various companies or organizations in the, in the traditional uh, energy sector. Um, this is something that's uh, important uh, for, for us at home. Uh, it's important uh, in, in other communities across Nova Scotia uh, and that we, we really, it's not, it's not just about tra training or retraining workers that worked in the traditional industries, it's also about the opportunities that are going to present itself moving forward based on whether it's a mega, uh, the, the larger infrastructure projects, uh, whether it's around the Atlantic Loop or, or other significant projects uh, that may come forward from, from, our, from Nova Scotia Power or other players, but also the opportunities that multi-party uh, multi, uh, multi governments um, brought forward over the years. So I, I said that in, in, in the conversation we had when we had an emergency debate uh, in our time during government is that, you know, the, the, the conversation about the environment and, and the work that the Nova Scotia government done, uh, has done and will continue to do spans over multiple uh, governments. So all of us can, you know, sit and stand in our, in our place and, and take some sort of, uh, I don't want to say credit, but you know, acknowledgement that we've all uh, have done the work. So um, I forgot it's only 10 minutes, so I better get into it. Um, so uh, so I, I do want to say this. What we need, ultimately what uh, we've done as a government is we've, we've put a lot of programs in place that are going to help support uh, uh, many Nova Scotians who want to get into, into the economy, into green energy. As I said, we expanded our, our solar program. The solar rebate is important. Uh, we're now the number one jurisdiction in Canada for solar because of that program. We need to keep that program going. We went from 16 to 70 companies uh, in, the, in one year. We have a six-month wait list. There's lots of work. So that incentive is important. We expanded all of our efficiency programs to ensure that houses generally that Houses that qualified the pro for the program initially were, were heated by electric sources. Now we expanded it for wood sources and all other heating sources. So that, again, uh, allowed us to uh, really expand the opportunities for people to get into the green energy sector, whether they are transitioning from, from a traditional uh, sector to 
uh, the clean energy future that is before us. So those programs are important. We expanded all of them uh, for a reason. I mentioned, uh, and this is where the school system comes in. I think the school system plays a very significant part in this. The, the deal that we signed with Mi'kmaq, the 13 Mi'kmaq communities, 2,500 homes will be retrofitted, $40 million. That is a significant opportunity for our students in those communities and for, and for people to become entrepreneurs. Uh, they sh those communities should be doing the work. Um, and we have an opportunity, and, and the foundation set up, whether it's through the PD12 system, whether it's through the community college, uh, to train those uh, students, or uh, train, uh, train folks that want to go back and, and do that work. Um, particularly, uh, so, so and, there, and there's a number of initiatives on the forestry side when it comes to sustainability. So the list goes on and on and on. Um, really, the concern, uh, again, I'll go back to the concern that, that we have at home is that we know that the transition is happening. There's no question. We see the potential for wind. My, my leader talked about it a lot uh, during his time as Premier and, and still that market conditions are dictating that, that, that wind is really the cheapest form of, of, of energy consumption right now. So we're going to see more of it. There's no question. And offshore is going to get to a point where it becomes more viable too as well. In my time as Energy Minister, we had a number of companies, whether it was in the Strait, off the coast of Cape Breton, uh, and, other, uh, and in the South Shore off of... Um, off of Bridgewater, like these spots have been mapped out already for potential uh, areas where we can we can look at offshore wind. So we know that's going to happen. We know that uh, other other uh, methods, uh, solar continues to decrease. Um, we know that electric cars are eventually within years are going to be on par with your standard combustion car. So like all of these are are opportunities. But but particularly what what is a concern and, and it is it's a concern for rural Nova Scotia that they don't really see themselves as much in this conversation. They are communities that traditionally uh, have been built, like at home, and Mr. Speaker, you know this as well as anyone, these are traditional industry homes. I come from, a, I come, uh, our communities, I come from a coal mine, well, we, we, we have, how many mines do we have in Cape Breton? We were a coal mining town. Um, we generated our electricity off of coal, so we're, we're moving off of coal. So now what is, what is the plan for those workers who understand uh, and I'll give Nova Scotia Power credit because when I was in energy, we talked about this early on because there was a lot of conversation around the Atlantic Loop. And we said, before we even start the conversation, what is the transition plan for those workers? Um, because they need, they need to see a path. And where it's 2020, it was 2020 at the time, say so we legitimately have 10 years to figure this out. And especially um, with, with, you know, with, with we, w what we knew was going to be happening is that instead of waiting till the last minute and, and, and waiting till 2025 or 2026, we have an opportunity to do it now. Retrain those people um, uh, and uh, give them other opportunities and, and make sure because it, it will have an, not only an impact on them, but the, but the, sur the, uh, the supply chain uh, also takes a big impact. Um, as somebody who used to be in that supply chain when I ran my own business, that th these, these, these matter. Uh, in communities outside of uh, HRM in rural Nova Scotia. So really um, where we see government as they go down this path uh, towards the elimination of coal is ensuring that if the federal government doesn't come in with some sort of package, and it's got to be in the millions, in my opinion, because this, this was all part of the negotiation we were in before the election, it, it has to be a package that is, is in the millions, that is, is substantial enough to really give uh, these workers uh, the, the training that they need and the support that they need and the options that they need to make that transition. And the number that we use, and the, he just said it to me here, and I'll, uh, the leader was, uh, it's over $100 million. That's really, the, that was the number we were talking about uh, that we thought was substantial enough to really support these hundreds of workers that, uh, that are in our traditional uh, energy production industries that are going to have to change. So um, I really, uh, in my last minute and 30 seconds, there's been a lot of great opportunities that we have developed. This government uh, will have their own, uh, and I appreciate the fact, and I appreciate the conversations with both the Minister of Natural Resources and the Minister of Environment, because I think as well, they see the opportunities too. As I said early on, a lot of our success in becoming a, a leader internationally in Nova Scotia is that we all fed off of one another. It didn't matter who was in government at the time. You, you, you talk about some of the legislation that they brought back in the mid-2000s, and it, and it just flows into what we've done. As a government, I'm very proud of our record. We, we, we uh, re, as a result of the initiatives that we've taken, 
the legislation that we passed, uh, and the partnerships that we had with, with the sector, uh, Nova Scotia was recognized as one of the international leaders, and still is. And that's not going to change. Uh, so we just need to continue that momentum. And there's lots of opportunity, not only for our, for our traditional workers, who desperately, we really need to have this conversation right now. We have an, it's not too often you have an opportunity where you have 10 years to get something right. Um, but we need, we need to do that, but we also have so many opportunities for our students uh, through our school system and so many opportunities to create a whole new generation of entrepreneurs uh, within the province. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I will take my seat and I look forward to the comments from my colleagues. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you <clears throat> to the member for uh, bringing this debate to the floor of the House. Um, we uh, feel quite passionately about this topic and about the general notion of a just transition um, and would concur with many um, of my colleagues' comments, but I want to talk for a minute about the notion of green jobs generally, because when we think about green jobs, we often think about them in the mode in which my colleague was speaking, which is absolutely correct. So what are the sectors of the economy that will be unlocked by our transition uh, to a cleaner economy? But, but Mr. Speaker, I think it's widely recognized now that that's only one piece of the definition of green jobs. Um, the other thing that we could think of as green jobs, in which many public intellectuals and scholars do think of as green jobs, are jobs in the caring economy and jobs in the creative economy. These are zero carbon jobs, <laughs> and they are jobs uh, that have great growth potential um, and that are imperative um, to growing our economy. According to Citizens for Public Justice, green jobs provide goods or services that benefit the environment or conserve natural resources. Jobs such as teaching, early childhood education, social work, and nursing have a low carbon footprint compared to jobs in oil and gas, transportation, heavy industry, and agriculture. Jobs in the care and education sectors also play an important role in serving the most marginalized populations, who are the most vulnerable, we know, to the impacts of climate change. These are jobs that directly address the social determinants of health, which are critical to consider as a part of climate change mitigation and adaptation. For example, Mr. Speaker, low-income people are most impacted by rising energy costs. Agricultural workers and communities are vulnerable to changing weather patterns. We hear about that on the floor of this House. Seniors and inadequately housed people are most impacted by heat waves. A just transition means ensuring that life is accessible and affordable and that people have the services they need. And it looks like investments in low-carbon community transportation, affordable and efficient housing, quality long-term care, and support for workers through EI and retraining, which we just heard about. But it also looks like addressing systemic racism, including environmental racism, and ensuring that Indigenous, Black, and newcomer communities have a voice in shaping the transition and policies that impact them. Care and educational workers also play a critical role in educating, supporting, and advocating for people through periods of significant change. Mr. Speaker, women are overrepresented in the care economy. Typical characterizations of green jobs, which we just discussed, which in the new economy would uh, look towards entrepreneurship and technological advancement, and in the discussion around transition, mostly focuses on trades and heavy industry, are very gendered. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because a just transition must also include the undervaluing of care work, including unpaid domestic and community labor. These green caring jobs tend to be underfunded by the government, whereas the heaviest polluting jobs receive generous subsidies. A just transition means inverting this pattern. This is not just our definition of green jobs. People like Naomi Klein have moved the discourse towards a broader understanding of the jobs that will help us tackle the climate emergency. Economists like Armin Yelnazian have also talked about the she session and the caring economy as a way to tackle that and move towards a greener future. A 2014 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which focused on the health impacts of climate change, stated the following. 
the most effective measures to reduce vulnerability in the near term are programs that implement and improve basic public health measures, such as the provision of clean water and sanitation, secure essential health care, including vaccination and child health services, increase capacity for disaster preparedness and response, and the alleviation of poverty. In a November 2nd open letter, that's today, from the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers to Environment and Climate Change Minister Tim Hallman, Executive Director Alex Stratford explained that climate change affects people differently depending on their position in society and calls for an approach that emphasizes climate justice and reducing inequality. He stresses that the green economy is the caring economy. Mr. Speaker, the Green New Deal touted in the United States included a program for the arts, which not only created jobs and sustained many artists through the Great Depression, but also helped inspire a generation of people. Artists can explain the why of a policy in a way that governments and legislation can't. Art can help people embrace change and support people through transitions, including as an element of mental health care. Art is also an important avenue for holding decision makers accountable and articulating people's lived experiences. Consider, Mr. Speaker, how the CERB helped many creative workers stay afloat through the pandemic and how art created during that pandemic has helped people manage the anxiety and upheaval of the times we are in. As we consider the paradigm shift needed to move our economy away from fossil fuel dependence, arts and culture will be a critical piece of this transition. Given that the climate emergency is already upon us, arts will also play an important role in health and wellness, especially among those more vulnerable to its effects. Art is a way for communities to tell their stories and share knowledge. In Nova Scotia, a green jobs plan could look like investment in Mi'kmaq and African Nova Scotian artists, and in Mi'kmaq, Gaelic, and French language initiatives. Mr. Speaker, a just transition also requires worker equity. A green jobs plan in Nova Scotia must, of course, include jobs in the energy sector and in trades where women and racialized people are underrepresented. It's important that Nova Scotia ensure equity and access to these jobs, and this includes targeted training programs for people who face systemic barriers. There is already considerable work happening in this area, for example, Women Unlimited, tech exploration, and supportive programs within the Nova Scotia Community College, as we heard from my colleague. It's important that we aren't shutting people out of opportunities. For example, the new benefit for tax benefit for tradespeople under 30 in Nova Scotia could pose a barrier for people who start careers later due to family responsibilities, and those people, Mr. Speaker, are predominantly women. Need to, we need to ensure that the jobs created through a green jobs plan are well-paying, unionized jobs, and address inequity across all sector. Non-profit jobs are also green jobs, and chronic underfunding of the community sector must be addressed. Mr. Speaker, I encourage this government to really take the time to understand what green jobs mean. When my colleague stood up and spoke to the creative economy as a green jobs plan, she was ridiculed by a member of this government for not understanding the definition of green jobs. And so I want to be clear, Mr. Speaker, that green jobs include the caring economy, and the caring economy is predominantly made up of women. And any definition of green jobs that includes only uh, the tech and industrial sectors, whether, again, we're thinking of new jobs or we're thinking of a just transition, must also include many of the jobs in our economy that are traditionally uh, underfunded, underpaid, undervalued, and staffed predominantly by women, but which really make up the backbone of our economy and will continue to do so into the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Waverley Fall River Beaverbank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is also an important uh, topic for me. Uh, this is uh, something that um, 
uh, in my mandate as uh, Minister of Advanced Education that it, it is to try to um, repurpose uh, and try to find jobs for, for people to transition in and out of. Also for my colleague in, um, in, uh, in labour. So one of the uh, benefits of having our mandates that are horizontal, um, we're able to include a lot of people in the conversation. I do realise that you have some expertise. You remember from Northside Westmount, spent uh, many years working in that. I look forward to consulting uh, and uh, maybe getting some ideas and stuff back and forth. So I look forward to that. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, if I may, I found an article that I'd uh, online I'd like to read, published October 20th of this year. It's called Ending Coal Use Blighted Scottish Communities. A Just Transition to a Green Economy Must Support Workers. I'm just going to read the first paragraph. It says, while walking on Glasgow Green in 1765, James Watt had a eureka moment that led to the development of a more efficient steam engine, making coal-powered industry and transport possible. In November, a city with a claim to the dubious mantle of having invented the modern carbon economy will host the most pressing UN climate change conference yet, COP26. And I just find uh, that this bill, I think we were looking at Scotland, we're looking at Cape Breton, I think there are some parallels and stuff that we can draw. But as we speak today to this important topic of the environment, uh, I want to acknowledge the important work already done this session about the environment. I'm very proud of the new environmental legislation, Mr. Speaker, brought forward by the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, which is an ambitious plan to guide Nova Scotia order, towards please. a cleaner... Order, please. I would ask the uh, member to refrain from speaking about a bill that's on the floor. The Honourable Member for Waverley, Fall River, Beaverbank. Thank you. I'll, I'll retract that. Thank you very much. So, still working on ambitious stuff. Thank you. So, before I speak to the future and current opportunities in green jobs, I want to take a moment to speak to the coal miners who, for many generations, who worked in dangerous conditions to provide power to our province. While there are many communities across the province where coal mining is an important part of their history, I know the member for Sydney, Member 2, certainly had the coal miners of Cape Breton in his heart as he put forward this topic for late debate. Coal miners have faced dangerous working conditions as well as consecutive efforts by governments to phase out the coal industry in efforts to meet emission targets. I want to acknowledge and pay homage in this House to coal miners whose careers have never been easy I want this House to join me in a moment of silence to pay our respects to the many lives lost in Nova Scotia coal mines as this once important industry begins its final descent underground to 2030. If we could please take a moment. We'll observe a moment of silence. The Honourable Member for Favourly, Fall River, Waverly Fall River Beaverbank. It's Thank a you, long Mr. Speaker. Day. So, as this province phases out coal power, more jobs in the green economy will be created. When I last spoke to this topic, I mentioned a number of NSCC programs that already exist to train Nova Scotians to work in coastal management and protection, sustainable energy, and protecting fresh water resources. These programs exist because there is demand. That's the benefit of our Nova Scotia Community College who are celebrating their 25th anniversary as a unified college. The NSCC is, offers programs that are market-driven, that prepare students to work jobs in demand. 
As our province energy grid transitions to greener energy, the market will pull for these green jobs, and when it does, Nova Scotians can expect to see our community college and other post-secondary institutions to offer more programs to prepare students to work in the jobs um, that, are, that will be in demand. Many in the private sector are also doing tremendous work in research and development for sustainability and environmental solutions. Private sector leadership is essential to this transition as market pull research leads to important investments in technologies that will lead the future of the green economy. Touring our post-secondary institutions has been a priority of mine as minister, something I look forward to continuing once the House rises. And during my visits, I will continue to discuss the ongoing and future work to prepare the workforce for the green economy. I'll end my remarks by speaking to my optimism for the opportunities for jobs in the green economy. Our government has demonstrated our commitment to the transition to the green economy. We recognize the skills training that will be needed not only for new students entering the workforce, but those transitioning into the green economy. I'm optimistic for the opportunities that exist because of how well our NSCCs can act to meet the demands of the labour market. NSCCs are designed to be nimble, to react to what the market is doing. Uh, one of our conversations um, that are ongoing with our post-secondary and, uh, and within uh, apprenticeship and trades is the idea of micro-credentialing. And micro-credentialing is really taking the skills and experience that existing workers already have and try to transfer those into credentials for other jobs. Um, that can save uh, people that are looking to transition lots of time and lots of money uh, during that transition. So I look forward to the work that's already uh, currently ongoing with that. I'm optimistic because partners in the private sector, from the post-secondary sector, and in this government are in agreement for the need to transition our province into the green economy and to ensure that we have a thriving economy where people can prosper while ensuring that we protect our planet from the generations to come. Cape Breton is really in a unique uh, spot in the province where there is a multitude of, uh, of, uh, of fishing, our coastal waters where there's lots of, uh, lots of potential there, uh, as well as in our forests. And um, I know that NSCCs are doing some great things. I do know when I uh, had the visit to the Strait Campus where they train a lot of people in the marine industry. Uh, they have simulators uh, that are there to train people in, in that industry. If I go all the way down to, uh, to Shelburne, they have a fishing simulator where they train fishers um, of being aboard a boat. It's very dangerous, very costly, very um, inefficient to have people training actually while they're at sea. Uh, so fishing is also part of that green economy that we can bring forward and our agriculture is all part of that green economy in um uh, in the Middleton campus at NSCC, we have researchers working on using seaweeds to integrate with their fertilizers so that the leaching that comes from our fertilizers stay in the ground where they are instead of leaching into our rivers and leaking, leaching into our lakes. So there's lots of stuff that's going on. So one of the goals is before anybody ever walks out of a post-secondary institution, or if they're going on to further education, that they're attached. So if somebody is, uh, graduates with a BSc in environmental studies, or uh, they have an attachment, they have somewhere to go, they already know. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, but I do believe that that private sector is gonna be that pull uh, that we are going to, to, to need to go forward. And I believe we have the research and the innovation going on. I have met with Research Nova Scotia. I have met with uh, ACOA. I've met with the universities and the NSCCs and the researchers and stuff within there. And I truly believe that we have Nova Scotia solutions. I don't think we have to look anywhere else. I think with Springboard Atlantic, which brings together our, our universities, all of our, our the private sector, and all of our, research, uh, our researchers in Nova Scotia, that we will find the solution. And I trust and trust in me that I will work with you in Cape Breton to, to find transitions for those jobs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, get up to, uh, to speak about this, uh, this current um, debate in front of us with regards to um, coal ending in 2030. 
And when we look in at Cape Breton, and I was happy to hear the member um, talk about our history in coal mining and our coal miners um, and, and sacrifices that they've made. As a matter of fact, there are many uh, former coal miners in Cape Breton today that are suffering um, injuries in, in, um, in, in the mines that, that they could really use some help um, from this government. So we'll, we can talk about that uh, later. But what this is about is really about a path forward. It's about a path forward um, for these wor workers and for the community. One minute. Path forward, but without having a, with a path forward, we need to look back. This is about the workers and the communities. Nothing can be done to the workers or the communities without the workers or the communities. We need to involve these workers. We need to involve the communities in transitioning away from coal in Cape Breton. We need to work with our wonderful colleagues at NSEC. Cape Breton University as well has amazing Order, programs. Please. The, the, the time for debate on the adjournment has expired. I wish to thank everyone that participated in the adjournment debate this evening. I now recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the Chair and the House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House on bills. Carried. We'll just give time for the uh, committee to set up for committee of the whole.
Order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mix Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 43, the Motor Vehicle Act? Bill 43, an act to amend Chapter 293 of the Revised Statute 1989, the Motor Vehicle Act. I recognize the Clerk. Chair, um, Bill 43 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Law Amendments on November 2nd, 2021, without amendments and contains four clauses. Clause 1. Should Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall the remaining clauses 2 to 4 carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. I recognize the honor. Oh, we have to slow down. Just. I recognize the, the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mix Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 61, the Joint Regional Transportation Agency Act? Bill 61, an act to establish a Joint Regional Transportation Agency. I recognize the Clerk. Uh, mixed Chair, Bill 61 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Law Amendments on November 2nd, 2021, without amendments, and contains 29 clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall Clauses 2 to 4 carry? Carry. Sh shall Clause 5 carry? Oh. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you, Mix Chair. I wanted to speak to, uh, I'm not sure which clause it is actually, but sub, uh, proposed sub, uh, change sheet NDP 1, um, and it's subparagraph 5, so I'm not sure which clause it is. It's 1? Oh. Clause 5. Okay. Oh, I see. Am I too early then? No. Okay. Right on time. <laughs> Great. Well, I'll take my mask then. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I'd like to uh, draw the House's attention to change sheet NDP 1. Uh, and I would like to propose the following amendments. So page 1, propose uh, subparagraph 5, A1, AI, pardon me, line 2, strike out and. Page 1, proposed paragraph 5A, add the following after subparagraph I. IA, active transit is provided for. IB, accessibility, climate impacts, equity and diversity, and. Page 3, proposed clause 13, line 1. A, add 1 immediately after the clause number. B, delete the, or the, and substitute subject to subsection 2, the, and C, add the following after subclause 1. 2, the board must A, hold its meetings in public, and B, seek public input when developing the master plan under section 5. So, <laughs> I would like to say that the idea of a joint re regional transportation agency is a good one, Mix Chair, but it appears that the government's haste to move this idea forward, uh, in, in the haste to move it forward, it has overlooked a handful of critical details in the new agency's mandate. Our caucus would like to put forward these amendments uh, that would include some of these in the critical details of the bill. The bill asks the agency to craft a plan that ensures, quote, a regional approach to transportation consistent with the municipality's growth and development, end quote. This is important, but in doing this, it is necessary that the agency consider the following things. Number one, climate change. Transportation has a significant impact on greenhouse gas emissions, and carefully planning our regional transportation system is an opportunity to make an impact there. 
It's concerning that the bill does not mention climate change or emissions at all, and so we are proposing to add that into the wording. Number two, accessibility. Our province has a goal of reaching an accessible Nova Scotia by 2030. A regional transportation plan must consider accessibility in its widest possible definition. And again, it's concerning that the, that isn't mentioned in the agency's framework, and so we would like to add that in, just simple, simply adding in the word accessibility. Number three, equity and diversity. The right and ability to move around and move around easily is not available equitably to everyone. There are barriers of socioeconomic status, geography, ability, and age. The agency must consider these challenges along with a diverse range of perspectives if it's going to create a plan that is equitable and fair for all Nova Scotians. And four, active transit. The bill asks the agency to conduct, conduct a comprehensive review of all modes of transportation associated with the municipality, including roads, bridges, highways, ferries, transit, rail, airports, and ports. I am at a total loss as to why active transit would not be listed here. So again, we're just asking that the bill, uh, that that be added to the list. HRM and active transit advocates and organizations have been working hard to envision and, and build an active transit network in the region, in part through the work of plans like the HRM's Integrated Mobility Plan. And we've heard the minister say in debate on this bill that uh, the minister wants to be collaborative and work with that uh, existing plan, and that's good news. But we do think that the, to, to, to ensure that, uh, that the, the bill could reflect these amendments. Um, um, also, uh, on that, the, the integrated mobility plan is another key tool in fighting, uh, fight, excuse me, fighting the, the climate crisis. So the agency must consider active transit along with the other modes listed. Finally, mixed chair, public input. Our caucus, and this is obviously the, um, the uh, proposed clause 13, our caucus would like to put forward an amendment that would add needed transparency measures to this bill. The government has spoken about it being more transparent, and so I hope it would be able to uh, reconsider or consider these changes and reconsider uh, the bill currently, and, and add that the, the bill would require the agency's board to meet in public, as it is the case with the other important boards, such as the Utility and Review Board, and require the agency to consult with the public in its development of the five-year plan. It seems essential that the public have input into a regional transportation plan in order for it to be successful. The agency will need to hear from a range of people and stakeholders from different sectors and backgrounds to understand barriers to accessibility and equitable transportation in order to craft a successful plan. And so, Mixed Chair, those, that is the rationale behind these amendments. I really sincerely hope that the government will consider adopting them. They're simple, they're, they, don't, they don't cost anything, and uh, they would definitely improve this bill. Thank you. Shall Clause 5 carry? No. Oh, the amendment, sorry. <laughs> Shall the amendment carry? No. Shall Clause 5 carry? No. Oh. Okay, sorry. The, the well, it's defeated. Sorry. Shall Clause 5 carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. I think I did. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Did I get them? Check Sorry. Yeah, back it up. Shall the remaining clauses carry? Carry. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mix Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 62, the Interim Residential Rent Increase Cap Act? Bill 62, an act to implement an interim residential re rental increase cap. I recognize the clerk. Uh, Mix Chair, Bill 62 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Law Amendments on November 2nd, 2021, without amendments, and contains seven clauses. Clause one. Shall clause one carry? Carry. Shall clauses two to five carry? Carry. Clause six. 
Uh, I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. I would like to ask that the amendment is distributed. Awesome. All right. I would like to draw to the member's attention to the change sheet. I move on to page one. Add the following clause after clause six. Seven one subsection 10A. One of chapter four, one of the revised statutes 1989. The Residential Tenancies Act as enacted by chapter 40 of the acts of 1993 is amended by striking out except for a fixed term lease in the first line. Number two, section 10A of chapter 401 is enacted by chapter 40 of the acts of 1993 and amended by chapter 41 of the acts of 2018. It's further amended by adding immediately after subsection one, the following subsection. 1A. Three months before the end of a fixed term lease, the landlord shall offer in writing a new fixed term or month to month lease to the tenant. Three, subsection 10A2 of chapter 401, as enacted by chapter 40 of the Acts of 1993, is amended by striking out with the consent of the owner in the third line. Four, Section 10A of Chapter 401, as enacted by Chapter 40 of the Acts of 1993 and amended by Chapter 41 of the Acts of 2018, is further amended by adding immediately after Subsection 2 the following subsection, 2A. A fixed term lease may be terminated upon three months within written notice if the landlord or the landlord's immediate family is to occupy the residential premises. Page one, subclause seven, one. Delete section five in the first line and substitute sections five and seven. Renumber clauses accordingly. So our caucus agrees that there are many changes needed to the Residential Tenancies Act, and there is a, cl a clear power imbalance between tenants and landlords, which requires safeguards to address. One of these safeguards is to ensure that the rent cap apply to the unit and not the tenant. Another is to address the abuse of fixed term leases by landlords, trying to avoid rules that have been put in place to protect tenants. There are 122,645 households that rent in Nova Scotia. According to the Canadian Rental Housing Index, Nova Scotia's rental market ranks as the most unhealthy rental market in Atlantic Canada. In 2020, Halifax had the worst vacancy rate of any major city in Canada, 1.7%. Compare that to 3.4% in Toronto and 3.3% in Montreal. In these conditions, large property owners are likely to increase rents up as high as the market will bear. The bill our caucus has previously put forward sets the previous tenant's rent as the base for as a base for increases, ties allowable annual rent increases to a measure like the consumer price index, unless cabinet finds a lower limit is reasonable and allows landlords to apply to make additional increases for renovations, added services, or exceptional cost increases. We are trying to improve this bill by bringing forward the changes. In page one, delete clause four and substitute the following clause. Um, I'm I just want to say thank you so much for listening, and um, I hope to see these amendments in the bill. That was just that. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause six carry? Carry. Shall the remaining clause, clause seven, carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mix Chair. Will you please call Bill Number 63, Housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality Act? Bill 63, an act to establish the Executive Panel on Housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality. I recognize the Clerk. 
Bill 63, an act to establish the executive panel on housing in the Halifax Regional Municipality, uh, was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Law Amendments on November 2nd, 2021, without amendments and contains a preamble and 27 clauses. Clause 1. Actually, I'm just doing a little two-step. So, Clause 1, I was looking for debate. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall Clauses 2 to 5 carry? Carry. Clause 6. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier. Thank you, Mix Chair. Um, I believe the change needs are being distributed right now. So I will ask the members to turn their attention to NDP change sheet one. And it is, uh, uh, we move that on page two, clause six, add the following subs clause. Four, any advice and recommendations provided to the minister and the municipality under clause 1A must immediately be published in a newspaper circulating in the municipality and B, posted on, pu on publicly available website. Mix, mix Chair, um, the PC government ha has designed um, a system under this bill that is behind closed doors, to be frank. Any councillor could tell them, and they have in law amendments, this is a bad idea for any land use planning changes. This amendment would take the advice and recommendations provided to the minister and make it public where it should be. This is one of the only of two amendments that we will be making um, and recommending in order to bring full accountability and transparency to this bill, mixed chair. And with that, I'll take my seat. Shall the amendment carry? Yeah. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause six carry? carry. Shall clause seven to 10 carry? carry. Clause 11. Carry. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center, Whitney Pier. Thank you, thank you, Mix Chair. Uh, I ask the members to draw their attention to NDP change sheet two. Uh, and we move to on page three, add the, add the following clauses immediately after clause 11. 12-1, all meetings of the panel are open to the public. Subsection uh, 2, subsection 9-1 to 4 of the Charter apply with necessary changes to meetings of the panel. Uh, mixed Chair, this is the second amendment I alluded to earlier. The, these amendments are in line with the, with the asks from Mayor Savage and Council. They and we want to ensure all meetings remain open to the public mm -hmm. in accordance with the Halifax Charter and the Nova Scotia MGA mixed chair, to conduct zoning business behind closed doors is an affront to the residents and council mixed chair. Transparency and openness is how zoning changes should be made to ensure accountability. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, uh, Mix Chair. I just want to get up briefly and say that um, I've been, uh, I've heard so many times uh, the members of this government, when they were in opposition, um, ridicule the then McNeil government for claiming to be open and transparent and promising over and over and over again to Nova Scotia that that they were going to do things differently and it was time for a change and just wait, elect us and we know what transparency looks like. We're going to sue to get the contract and we're going to tell everybody and we don't believe in Owl's Head and we believe in open processes. And, and I want to mark this moment tonight because what we are seeing is no evidence of that. We're seeing no evidence of that on the floor of this House. This is a very simple, uh, this is a very simple amendment. This amendment is saying, and this is what we heard from the councillors who presented, we know you're going to do it anyway. We're in a majority government situation. You've decided you want to do this. You're going to do it. And so there was no pie in the sky, uh, you know, kind of kneeling and begging not to do it. They said, well, we think this is a bad idea. You're probably going to do it. But if you do it, do it right and be transparent, which is something that this 
government asked their predecessors to do over and over and over again and continually express dismay and derision when that government didn't. And so I think this is an opportunity for the government to move ahead with their bill, to do what they say they're going to do, but to do it in a way that respects democracy, that is clear and transparent, and that doesn't uh, trample on the decision-making of other orders of government or of the citizens. Thank you. <laughs> so, order. 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 <laughs> Shall the <laughs> order in the house, please. Shall the amendment carry? The, the amendment is defeated. Shall clause six carry? Shall clauses? No, are we here? Are we clause? Oh, it was clause eleven. Right, clause shall clause eleven carry. We were. Oh, yeah, this was in. Oh, sorry. Yes. Shall clause eleven carry? Shall clauses 2 to 17 carry? Yeah. Clause 18? Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour, Dartmouth. Thank you, Mick Speaker. Well, studies have shown that the average human attention span is eight seconds, so I'm going to try and get this uh, amendment on the floor and actually have it considered <laughs> seriously. Now, on page five, add the following clause up under clause 18. Number 19, the panel shall publicly disclose any planning and development matters it is considering prior to making any assessment or decisions on such matters. So the reason I'm not being prescriptive as how to do this, it's, it's entirely up to this government, but it is, I mean, no one likes to be surprised when it comes to what's going on in development in their communities. This bill states that the panel will accelerate an increase in supply of housing of all types and all income levels in HRM. However, we've not seen any further comment or detail on the plan to increase affordable housing units, and the questions and concerns I raised in this house have gone unanswered. I want to thank, oh, he's, Cape. Okay. I would like to acknowledge that the Premier spoke at the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities this morning and it was very well received. They have a lot of unease as to the process that's going forward, so I wanted to acknowledge that and they're, they're a little bit comforted by the fact that he seems to want to listen to them. But this would, be a, would go a long way to, to, you know, to remove the uneasiness that they have. This government continues to push the idea that the housing affordability crisis is merely a supply and demand issue. If we increase the supply of housing, then somehow prices will drop to more affordable levels. Solely pushing the idea that the housing affordability crisis is merely a supply and demand issue, we risk flooding the rental housing market with more market rate luxury apartments and assume and hope that eventually rent prices will drop. If you have $2,000 to spend on a one-bedroom apartment, I could move into the Maple today. If I had 1000 to spend or rent, or 700 HRM doesn't need any more Maples, or Alexander's, or Vicks. We need affordable housing built. The assumption that those who can afford these expensive apartments will move out of their more affordable units into these new builds. Freeing up affordable units is risky, and does not solve the affordability issue. Demand currently, according to HRM's data, is for ground builds. That's your single units, your duplexes, your townhouses, not tall buildings. HRM's integrated mobility plan, I believe I heard from the minister that she was going to follow the integrated mobility plan going forward on the bill that was discussed earlier. It identifies four pillars which shape the communities and the lives of people in the Halifax region. Connected, healthy, affordable, and sustainable transportation systems. The HRM Regional Plan established long-range, region-wide planning policies outlined where, when, and how future gr growth and development should take place between now and 2031. 
These plans were developed after extensive consultation with all stakeholders and consider regulatory, sewage, transportation, and utility capacity and resources. Together, they define a city where people don't just live, but where they want to live. I'm concerned when the Minister of Housing will not commit to respecting these plans or acknowledge this as the responsibility of the municipal order of government. You will note I say orders of government. It is not a tiered system where an order of government, the federal government does not tell the provincial government, the provincial government does not tell the municipal government. We are all a linear order of government and it also includes the indigenous government. And to this day, I'm hoping that everyone will adopt saying orders of government instead of levels of government. The HRM Regional Plan has identified 37,000 residential units that could go straight to building permit or site plan approval right now. If the purpose of the proposed executive panel is to identify sites for increasing the housing supply in HRM, then the work's already been done. Why is the minister appointing a group of people to identify planning areas, special planning areas in HRM when this exact task has been done and clearly accounts for the anticipation of population growth while ignoring the true issue of affordability? What is the true purpose of this executive panel? When I asked the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing during question period, how much the 1,100 affordable units would cost, he told me that the Department of Housing would determine that price. We have yet to hear from the department how much these units will cost Nova Scotians and what this government considers to be affordable. I want to remind this government that all income levels includes those who are on lower income. The lack of mention of affordability in this bill has me very concerned, and this executive panel does not have a plan to increase the supply of actual affordable housing. I spoke in my address yesterday how the Nova Scotia Housing Commission of the day created the Forest Hills Community Plan. That was an affordable housing project, one done right. I'm also concerned about the lack of transparency, hence this amendment associated with this bill and in this bill the proposed panel is not required to consult with the public regarding special planning zones or in fact about anything. This government seems to refuse to consult with the public on this. The very least they can do is make take actions taken by this task force to be transparent to the public just as an advisory. As a new member of council I've concluded that it seems to be that question period should maybe re be renamed to answer period so we can actually get an answer. And maybe law amendments would achieve an amendment. The government's own throne speech speaks to this issue stating, a healthy government is one where Nova Scotians have information and opportunity to hold their government to account. We welcome this and will provide members to the public and members of the Legislative Assembly with the tools to do so. I am asking for this tool to do so. Jim Vibert's Saltwater article today touched on this issue, decrying the devolution of the Law Amendments Committee into a pro forma stop for government bills on their way to becoming the law of the land. Shall I throw the term walk the walk? <laughs> Nova Scotians deserve transparency on how the government is dealing with the housing crisis, knowing what developments are being recommended, where they're being developed, and who specifically is developing them will help ensure accountability and ensure that this government is increasing the number of affordable units as promised, rather than just increasing the stock of higher rent developments. That is why I'm asking the government for the bare minimum which is to pass this amendment. Thank you. I, I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pier.
Thank you, Mix Chair. Uh, Mix Chair, first I want to uh, thank my colleague from Dartmouth South for her um, great um, champ championship of um, transparency and openness. And second, I want to thank my honorable colleague across, across the aisle here um, for this amendment. Disclose, disclose, it's just a small little part of transparency, Mix Speaker, and it is a shame, it is a shame, Mick Speaker, that we are sitting here <laughs> talking about the HRM government, municipal government, and you, and this government, Mick Speaker, is taking away their powers. They are fundamentally doing that. They are overriding the charter, Mick Speaker. Public hearings are important for transparency, and they got they they're just they're doing away with that, mixed Speaker, and on, on with regards to what is in this bill and the disclosure. Just the panel shall publicly disclose any planning developments. That is all you're going to have to do if you pass this amendment is just disclose what you're thinking about doing, or I'm sorry, mixed Speaker, I um, what they are. Um, they are looking what they are looking at with regards to planning. That's it. As a former counselor, and I know that there are counselors acro across the way, and I know, at least I think I should say, mix, mix chair, that many councils would look at this as an affront. Not only that, mix speaker, but the residents. I know what it looks like when residents don't feel like things are being transparent at, at City Hall, Mick Speaker. They get mad and they feel like they have been left out of a process. So to completely disregard all of that, Mick Speaker, is wrong. And the councillors that are across the way need to remember when they themselves sat on a council. Mix speaker and or mixed chair and how they felt when government prescribed something and didn't speak with them, mix speaker. So the concept of disclose of just a simple disclosure of what of de planning and development is a very small ask in the full broad concept of what of the transparency and openness that the MGA and the Charter ask of municipalities. So I, would, I am requesting that before, you, before the members across, the government members across say no to this, they think about it and they remember their time, those that are, were on councils remember their time on a council. And they remember how angry the residents got when their voices weren't heard, Mick Speaker. I am, I am deeply angered and sad that my that my men, our amendments in the NDP didn't pass. But pass this one. It's a small ask, mm. considering what this bill will do. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 18 carry? No. Clause 19? No. I recognize the honorable member for Cole Harbor Dartmouth. Because this is so much fun, I'm going to put another one on. For number 20, the exercise by the minister of the panel of the authority given to them under section 15 to 18 must not conflict with any planning requirements of the municipality made pursuant to parts 8 and 9 of the charter. On clause 19A, strike out any in the first line and substitute any in quotation marks and B, add subject to section 20 at the beginning. Page seven, sub clause 26 two, strike out for greater certainty and substitute subject to, second, to section 20. I've said most of it, 
in the first part and earlier. I can't stress enough the unease that is felt in the public going forward with this. It's one thing to not feel the need to inform the public prior to, but I want, it's interesting yesterday as I have the article here where they launched the Coswell District Project, something that a lot of people have been waiting for, but historically many may not realize the Cogswell interchange was initiated by the provincial government. And look at the mistakes that that was. I'm just very concerned that going forward this panel is going to realize that mistakes like this can be done once again. I ask you to support this amendment. Thank you. We're just going to um, wait a minute for the change to each to get it distributed. Does everyone have the amendment? Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause nine, 19 carry? carry? Shall the remaining clauses carry? carry. Shall the preamble carry? carry? Shall the title carry? carry. Shall the bill carry? The bill is carried. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mixed Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 64, the Cannabis Control Act. Bill 64, an act to amend Chapter 3 of the Acts of 2018, the Cannabis Control Act. I recognize the Chair. Uh, mixed Chair, Bill 64 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Law Amendments on November 2nd, 2021, without amendments and contains one clause. Clause 1. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Mixed Chair, would you please call Bill Number 57, the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act. Bill 57, the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act. I recognize the Clerk. Uh, mixed Chair, Bill 57 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Law Amendments on November 2nd, 2021, without amendments, and contains 25 clauses. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Um, I'd like to just request a short recess while all, I think my colleagues agree with me, all the amendments are distributed just so it's easier on the clerks and easier on everyone else trying to look at them. Yeah, great. We'll take a, a short recess. Bonnie Day. All I'm saying is you better check your vote. <laughs> check your vote.
order. Yeah. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will resume. Clause 1. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Minister of Environment and Climate Change, I just want to take a few moments to speak generally uh, on, uh, on the bill before the House. Um, just a few amendments before us here. Um, <laughs> sure, just a few. Uh, certainly, though, I just want to take a moment to to acknowledge, um, you know, there was a lot of feedback at, at law amendments. Um, to my surprise, there was no amendments put forward at that formal, um, that formal mechanism. Uh, however, here we are, we have, we have amendments before us, and I think that's, that speaks volumes to, um, you know, the care that we all have towards uh, the environment and our concern uh, about climate change. Um, mixed, mixed speaker, this bill we have before the House, this is the most ambitious, bold piece of climate change legislation in Canada. And let's not, let's not, forget, let's not forget that greater context, Mick Speaker, that we are the only province in Canada to have put forward legislation like this to legislate 28 goals. And these goals, these goals, Mick Speaker, are ambitious. And these goals, Mick Speaker, uh, they're a floor. They're not a ceiling. They set the foundation. They set the path of certainty uh, so that Nova Scotians know that climate change, um, our approach will be to mitigate and adapt to the realities of climate change. So as we, as we get into these amendments, as we get into these amendments, uh, and no doubt we'll have some very important uh, debate and discussion about you know, the future of climate change policy. Um, let's not forget that there is a lot of support, a lot of support in Nova Scotia uh, for this bill. I think, for example, um, I think, for example, of uh, a tweet that was put out by Professor Bill Leahy. You know, great to see this aspirational approach to environmental progress, governments and accountability reinstated by the Nova Scotia government and Nova Scotia environment. Just today in the Herald, just today in the Herald, CBRM Mayor Amanda McDougall uh, talking about our commitment in this bill to uh, expand extended producer responsibility said, this is a good news story. McDougall, the mayor of Cape Breton municipality, said of the PC government's enviral goals legislation that is expected to pass through the House this week. My heart is in the world of environmental advocacy, so showing that we can do things and we can support business and we can do things that also support our planet, that's perfect. We need to find the balance. And then from the Halifax Examiner last week, it meets everything that was in the election platform, said Noreen Mabiza, the energy coordinator at the Ecology Action Centre in a phone interview. We're happy to see these goals embedded in legislation. Overall, the Ecology Action Centre is supportive of the legislation. Uh, from Global News last week, opposition say overall they support this legislation. Environmental groups say they're applauding the government's bill, calling it a very strong framework to start tackling climate change. And an Ecology Action Centre press release last week, the EAC is applauding the Nova Scotia government's new Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act which was introduced earlier today and replaces the former Sustainable Development Goals Act. We're thrilled to see this set of wide-ranging targets in legislation, said Marla McLeod, Director of Programs with the, with the EAC. And then from Joanne Roberts the, uh, of the Green Party of Canada, now the Green Party of Nova Scotia, I want to begin by congratulating Minister Hallman and the government for introducing this bill. It's not often a political party goes beyond what it promised on the campaign trail. Yeah. Bill 57 yeah. Bill 57 does that and as Greens we applaud you. We believe this bill should pass for the good of the province and our country. Mix uh, mix speaker the environment's from Donna Crossland, Nature Nova Scotia. The Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act is significant and essential environmental legislation required to address the climate change emergency as well as to protect the natural world. 
This legislation can greatly assist us with some of the biggest emission issues that contribute to the climate emergency. Bill 57 represents an improvement over the preceding government's Sustainable Development Goals Act. And then finally, uh, Mick Speaker, the, from the Nova Scotia Regional Committee of Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, we're particularly encouraged by such of the content of the Environmental Goals and Climate Change Reduction Act, which exceeds both the previous SDGA and the Tory platform on climate action. We hope that it will be swiftly passed and implemented. So, Mick Speaker, I'll, I'll certainly table these, uh, these uh, quotations. We all know Nova Scotians are looking for actions and details. This legislation, I want to reiterate, is step one. This piece of legislation is within the, the greater context of the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act, and it continues to build on the great work of that piece of legislation. The details on how these goals will be attained once the bill is passed will be articulated and outlined in the climate change plan, which is uh, going to be put out in the spring of 2022. And I want to let all Nova Scotians know that the feedback um, uh, provided at law amendments will be taken into consideration as we develop the climate change plan. We all acknowledge in this House that we're at a pivotal moment. We all, I think, acknowledge that this is the legislation that needs to guide Nova Scotia to sustainable prosperity over the next 10 years. And it's going to continue to showcase Nova Scotia as a world leader in adopting, achieving bold environmental and climate change goals. So as we build those plans, as we build those plans, we'll have ongoing conversations and dialogue with all stakeholders. And we will look for opportunities to increase ambition as these happen and as the plans are developed. Again, this is step one. Step one of a process uh, to begin a climate change action plan, which we haven't seen since 2009. And of course, the province will also work with our industries, businesses, labor, and other stakeholders to ensure a sustainable and just transition to a clean economy that will maximize jobs and ec economic benefits for all Nova Scotians. So, Mick Speaker, as we begin our discussions on, on these amendments, I do want to remind uh, all, all members of this House that we have before us a very bold, piece of legislation that I believe is right for Nova Scotia and will set the path for the next decade. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. The member for Dartmouth North has the floor. Thank you, Mick Speaker. And um, just to be clear, I wasn't standing to applaud. I wasn't standing uh, in solidarity with the minister. Um, well, thank you very much, Mick Speaker. I uh, listen. We're really happy that this bill is coming forward. Uh, it's a pretty good bill, Mick Speaker. It's a pretty good bill. But uh, I just want to address a couple of things the minister has said before I go on with my um, written notes. Uh, number one, the minister, right off the top, uh, has talked about how he was uh, surprised, possibly befuddled, to uh, to to learn that none, there was no amendments that were brought forward at law amendments committee. Well, that is true, Mr. Speaker. But I will tell you what: all of the amendments that the NDP will be proposing tonight, and I dare say many of the ones that the Liberals will be pro uh, proposing, are directly from the present the presenters that 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 took the time, made the effort to come and tell us, mostly in their expert opinions expert opinions, Mick Speaker, uh, about what, was, uh, what, what, what could make the bill better. And the minister is right in saying that the Ecology Action Centre said the bill was good, and other uh, environmental groups said the bill was good, and um, Joanne Robert said the bill was good. That's all true. I heard them say that too, and I read their submissions. However, those very same groups proposed amendments <laughs> and asked us to consider the amendment, and that is what we're going to do tonight. Many of those people are outside this building tonight, Mr. Speaker, and they are chanting, amend the legislation. That's what they want us to do here. 
And I just have to say that, again, <laughs> five years into this job, I, it, it, is, it is consistently depressing when you stand up, when one stands up and, knowing that one can speak for an hour at a time with excellent arguments, uh, you know, beautiful words, and that it doesn't mean anything. And I can tell you that I know what we're going to say tonight doesn't mean anything because this article states that the minister is not going to adopt any of the amendments. Shameful. It is shameful. Because if this was truly a process of improving this great piece of... Uh, look, I've already gone from good to great, Nick Speaker. This mostly great uh, piece of legislation, then we should be able to actually debate amendments and move some of them. Because we want to make the legislation greater, Mr. Speaker. And we also need to take away some of the mediocre parts. But anyway, we'll get to that. So I'm going to table that. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm here to say, just to speak on Clause 1, Mr. Speaker, that I hope the minister actually listens to what we have to say, considers some of the amendments, and, under, and I understand that the minister is, to, is hearing a lot of these ideas and saying, oh, we'll put those into the climate change plan. Well, that's great, fantastic, but he has an opportunity to put it into the legislation tonight, and that's what we want to see. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, just to add to what my uh, colleague has uh, already said, I, I do think uh, that most Nova Scotians, especially the ones that the minister has quoted that have been speaking out in favour of the bill, uh, are dismayed by the minister's comments. And I was actually uh, taken aback when media approached me uh, after law amendments, already knowing. Uh, that the minister had already rejected taking any of the co comments and any of the suggestions to strengthen a bill that in by and large most people support and all parties in the house support it is an unjustifiable defiance of what the process is supposed to be in this house and i know a lot of times people go to law, to law amendments and they're opposed to a bill but in this case there was broad support uh, and people experts that know more dare i say than anyone in this room uh, that it's put their life into their education and training on how uh, to make laws better to, to, for the future uh, prosperity of this province. And so uh, I can only think that it's, it's rare for ministers to get up at the Star Committee the whole. I can only think that he is digging, the minister is digging his heels in and not really even wanting to hear uh, what opposition me members ha have to say on this bill and what we can do to work together to strengthen it. We did that. Uh, we listened at law amendments. Uh, the Crown Lands Act, for example, when it was brought forward, uh, we took an amendment from the NDP, uh, from, uh, from a member uh, from Halifax Needham, Lisa Roberts, uh, worked with uh, one of the presenters at law amendments and wanted to embed climate change into the Act to ensure that the Crown Lands Act uh, used that as, as uh, broadened it out to what we worked on with Professor Leahy, actually, on one of the Leahy recommendations. We thought we had a solid bill ready to go, even with the blessing of Professor Leahy, but we still listened uh, to what was brought forward. And we don't think that only the governments, we didn't think, and I was the Premier, I didn't think that we owned all of the good ideas. It's important. And so out of respect for this House, we have some 11 amendments, I think, uh, for, from our party uh, that go to strengthening parts of the bill, because there are big weaknesses in the bill on efficiency, if we want to stay leaders, on solid waste, they pulled a target from their original bill in 2007. We're decades beyond where we need to be there. On electric vehicles, Mr. Mick Speaker, we have so many suggestions that I think that the members opposite should look at. Uh, I wouldn't say this is a great bill. We're going to support the bill. Uh, of course they should be going forward. They shouldn't be celebrating going forward from a bill that was passed uh, in years behind, Mr. Spe Mick Speaker. We need to start moving forward quicker uh, with the climate emergency, and he will have support, but I would just ask the minister uh, to at least listen, and I think uh, it would show some respect for the House if he at least sees some merit in some of the amendments. I think there's over 20 on the, on the floor tonight from both parties uh, to show some respect for the process for the people that he quoted uh, and to uh, consider the amendments. Thank Good you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth-South. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say a few words, not to gild the lily, but really to echo the comments of my colleague, the member for Dartmouth North, who I thought spoke very clearly to our position, um, as well as to the leader of the opposition. And I want to say that further to our dismay at the comments that no amendments would be accepted um, is also just to, as, as I suppose has become a bit of a pattern, to draw the House's attention to the fact that law amendments sat in one sitting for 10 hours, which has become the tradition of this House, but which is quite frankly ridiculous, a ridiculous way to get feedback on several bills. Um, and then with a very short turnaround time, we end up here at 7.41 at night on a Thursday at the end of a very long week debate uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, see how long the week is, um, debating um, these amendments. And, and that is a flaw in the process, Mick Speaker. If the government is so convinced that this is such excellent, groundbreaking legislation, then this is strange behavior. Let law amendments sit for three days and don't cut it off, which, which we feel was done. Um, if the government thinks that this is such excellent legislation, set aside daylight hours for committee of the whole house. Mm -hmm. Give us a little bit of time to be able to confer with the government about the amendments that we wish to bring, to confer with the folks that brought them forward. And, and last, I want to say that many of the amendments that are coming from our caucus, and I mean this very genuinely, are friendly amendments. So when we spoke to leaders in the field and we looked at this, what many of them said are, these targets make sense, but to get to them, you'll have to do these things. And so many of the amendments that we will bring forward will, we believe, not change the targets, not, I mean, some of them will, but some of them won't. Some of them will simply, we believe, strengthen our collective chance at actually achieving the goals put out in the legislation. And so to that end, I guess I would just make a plea again to echo my colleagues, which is please consider these amendments. Um, you know, amendments don't get passed in this committee very often, but they do get passed. It does happen. And when it happens, every time I have witnessed that in this House, and, and I have been lucky enough to be able to pass a few amendments, um, it is a demonstration of leadership. Every time anyone from this side of the aisle has an idea, which almost always is not their idea, but is an idea that came from experts or members of the public incorporated into a piece of legislation, um, that's an act of leadership. Uh, that shows, um, a particularly in a bill like this, that is so crucial to the well-being and to the future of every Nova Scotian, um, that we genuinely are um, collaborating to make something better. So with those few words, I'll take my seat and again invite the government to actually consider what's put before them tonight. I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you very much, Mix uh, Speaker. And I just wanted to uh, add my voice uh, and echo the comments that we've heard from the uh, uh, three other speakers from the opposition side of the House. Um, uh, this bill is an important bill. This bill deserves the attention of every, every member of this legislation, uh, legislature. It des deserves us working together to make it as good a bill as it can be. As when at, at the bill briefing uh, by the staff uh, when it, before this was uh, tabled in the House, uh, my comment to the staff was that this bill looked very familiar uh, because I spent some time in the department, a short period of time, and I said, how long has this bill been worked on? And they said, well, it started in 2017. Under the leadership of our now uh, leader when he was Minister of Environment. Many, many of the ideas in this bill began with the leader of the official opposition. I wanted, I, I was as shocked as 
many in this House of the Minister's comments that no, no amendments would be considered. And it does speak to undermine this institution, and it undermines our ability to represent our citizens and try and make laws better. We, on, based on those comments, should not spend the next three hours. We should be spending them with our families. Because we know, according to the Minister's words, that not one of these 30-some amendments are going to be supported by the members across the floor. And it is the trappings of a majority government. It is the trappings of a majority government. Why this is so different than a union bill or a difference of opinion on an approach to grow the province is that we are all in agreement. The minister spoke that climate change is a non-partisan issue. Right now, I feel partisanship on what's going to happen over the next few hours. The other two things that we've heard from our new government here in Nova Scotia is that they want to work with opposition. That's been said several times by the Premier. Let's see what happens tonight. No chance. No chance. And the third point I want to make is the commitment by this new government and its Premier to listen and respect Nova Scotians. To listen and respect Nova Scotians. So were we listening at law amendments? Were we respecting those citizens? the university students, the researchers, the professionals, the advocates that have worked their whole life on the issues of climate change? Are we going to listen and respect? This is not a Labour bill we're ramming through in five days with protests going on around the streets of the legislature. This is an important bill that I believe can lead the country. I believe the the core of this bill is solid. But throw some crumbs to the citizens of Nova Scotia. Please don't be so proud and arrogant that you know it all. My apologies for that word, but it's coming from here. This bill. All right, order. Order. Order, please. The member for King South. I would ask for order and silence from all members of the House. It is going to be a long night, and I would love to guide you through it with care and goodwill. So please don't interrupt me or ignore my words. Thank you. The, this, the Honourable Member for King South has the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I will leave it at this. The evidence for Nova Scotians will be decided tonight on how many of these amendments are passed. Thank you. Shall Clause 1 carry? carry. Shall Clauses 2 to 4 carry? Yay. Clause 5. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Mick Speaker. I would like to uh, draw folks' attention to Change Sheet NDP 1. And I would like to move the following amendment. To page 2. Subclause 5 to A. Delete paragraph C and substitute the following. C. 
work with representatives from labor organizations, business organizations, environmental organizations, municipalities, fisheries organizations, agriculture organizations, universities and community colleges, anti-poverty organizations, women's advocacy organizations, African Nova Scotian organizations, the Fédération Acadienne de la Nouvelle-Écosse, and Mi'kmaq organizations to develop a green job strategy that I I mean one, is focused on maximizing employment opportunities in permanent, full-time, high-wage green jobs, two, addresses systemic and historic issues of inequity, and three, ensures the benefits of our green economy are shared equitably. And B, Im add immediately after paragraph C the following paragraph. D, work across government departments and with labor, business, post-secondary institutions, and others to ensure workers in industries being phased out are fully supported to transition to green jobs and change lettering and cross-references accordingly. So, um, very briefly, Mick Speaker, uh, in, we don't see a plan in this uh, bill uh, for transitioning workers and um, we need, a, we need to speak to the need for a green, we need <laughs> to speak to the need in the bill uh, for the need of a green jobs plan and a just transition. Mick Speaker, if we are going to achieve these ambitious goals, as the minister has described them, these bold, ambitious goals, then we need to have a plan, a green jobs plan that is, that is set out and uh, that we can see the path forward. Uh, otherwise, we just won't be able to do it. We will not have the public confidence. Uh, we will not have the people uh, to do the work that's necessary. And we will be leaving many, many people behind. And we will be sacrificing what could potentially be a huge economic driver for this province. So I will leave it there. Uh, it basically speaks for itself. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I propose the following amendment. No. Oh, sorry, order. I need, oh, I apologize. We'll, we'll deal with the first amendment and then go forward. I just didn't want to see. If, okay. Shall the, shall the amendment carry? No. Carry. The amendment is defeated. I now recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I propose the following amendment. Page 2, Clause 5. Add the following subclause immediately after subclause 2. 3. As the goal to achieve sustainable prosperity is only attainable if the Chignecto Isthmus is strengthened and protected from rising ocean sea levels, the government shall provide funding necessary to maintain or strengthen infrastructure in the Chignecto Isthmus, including providing funding to improve highways, rail lines, dikes, and abateau. And Mick Speaker, I propose this amendment um, because sustainable pros prosperity will not be attainable not only to the people I represent in Cumberland North, but to all Nova Scotians if, in fact, we become an island. And with rising sea levels, Mick Speaker, that is the prediction. If the dikes along the Chignecto Isthmus are not repaired, uh, it needs to be a priority for this government, um, not only for the people I represent, for all Nova Scotians. $50 million worth of products uh, pass through that section of the Atlantic Gateway every day. It's the supply chain for all of Atlantic Canada, part of the, the U.S. Eastern Seaboard, and it connects us with the rest of the country, and therefore uh, I put this amendment forward. Thank you, Mick Speaker. Shall the amendment carry? No. no. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 5 carry? Carry. carry. Clause 6. I, rec I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Mick Speaker, and I'll, uh, uh, yeah, I will uh, draw the member's attention to NDP change sheet number two. And I would like to propose the following amendment. Page two, clause six. A, delete 53 in paragraph A and substitute 58. B, delete by balancing greenhouse gas emissions with greenhouse gas removals and other offsetting measures in the first and second lines of paragraph B. Uh, 
so uh, firstly, on uh, the change to Clause 6A, mixed speaker, um, I mean, it's simple. We, we, we know uh, that to achieve our fair share of um, the, the fair share of taking the burden of, of reducing greenhouse gases uh, for the earth, uh, that we need actually to reduce our emissions by 58%. So that means 50% below 1990 levels by 2030. 30. Thank you. Uh, Mick Speaker, this is clear. And we hear, we hear this other target, the 53%, the but that is, um, and that's an ambitious target, but it's not ambitious enough. We need to do our fair share. Canada and Nova Scotia contributes deeply to greenhouse gas emissions throughout the world, through all, in all kinds of ways. Not just what we do on our own soil, but, but you know, what we do in other countries as well. And so we need to take the responsibility to uh, decrease our emissions by 58%. Uh, this is what is called for uh, in the uh, 2030 Declaration, Mick Speaker, which 30 organizations and individuals have signed on to. We've heard the minister talk about 53% as the floor. I get that, I understand it, that it's the floor, not the ceiling. Well, let's hope it's not the ceiling, uh, Mick Speaker. But I still don't understand why we would shoot for a, low, a lower target than is necessary as the floor. If we're shooting for the floor, if our floor is 53%, then that is maybe what we will only get to, and that's not enough. We need to get to 58%. Leaders from around the world are at COP26 this week, and they are asking the global community to raise our ambitions. This is our moment to do that, Mick Speaker. It will drive levels of investment, it will create clear expectations for the industry, and it will help us contribute to the, uh, to the achievable target of 1.5 degrees uh, warming, and no more. Thank you, Mr. Mick Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, uh, th thank you, uh, uh, McChair. I, uh, I just wanted to say in a very brief way, I'm struck by, on this particular clause, how almost word for word uh, the argument in favour of it that's being put forward by the government and the minister uh, mirrors the argument that was put forward for the parallel clause in the Sustainable Development Goals Act. Um, when we <coughs> held the debate on that piece of legislation, uh, not so terribly long ago, uh, members will remember that that was the only one of the targets that was in fact within the legislation, so it was the focus of a, a great deal of debate here in the House. And over and over again, in response to the entreaties that came from the NDP caucus, uh, the Liberal Minister at that time would say, well, there is no other province in Canada that has a stronger target, therefore this is an excellent target, and, and essentially we were given to understand from that, we don't understand what you're talking about, what's your problem, what's your issue? Um, and it's striking to hear the, the very same line of reasoning now, as, as my colleague says from Dartmouth North, uh, in the middle of the COP26 conference, uh, as though somehow uh, meeting a standard of uh, comparison to other Canadian provinces is all that's being asked for us in this moment. But it, meeting a standard of comparison with other Canadian provinces is not what's being asked for us in this, province, in this moment. So I, I want to say simply that in 25 years, I don't think there's anyone who's going to look back on this legislation uh, and, and say, uh, oh, well, the thing with that was, did, didn't they do a wonderful job? They had a piece of legislation that was as good or even a bit better than any other uh, piece of legislation in Canada. That's not the matter, that's not going to be the bar. The measure is going to be, in 25 years, probably less than that. People are going to look at it and say, did that piece of legislation, uh, was it of a piece with the goal of holding global heating in 2021 with 1.5 degrees? Uh, that's the only question that matters. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is peripheral. Surely, if it wasn't clear at the time of the debate of the, at the SDGA, it's clear at the time of the debate of this uh, particular bill that's before us. The only thing that matters about GHD reduction, everything else is peripheral, everything else is a talking point, is does it align us with the world's mission of containing the heating of our planet within 1.5 degrees. What we are saying uh, 
is that this goal is not a strong enough goal, no matter how well it may or may not measure up with the goals of other jurisdictions. It's not strong enough because it fails to meet that central standard. Thank you, Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mick Speaker. And I'd just like to say a few words on the second part, the B part of the, of the amendment that I have moved. So just to remind the House, it's to delete by balancing greenhouse gas emissions with greenhouse gas removals and other offsetting measures in the first and second lines of paragraph B. So Mick Speaker, um, we heard from many presenters at law amendments who raised a red flag about the language balancing greenhouse gas emissions with greenhouse gas removals and other offsetting measures. The issue that environmentalists have raised is that we cannot rely on technology that is yet to be created or, or proven to work to meet our targets. We need to act now and we need to do things now and we need to do what's, what we are capable of now. We saw this with Goldboro LNG's suggestion that it would fit into our climate plan by purchasing offsets in Alberta. Carbon capture, utilization and storage will likely play a part in getting to net zero globally. Yes, it will. But there are many reasons why we should not count on it to meet our targets. The jury is still out on its effectiveness, its scalability, and what health risks it might present to communities who store carbon. Worse, looking to CCUS as the solution to meeting our targets can prolong our reliance on oil and gas and prevent us from making the transformational shifts that we need to make. And I will table a report that raises these points. Of course, the world will need new technologies. We've heard a lot about that this last week, talking about green jobs and, and uh, you know, training and science and technology and all of that stuff to reduce GHG emissions. But if every jurisdiction is relying on some future ability or future invention to pay for the reductions that they need, where will we be in 2030 or in 2050? We have no idea. So like my colleague from Dartmouth South said earlier, these are friendly amendments that will help us reach these goals, these very, again, ambitious and important goals. Well, not so, not, not ambitious enough, but anyway, we've talked about that. We need to reduce GHG emissions in our jurisdiction to the best of our ability. And the good news is, Mick Speaker, is that it's an economic opportunity. So we present this amendment to remove this language. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. Shall clause six carry? Yes. Oh, oh and, the, and that previous amendment was defeated. Clause seven. I recognize the honorable member for Bedford South. Thank you, uh, mixed chair. And I know there's many amendments tonight, so I won't belabor the point on this one. It's fairly straightforward. This is uh, amendment uh, lib one on the change sheet, page two, paragraph seven A. Delete December 31st, 2025 in the second line and substitute June 30th, 2025. So uh, Clause 7A of the bill uh, requires the province to issue a uh, province-wide climate change risk assessment every five years. And we think that's a, a good idea and something that, uh, that should be done. But we do have a, an issue uh, around the date. And as all members know, and as I have learned to accept with tremendous reluctance, our next uh, election is going to be on July 15th, 2025. So the, the purpose of this amendment is to shift the date of the uh, climate risk assessment to June so that Nova Scotians, and as we know, all Nova Scotians are very passionate about this issue, have a chance to assess the information, see where the government is going and how they're doing ahead of making what we hope will be an informed and full decision in the next election. So uh, many members have talked tonight about reasonableness, compromise, all these important things that I hope we will see at some point from the government. And I, I would submit that this is a, a common sense change that will help Nova Scotians assess how well the government is doing on this bill ahead of what we all recognize as a critically important choice, who to vote for in the next provincial election. So I would hope that the government will look upon this amendment favorably. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Clause 7. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. How long do we have to speak on this? 
<laughs> One hour? Okay, good to know. So uh, my amendment is to page two, paragraph 7B, add so that all homes owned by low and modest income homeowners or rented to low and modest income households will have deep energy refits and electrical or zero carbon heating systems installed by 2030 with 50% completed by 2026 at the end. And, and this is what I'll do to the amendment because we've already been told it's not happening. So, um, Order. We I apologize. Or order. I would ask the member to refrain from using props. I apologize. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. I apologize, Mr. Speaker. Um, so uh, let's be frank here. This is a very important amendment. Uh, before a law, amendments was, a law amendments was even over, we were told that none of these amendments would pass. Uh, the, the Minister of Environment, uh, I can get that. Minister of Environment is a former teacher and he's keenly aware of one of the hard rules when you teach, which is don't copy other people's homework. Well, I would say this bill is a carbon copy of the Liberals' homework. So I, pl I, I plead with the member opposite to do a little bit more homework copying and take some of these amendments. It's very important that low-income people and I, I have the floor if anyone else we want to keep going. Yeah. Um, it's very important that low and modest income individuals are represented in this bill. This, you know, this is, as, as we've all said when it comes to this bill and climate change, uh, this, the words of the members opposite, the words of the member for Pictou East, the Premier, and the words from the member from Dartmouth East, was this is not a partisan issue. Well, it seems pretty partisan tonight. And this amendment is not coming from the Liberals or the NDP. It's coming from experts. Uh, experts who know climate change. While I can appreciate the member for Dartmouth East and the former member from Kings North, South, South uh, were environment ministers, uh, you're environment ministers because you were placed there at the will of the Premier. And that's a fact. Uh, you do not have a degree in environment. You do not have a master's Order. in environment. And this mandate, or this, Order. sorry, go ahead. Please refrain from using you oh, and, and yeah. talking about members yeah. personally. Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Yep. Yeah. So, so, Mr. Speaker, the, those individuals do not have a background in environment. But you know who does? The people that brought these amendments forward. This amendment here was not brought forward, again, by the Liberals, by the Conservatives. And it's offensive to me to hear partially, partial quotes in this legislature to back up agendas. When you hear quotes from someone as, as respectable as the former leader of the Green Party, what I would argue is, say the entire quote. Say the entire speech. Don't cherry pick it. And that's exactly what was done. It was cherry picked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what I would ask the member, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, the member's opposite is this amendment and the amendments you're going to hear tonight are extremely important. And we've seen the member's opposite take time and listen, well, except for the bill on democracy and summer elections, and now the bill on climate change, um, we've seen the members stop and listen. Why not adjourn tonight? Why are we here tonight speaking on these amendments when we all have children and family we should be home with? Why? Why not? Adjourn for the night. My suggestion would be adjourn for the night. Process, process these amendments. And I see, I know what's going to happen here tonight, Mick Speaker. What's Order. Good? I would ask the honourable member to speak to the amendment. Yeah, okay. I, speak on this yeah. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Atlantic. Sorry, Mick Speaker, I was bringing it all back around. So, I know what's going to happen here tonight. This amendment is not going to go through. They'll cherry pick one or two to put through, and they'll pat themselves on the back 
and they'll say, we did a great job, and we were listening, with no process at all. So, Mr. Speaker, this, this bill is not just about paving roads or, or other things. This is about our children's future. This is about low and middle class income individuals. It's a really non-partisan, simple amendment. And I asked that the member for Dartmouth East, a lifelong learner and educator, take some time to learn what these amendments are, take the night, take the day, process them, and come back with an open mind and an open heart. Thank you, Mick Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member from Inverness. Thank you, uh, Mick uh, Chair. Um, I just am hearing the member's comments, and in all earnestness, I'm just thinking about this amendment, and I'm, I have some questions, and I would offer if the member wishes to entertain them. Um, how would one identify these homes? What would it cost based on the the uh, parameters here to have um, retrofits and zero carbon heating systems installed by 2030 with 50 percent of them completed by 2026 and what are some examples of zero carbon heating systems especially if 80 percent of the grid uh, is not going to be green until 2030 and even after 2030 20 percent of it may still not be green I recognize the Honourable Member for Health, Vice Atlantic. I, uh, Mick Speaker, I'm, I'm actually kind of blown away by that question. Uh, we put programs in place all the time through Housing Nova Scotia, through all different departments, community culture and heritage, where people can apply for it. You literally ha are the largest landlord in Nova Scotia in Housing Nova Scotia. Order. And you're, you're, Mick Speaker, they're literally the largest <laughs> landlord, one of the largest landlords in Nova Scotia. They own thousands of units. Housing, and I would hope that the Minister of Finance would know this, but they have programs specifically designed for low-income individuals to repair the roofs of their house, to, to go through and, and put in accessible washrooms. I've personally had constituents in my community use those. So if they can't identify who in Nova Scotia needs these programs, we put through, the former government put through $10 million, $10 million on the table that was there for thousands of Nova Scotians and was used. There's countless programs that are out there. I'll use the solar program, Solar City, Efficiency Nova Scotia, mixed speaker. These are programs that are targeted to individuals across Nova Scotia. I, I just am blown away that a member of the government would stand up and say, how do we identify things? Well, I would ask them, how are you going to identify who needs your paychecks and who needs your, who needs your better paycheck and all that? It's, 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 you have the tools at your disposal. Use them. Thank you, Mick Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mick Speaker. I'm just going to say uh, two quick things. Number one, uh, it's very clear the definition of someone who lives in energy poverty uh, is someone who, or a family or a household that spends more than 6% of their income on their energy costs. So that's, that's, a, that's a metric that can be used. But secondly, I just want to say, uh, against my better judgment, that, uh, and we will, be, we will be actually proposing a very similar amendment to this, but I want to say that I, what I like about this amendment, uh, besides the general idea of it, I completely agree with it, uh, is that it sets targets that are, that are within, um, maybe not within this government's mandate, but, the, but, they're, but they are closer at least to, um, to you know, now than 2030 or then. So it's, I think it's really important in general in this, in this bill to make sure that we have targets within this government's mandate or reporting mechanisms within this government's mandate. We will talk a little bit about that later. Um, and to make sure that we have interim steps for uh, much of these targets. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Clause 7. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mix Chair. Um, I draw the member's attention to chain sheet NDP 3. Page 2, paragraph 7B, delete and substitute the following. B, to support, strengthen and set targets for energy efficiency programming. Order, please. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South who has the floor. Thank you. I will start again. Page 2, paragraph 7B, delete and substitute the following. 
B, to support, strengthen, and set targets for energy efficiency programming while prioritizing equitable access and benefits for low-income and marginalized Nova Scotians by one, developing an energy efficiency resource standard in the next provincial climate plan to cover all energy sources and savings attributable to efficiency Nova Scotia activities. Two, developing a plan to eliminate oil heating in the province by 2050 at latest, with interim targets for fossil fuel savings and the number of buildings undergoing deep retrofits. Three, setting a minimum target of electricity demand side management annual savings equal to one and a half percent of sales, which may be increased by the minister or by order of the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board when greater energy savings are considered cost-effective or complementary to achieve renewable energy targets and net zero emissions, or considered to increase social and economic benefits within the province, and four, establishing a minimum budget for low-income energy efficiency programs designed to reduce energy poverty in all plans to meet energy efficiency resource standard requirements. Um, Mix Chair, this is a sort of a detailed amendment and I think we're coming at some of the same things our colleagues in the Liberal Party are coming at with their amendments, a couple of which I've heard and a couple of which I know we will hear after this. Um, but I will speak to each of these paragraphs briefly. Um, but I want to say that when I made my remarks on Clause 1, uh, these, this is the pack, part of the package of amendments to which I was speaking. Uh, so it is our contention that this particular amendment on NDP Change Sheet 3 is complementary to the goals set out in this Act. So this elaborates somewhat what is needed to accomplish those goals and creates some signposts. Could they be stronger? Absolutely. We introduce them in this fashion to say, this is really the minimum that is needed um, from an energy point of view, from an equity point of view, um, and from an efficiency point of view uh, to get to where we want to go. Um, in, in, uh, in one, we talk about uh, development of an energy efficiency resource standard in the provincial climate plan. We're not asking for it in the legislation, we're asking for it in the climate plan. And this is essentially like a renewable energy target um, that would be expressed as savings versus load. And so our view is, um, and this is what we've been told by, or what I've been told by people much smarter than me in the efficiency realm, is if we were to simply um, flip over all of the oil heated homes in Nova Scotia to heat pumps, it would break the grid. We don't have the capacity for that kind of load. So as we contemplate moving to net zero, we also need to constantly be creating efficiencies so that the electricity load is, is less than what the load would be in the homes as they exist heated by oil. So this is why these energy efficiency standards are so important. It optimizes um, these transitions that, based on this bill, we know will happen. We're going to be retrofitting for a long time, and we need to be doing that in a way that is fuel neutral. So, you know, when you install a heat pump, like we needed to install a heat pump, and the contractor came over and said, yeah, install a heat pump, but insulate your basement first. Because don't bother installing a heat pump right now, because all that heat's going to go out your basement, just like all your oil heat's going out your basement, which is a bummer, because it's really expensive. <laughs> what? <laughs> I see... <so> <laughs> Yeah, but my furnace is in my basement. This was told to me by an energy contractor. Maybe the PC government would like to quibble with that contractor. I'll get them to give you a call. This is what I was told. Um, but at any rate, um, the, I think that the point stands, which is that we need to constantly be um, advocating for and measuring and benchmarking efficiency targets, even as we look towards those conversions. Um, Number two is developing a plan to eliminate oil heating in the province by 2050 with interim targets. So we're going to have to get off oil before 2050, like that's pretty clear, but again, 
The Act is silent on this, and we have a lot of homes in Nova Scotia that are heated with furnace oil. Not only is that incredibly inefficient, but it's also very, very expensive. <laughs> and. And so, you know, from an equity perspective, um, and obviously from an efficiency perspective, we need to speed up the way we think about that transition, and we have to name it in this act. Um, and there's a lot of other things we should phase out too, but we single out he home heating oil here because there's like no upside. There's not even an imagined upside of home heating oil. If we get into natural gas, people can talk about clean natural gas or hydrogen. You know, there are debates that happen in other, on other fossil fuels that might be contemplated as we move more deeply into this. There's no debate about furnace oil. It's bad for the environment, it's expensive, it's dirty. Let's get rid of it. Let's say we're getting rid of it in the act. Um, in number three, we talk about a minimum target of electricity demand side management. We name 1.5% and then specify that this could be increased uh, by the minister or the UARB. I don't want to steal my colleagues' thunder. I know they name a more ambitious target um, in the amendment that will be forthcoming, but again, I want to note that we are making amendments that we think are completely in keeping with what's already in the act on this section. So we're not we're not seeking in this moment to push the limit. We're saying this is absolutely what's required to get there, 1.5%. Um, and you know, we we want to make sure that um, you know we know this is cost effective. It's justified. It's achievable. Efficiency in Nova Scotia is hitting over one percent already, um, and it's you know this is measured through uptake on efficiency programs. So as we just discussed, those that uptake is going to only increase as we move forward with this bill. Um, and you know, I, we think that it's again important to name this in the bill. It it. It is already implied by the targets, but, but we want to help us have these benchmarks to get there. And last, um, this is a version, I think, of the last amendment that we heard uh, from the Liberal Caucus just before this, establishing a minimum budget for low-income energy efficiency programs designed to reduce energy poverty in all plans to meet energy efficiency resource standard requirements. Um, this, in most of the jurisdictions in North America that lead on energy efficiency, um, this is a key part of those plans, that there are these big carve-outs for low and modest income, which certainly can be measured and is already being measured uh, by Efficiency Nova Scotia. And you know, the goal of this is not to just reduce energy use, but really directly to reduce energy poverty. And I think as we've discussed in this house before, as MLAs, we all know what energy poverty looks like because it walks into our office all the time. All of us, every single one of us. And if you're brand new and this hasn't happened to you, get ready. Have people who come into our office desperate because their power's getting cut off, they can't pay their power bill, they have massive arrears to Nova Scotia power that there's no way that they can pay, um, and that is simply unacceptable. In the same way that we've been talking about housing, you know, that also really holds true for electricity. We can get to internet maybe in the next session, but, but right now there are certain things that every individual or family needs to function. Mm -hmm. And energy, heat, and lights really I think are, are, are two of those things. And that is a struggle for many, many folks. And, and, and this is important not just to sort of pay lip service to this notion of energy poverty, but to say that without these carve-outs, without naming this like this in the bill, what can happen is, um, you know, obviously when you're putting into play a big effort like this, you're going to look for the simplest way to hit the target. That's just a sort of efficient from a bureaucratic point of view. But often when you do that, you're actually going to miss these energy poverty issues. So it might be that if everybody replaced every single light bulb, that would net as much efficiency savings 
as if fewer people uh, converted to heat pumps or converted to solar or converted to something else that would actually be able to provide them with long-standing and secure, clean, cheap source of energy. And so for that reason, we need to make sure that we are addressing this directly in this bill. And you know, often we get caught up in this conversation around power in particular with um, the way that we've always thought about it, particularly because of the UARB, which is, are the rates going to go up? Are the rates going to go up? Are the rates going to go up? But the point is, is that if we do this correctly, yes, probably the rates will go up, but the bills will go down. The bills will go down because people will be using so much less power. Um, and that's just a fact. And so that, that is made more true by these carve-outs for low income where we really support uh, low-income families and individuals to achieve these retrofits so that their bills can be lower even as we transition the grid. Even if that does mean a slight increase in the rates, uh, people will ultimately pay less. Um, thank you, Mr. M Mix Chair. Okay. I recognize the honorable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, uh, Mix Chair, and I uh, just wanted to, to rise and uh, support the uh, well thought out uh, amendment from my colleague. I think if there is a gaping gap that uh, is apparent in the bill, it is around efficiency. Um, we talked about how when we were working on the previous bill from 2019 that subsequent goals after the greenhouse gas reduction bill would come out in regulation. <laughs> and so I, uh, I respect the new direction from the government to embed uh, the new goals in, in legislation and not regulation. Uh, but they're clearly missing this as an opportunity uh, that we would not have missed uh, with efficiency and the member spoke very well to the benefits of looking at how power bills can come down when we're challenged with the power rate uh, issue. Um, but efficiency really is where we get the best return on our investment for public dollars and for, for rate payers. We get more jobs, even more than the, the thousands of jobs associated with renewable energy. We get reduced power bills, and it's just the right thing to do, um, Mr. Speaker, because of the, the climate crisis. Um, so just to quantify what kind of savings, if you look at what we'll be able to achieve with new renewable energy, as other members have, have quoted me say, wind is the, the cheapest form of energy right now in the province, solar is continuing uh, to go down, uh, we'll be able to get in the range of four cent kilowatt hour uh, pricing uh, when that tender goes out. Uh, but if you look at how other provinces out west uh, were able to achieve that, they were able to bring that down to three cents a kilowatt hour based on the efficiency programming. Uh, Nova Scotia has been known as a leader in efficiency uh, and this bill uh, does nothing to advance our leadership position. It's actually uh, a, a huge opportunity to not have the, the target that was referenced in this amendment, the 1.6 uh, I think it was that's proposed. Right now we're at 1.2% which does lead the country. Uh, so we should be proud, but to, to, to miss that and not mention it when, they, when the new government has bragged about how everything, all the goals are in legislation and not in regulation, to miss that opportunity to have an annual electricity savings target, I think, is wrong. Uh, and just previous to, to this amendment, uh, which is related to my colleague's amendment on low-income housing, people are really struggling with their, with their energy costs right now. And that, that relates to everything else that they're, that they're doing in their life. And so, again, if we're going to target money and efficiency, targeted at the lowest income people that we have in the province. And that's why this amendment is, is a key one that I think the government should support. John. I recognize the honorable member for, I'm so sorry. Cole Harbor. Cole Harbor, thank you. Oh. Yeah. No, forget it. <laughs> you good? Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Clause 7. I recognize the honorable member for Timberley Prospect. Sorry, and we're, and we're still on efficiency uh, because I do think that's... Uh, <laughs> That is the, the biggest gap, and I think if you talk to experts, uh, if the minister talks to experts, uh, he'll hear the same thing. So uh, page 2, clause 2, 7, add the following paragraphs immediately after paragraph B. C, to set the annual electricity savings target at 3% of sales by 2030. 
D, to mandate home energy labels at the point of sale. E, to mandate greenhouse gas emissions performance standards for existing buildings by 2025. F, to have 75% of industrial energy use in the province benefiting from energy management systems by 2030. And G, to deliver at least 25 million in commercial building retrofit investments to the Canada Infrastructure Bank. So pretty self-explanatory. These are, these are key targets, especially the first one, which is a little bit more aggressive, but it goes out to 2030, which aligns with much of the targets referenced in the, uh, in the bill, as well as one of the other targets, uh, and as well as an interim target in 2025. We've noticed that there is not very many interim targets, another weakness of the bill. Um, if they pass the bill as is without this amendment or others, they, the new government could virtually get away with not a lot of action over the next uh, mandate. And so that's why we'll be proposing a number of interim targets. Uh, I spoke already to the, the value of efficiency and why these are important investments to make and why we need to keep our leadership uh, position. And I chose 3% because it would be the most ambitious in, uh, in North America right now. Massachusetts is, is the most at 2.7%. And if anywhere can, uh, can beat that and be more ambitious than, than some states and other provinces, I believe it's in Nova Scotia, and we can create thousands of jobs by doing so. So I'll, I'll take That's my place on those. Yep. I recognize the honourable member for Sydney, member two. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, and I'm going to be very quick. I just, I, this is something that I just want to say in, in regards to efficiency and why uh, our, our concerns around the lack of, of uh, discussion or our lack of, of efficiency within. What government is going to realize very quickly is that a lot of the federal funds that are available that they'll be able to access are all based on efficiency. They're based on efficiency programs. So when I look at the, the, the MIGMA energy uh, retrofits, a big chunk of that money is federal in negotiations. In my time, we retrofitted 11,500 homes uh, in, in, our, in our housing stock. That, again, was what the federal government looked for. The solar incentive program, again, efficiency. Federal government wanted to invest in it. So to, I just want to reiterate that as you move forward as a government and you're making decisions around this, a lot of your opportunities that are going to come from the federal government are going to be based on efficiency. That's what they want to invest in. That's what they've always wanted to invest in because it immediately helps families, it employs thousands of people, uh, and we know, uh, and as a result of that, the negotiations, and you, you will be doing this, or sorry, not you, next speaker through you, um, that the government's going to be doing the same thing. These, this is what the federal government's going to be coming to the government about, saying this is what we want to do. 100%. That's why we're number one in solar. We went after the money. We're number one in efficiency workforce because we expanded all of our programs. We went after the money and we did over 10,000 uh, units within housing. Again, all of these programs, this is what the federal government wants. Uh, there'll be other infrastructure to look at, but ultimately you're going to be in a lot of conversations about efficiency, so I think that that's important to, to reference as well. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth North. Mick Speaker, I just wanted to um, give a, a, a profound shout out to uh, uh, letter D here to mandate home energy labels at the point of sale. I think this is a, a really essential one um, in terms of, of, of encouraging and, and um, yeah, encouraging folks to do, folks who can afford it. Like, we're, so this it sort of steps out of what the previous conversation, which is about uh, folks in, in lower, mo uh, um, modest incomes. But people who can afford to do this work should be doing this work. And they should be getting value for their work when they sell their home afterward. So, um, you know, you, when Efficiency Nova Scotia comes to, uh, to do a home uh, energy assessment, you get a little, uh, you get where your R rating is is now and then where your expected R rating is when you do the work that they they uh, you know suggest you do so and the R rating is generally like way way better uh, and but so if every home at point of sale had to have their R rating in the cut sheet of the sale or whatever then when you're buying a home, when someone is buying a home, they can see, oh, that home will be cheaper to live in because it's more efficient, or that home needs a heck of a lot more efficiency work done to it. So I'm going to ask, you know, I'm going to try to get a better deal when I buy that home. It's an excellent, excellent way to encourage energy efficiency work and to make sure that folks are getting value uh, for when they do that work. Thanks.
Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. I recognize the honorable member for Cole Harbor. <clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Speaker. I have uh, change sheet, liberal four, page three, paragraph seven. Um, before I go into it, I'd just like to make a comment, and I'm hoping that the minister, you know, who has signaled that he won't entertain any amendments, will at least take a moment to consider this amendment from an equitable point. Prove that this, to prove to the hosts and show us that you're not cemented in your decisions. Uh, paragraph 7C, delete, and First Nations in the first line and substitute First Nations and African Nova Scotian communities. Shall the amendment carry? Yes. The amendment carried. I recognize the honorable member for King South. <laughs> just, just got warmed up here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, please refer to Lib uh, Dash Five. Uh, it reads as such, page 3, paragraph 7E, delete 18 in the first line and substitute 12. Page 3, paragraph 7F, delete 2022 in the second line and substitute March 31st, 2022. Page 3, paragraph 7I, delete and substitute the following. One, to complete energy benchmarking of all existing government-owned buildings by 2023 and decrease greenhouse gas emissions across all government-owned buildings by 25% by 2028, 50% by 2032, and 75% by 2035. So on the theme of efficiency, and of course government should lead, and government should lead with their buildings, the intent of these amendments uh, is to strengthen the actions on retrofits of government buildings. The current bill, uh, the existing clause, only uh, has a target of 2035, a single target 14 years out. So Clause 7E changes the time frame for the province to adopt the 2020 National Energy Code. While 18 months may be typical time frames for adoptions of new codes in the province, the climate crisis is demanding governments act more quickly. So a reduction to 12 months is realistic and achievable and uh, what we should be doing in this time of crisis where citizens are asking for quick action. Changes proposed for Clause 7F is moving the cutoff to begin to, pl to the planning of new builds and retrofits forward to March 31st, 2022. Again, to act more quickly. And uh, as well, it's important to align our work with the fiscal years. Uh, so as budgets are being developed, uh, uh, put new builds into uh, into the capital plan. Those get set out in the fiscal year plans. So uh, certainly by March 31st, we should know what is going into the planning and ensure that there is funding uh, for those projects. Changes to some sub clause uh, 7i is about setting interim targets. Uh, the clause, this clause, the target is 75 uh, percent, uh, which is way too far out in 2035. So this amendment sets interim targets of 25% and 50%. Uh, as well, uh, in this, this new amendment, um, Laura Ryan, the consultant and former regional director of the Green Building Council, gave a helpful presentation and raised the importance of benchmarking our building stock. So Clause I also puts into law the need to benchmark each government building. Now this is obviously needed to uh, measure progress, to know where we're beginning, and it will also assist the government to be very strategic about a retrofit program, uh, allowing a comparison of the projects and where the low-hanging fruit is and where uh, they can get, uh, government can get the biggest bang for the buck by prioritizing buildings and the budgeting of the projects. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Clause seven, I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mix Chair. Um, I draw the member's attention to change sheet NDP four. Page three, clause seven, add the following paragraph immediately after paragraph E. F, to adopt the latest version of the National Building Code within 18 months of it being published by the Government of Canada and require all new buildings in the province to be net zero ready and zero carbon ready by 2030 at the latest. Change lettering and cross-reference accordingly. Mix, mix Chair, this is an example of what I think is probably, hopefully, an accidental omission from this act. So this act, I mean, I genuinely mean that. So this act specifies that the National Energy Code will be adopted within 18 months. We just heard an amendment about that. But the National Energy Code is not the only building code it, that contemplates energy. There is the National Building Code itself. And the National Energy Code does not apply to single family dwellings at all. So the National Building Code, Mix Chair, um, or the National Energy Code, which is incorporated in the Act, applies, of course, we would adopt it. The Liberals are saying 12 months, 18 months, faster is better, but as soon as possible. It's a 2020 code that has yet to be released, which is why there's still this forward-looking language. But that code, um, and I've shared this with the Minister of the Environment uh, prior to this, um, the National Building Code also needs to be adopted because that building code specifies the energy require the efficiency requirements for single family homes, which make up a lot of the homes in Nova Scotia. And it has a step in the code. Nova Scotia generally is no notable among all provinces for tending to adopt these codes wholesale from the federal government. So it's something that we generally do anyway. And further, um, the second part of this paragraph requires all new buildings in the province to be net zero ready to the Minister of Finance's earlier point that we may not have the capacity to be net zero, but we would be net zero ready and zero carbon ready by 2030 at the latest. And the reason that this is important, Mix Chair, is that if we know that we're moving to net zero, we have to start building at net, net zero ready because if we don't, we're going to be retrofitting forever, which is an inefficient way to do things. And so this is contemplated in the federal building codes, both the National Building Code and the National Energy Code. We think that one is missing here and that it should be adopted um, within 18 months at latest of its passage, um, and that by 2030, in or again, in order to accomplish the goals already enumerated in this bill, that we need to be building net zero ready and zero carbon ready um, by 2030 at the latest, all new buildings. Thank you, Mix Chair. It's not at all. No. <laughs> Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Clause 7. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mix Chair. And this amendment is on change sheet uh, Lib 6, and it's uh, pertaining to electric vehicles. Page 3, paragraph 7J, delete and substitute the following. J, to develop and implement a zero emission vehicle mandate that ensures at a minimum that 50% of new vehicle sales of all light duty and personal vehicles in the province will be zero emission vehicles by 2025 and that 100% of new vehicle sales of all light duty and personal vehicles in the province will be zero emission vehicles by 2030. So mixed chair, this is just uh, adding some ambition to the, the target of 2030. I know the uh, PC ran on a, on a platform uh, for uh, electric vehicles and uh, th there's also an interim a target here um, so that we don't have to wait that long so uh, by 2025 we would have half of the vehicle sales and I know 100% sounds ambitious but it actually aligns with HRM's stated goal already um, and so I think it would be odd to have one part of the province with around half of Nova Scotians having 100% vehicle sales 
and not the rest of the province. Uh, Mick Speaker, we uh, we did some work uh, in the previous government for incentives for electric vehicles. Um, I think we put ten million dollars for electric vehicles, e-bikes, as well as used vehicles. There's a lot of work to do to get charging stations out there, uh, but there's time to do that, and so. Uh, I don't believe the amendment will pass. Nonetheless, uh, we'll put it on the, on the table and uh, implore the government to get to work to start electrifying uh, transportation and using the Green Fund uh, to get more incentives out there to ensure that we, we have access to electric vehicles, especially for low to medium income uh, people who could use the incentive and uh, especially on the used cars. I, I feel like that, that's a good policy to help it get uh, more equitable access uh, to vehicles. As uh, we talked about efficiency tonight and renewable energy uh, to an extent, uh, it is important as we continue to green the grid that we electrify transportation the same way we're electrifying our power system. Uh, Mick Speaker, it's a key uh, pillar of how we, to, we advance with, uh, with a low carbon economy. Um, and that's why we invested in uh, transit and HRM as well and CBRM. Um, by leveraging some of the federal funds that my colleague uh, spoke about on uh, one of our last amendments. So this is simply to, to enshrine in legislation more aggressive uh, goals because uh, we will not have an, as aggressive goal as either HRM or federal government if this bill stands uh, without the amendment. Thank you, Mick Speaker. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Mick Speaker, and I would like to uh, um, bring the House's attention to NDP Chain Sheet 5 and propose the following amendment, which may sound familiar. <laughs> uh, page 3, paragraph 7J. A, delete 30 percent in the second line and substitute 50 percent, and B, add and that 100% of new vehicle sales of all light duty and personal vehicles in the province will be zero emission vehicles by 2035 at the end. So, Mick Speaker, it's a really similar uh, amendment to uh, the one that the, uh, that the Liberals have just proposed, which was just voted down in case anyone forgot. Um, and so, um, here's a second chance. Here's a second chance. So what we heard at Law Amendments, McSpeaker, is that along with rebates, uh, the targets along with rebates drive the sale of zero emission vehicles. Rebates are great, um, but targets are actually even more important because um, it, it, it allows the vehicle producers um, to know what to produce and where to send them. So in June 2021, Canada set a new target for zero emission vehicles. 100% by 2035. The International Energy Agency has said its flagship or in its flagship report net zero by 2050. A roadmap for the global. Uh, sorry, I'm going to say that again. The International Agency Energy Agency has said in its flagship report net zero by 2050. A roadmap for the global energy sector that there should be no sales of new internal of of new internal combustion engines by 2035. So by going with the target that sets the floor, rather than the ambition, we risk being less competitive than other provinces. BC and Quebec are, uh, already have similar policies in place, and they're seeing sales for EVs surge in comparison to places without these targets. So the message is clear. We raise the bar, or we miss out. Speaker, thank you. Shall the amendment carry? The, care, the amendment is defeated. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mix Chair. I draw the member's attention to NDP Chain Sheet 6, um, and I move the following amendment at page 3, paragraph 7L. Uh, delete I. L. <laughs> I can't tell on the sheet. Uh, delete 80 percent in the first line and substitute 90 percent. Um, next chair, this refers uh, to how much of the electricity in the province is will be supplied by renewable energy by 2030. Um, 
the bill uh, specifies 80 um, percent, and and our suggestion, based on uh, presentations by many uh, climate experts, is that we could achieve 90 percent. And this is important for two reasons. One, it's important so that our kids have a planet to live on, but but also it's important so that we can grow our economy, so that we can do have a just transition as we uh, transition to net zero. And so the more aggressive our target is on renewable energy, um, hopefully the more aggressive um, the, the concomitant job creation is and the more uh, employment we can have, the more we can transition our um, legacy sectors, uh, the more we can bring uh, those care and creative sectors we discussed about earlier uh, into the fore, and the better our economy is as we make this transition. Thank you, Mixed Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Inverness. Thank you, uh, Mixed Chair. Um, I guess I'll just make the short comment. I remember the last time the NDP was in government, power rates increased 30 percent in three years. And I'm just not so sure that I'm willing to trust the math of simply saying, let's increase it from 80 percent to 90 percent. Because I, Mr. Speaker, or Mix Chair, uh, know what happened and know why that became such an election issue. Uh, it actually led, <laughs> now that I think about it, <laughs> it led to the Liberal incoming government in their election campaign claiming they were going to break the monopoly of Nova Scotia power. And that didn't happen either. But I just put those comments out for members' consideration. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mixed Chair. I am so amused by the number of times the NDP government of nearly a decade ago has been brought up in this House tonight. It's a different time. It's a different group of people. Talk about your own bills. Talk about what you're doing. Don't talk about what happened 10 years ago. And by the way, and by the way, the 90% target doesn't come from us. It comes from a consulting company, Gardner Pinfold, who is very well respected, who absolutely pointed out that this could be achieved, that this would be good for the environment. Uh, we, in, in these amendments, we are representing people who are smarter than us, who, with respect, have more education and understanding and knowledge of energy efficiency, of environmental action, than anyone in the government benches. Absolutely. And so the government can agree or not agree, but to bring up ancient history to disparage an independent report is, quite frankly, ridiculous. Thank you, Mixed Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I just wanted to, to uh, chime in there a little bit. Uh, the, uh, it's true, 30% uh, increasing uh, power rates under the, uh, the previous uh, NDP government, but previous to that, the PC government allowed power rates to go up by 40%. So it was a, oh, a, 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 a combined... But, but the combined 70 percent. But uh, I also wanted to, to to point out a myth, a myth that uh, that renewable energy has been the uh, the main cause of the increasing power rates. Uh, Mick Speaker, if you look at the uh, the reluctancy for governments in the past to make the transition to not be handicapped handicapped by the increasing fuel costs that can happen uh, when you're reliant on uh, when fossil fuels that are uh, attached to, to the market and commodity pricing. Uh, we uh, had uh, in place uh, uh, a ComFit program that had, of course, uh, had some issues with a fixed rate that was higher under, under the NDP government that had contributed to, to rates going up, but the, the vast majority of contribution to increasing rates was reliant on coal, and we're paying the price right now for, our, for, the, for the dependency on coal right now. We are, and it's the highest. If we, if we did the work earlier on, uh, we wouldn't be uh, having the, the risk, the, the liability that's on the grid right now. Um, that is the, if you talk to energy experts, they'll tell you, uh, by reliant on coal for as long as we have been we are not able to take advantage of the, the low cost of renewables today like we would have been if we acted earlier uh, with this transition. So I just wanted to point out that. Good minute. job. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 7 carry? Yes. The clause is carried. Clause 8.
I recognize the Honourable Member for King South. Uh, thank you, Mix, Mix Speaker. Uh, please refer to change sheet LIB 7. Uh, it reads as follows, page 3, sub clause 8, delete December 31st in the first line and substitute March 31st. Page 3, clause 8, add the following sub clause immediately after sub clause 2. 3, the plan outlined under subsection 1 must include annual interim targets and annual recommended budgets for all initiatives included in the plan to meet the 2030 target set out in clause 6A and interim 2035, 2040 and 24. 2045 targets to meet the 2050 target set out in Clause 6B. So again, this is about interim targets and uh, the urgency of the climate crisis and our need to uh, move forward as quickly as we can. So the uh, climate change plan uh, th that is referred to in Clause 8 uh, was originally committed by the department to be completed this fall. Uh, so putting uh, another year uh, into uh, legislation for that to be uh, uh, completed by, uh, I don't think reflects the urgency and the importance of the work that, that uh, is underway. So the amendment to subclause one is to change the date for the uh, deadline for the climate plan from March to March 31st from December 31st. Moving this uh, another year out, there's uh, just two, I mentioned this. Okay, so, uh, next, the uh, new proposed uh, date in this amendment uh, does allow some additional time, but will align with the fiscal year in hopes that the funds can make it into the 2022-23 budget. If we don't have the funds identified in the budget, it makes it far more difficult to begin actions, and we cannot wait until April 2023 to get the work done on GHG reductions. The amendment also requires annual targets until 2030 and five-year targets beyond 2050. It's assumed that on five-year reports, revisions can be made and will be made to the post-2030 targets. Time is really short to get this work done before 2030 and diligent annual targets will hold government accountable to get the work done now. And, and to remain focused each and every year on the important work that we have to do. Thank you, Mixed Speaker. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mixed Speaker. Uh, I'd like to call uh, attention to NDP Change Sheet 7 and propose the following amendment. Page three, paragraph eight, one A, add, through the creation of a provincial carbon budget and provincial greenhouse gas inventory at the end. And page three, subclause eight, two, add, with updated carbon budgets immediately after one in the second line. So, uh, Mick Speaker, these are about, um, uh, these changes are, these uh, proposed amendments are about um, making sure that we can track our progress and be able to report about the progress we're making or the lack of progress, frankly. Uh, right now, if we rely on federal government uh, numbers, the, there's a two-year lag in reporting. And at this point, we are, don't forget, we're in a climate emergency. We can't be waiting two years for federal government numbers on some of these uh, endeavors and initiatives. Um, we are in a climate crisis. We need clear and regular reporting. I mean, really, what is, the, what is the harm of it? The harm of it is if you are in government uh, and you don't meet a target or the government doesn't meet a target or, or uh, numbers look bad in one year for whatever reason, maybe there's a global pandemic, maybe something else happens, the worst that can happen is the opposition can put out a release and say, oh, the government's not doing what they're supposed to be doing or what they said to be doing. And then the news cycle ends and you keep moving on, right? That is the worst that can happen. The best that can happen is the government says, oh, we didn't meet that target. Oh, crap, we've got to figure something out and fix what we're doing and make it better and so that we can make sure that the plant doesn't burn, right? So, I mean, honestly, these types of reporting the mechanisms are essential and not harmful to a government in power, but uh, important for uh, success with these very ambitious goals. Some people have said that we should have reporting uh, for the climate crisis similar to the kind of amazing regular updating we've been having, we've been having for COVID. Um, 
COVID-19 came upon this province, we kicked into a state of emergency, and let's face it, the, the, the government and the public health response uh, to the crisis has been quite amazing. You know, starting with like daily reports and then going to weekly reports, and I don't know where we are now because I haven't watched a report because we're in here, but um, I think they're still happening. Are they still happening? Uh, oh, they're not happening. Okay, never mind. Um, anyway, my point is <laughs> the reporting helped Nova Scotians uh, understand what was happening, uh, it delivered clear and efficient information, and it kept people from frankly, freaking out too much. Uh, and it's the same kind of thing that's necessary with this crisis. The climate crisis is no less of a crisis uh, than the global health pandemic that we're living in now. So I think this is a great idea. Urge the government to pass this amendment. I'm losing it. I'm getting tired. Shall the amendment carry? Yeah. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 8 carry? Yeah. Shall Clause 9 carry? Yeah. Clause 10. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Mixed Chair. I draw the member's attention to NDP Change Sheet 8, and I move the following amendment. At page 4, paragraph 10A, add at least 17% of the total land and water mass of the province by 2025, mm. and immediately after, conserve in the first line. Um, Mixed Chair, this is a simple amendment that I think is um, similar to many amendments we've heard tonight. It's an interim target, basically. So um, we're adding 17% by 2025 as an interim target. We recognize that the international and national goals for land and water protection are 25% by 2025 and 30% by 2030. But if the goal here is at least 20% by 2030, we would like to make sure that that work doesn't get missed altogether or get back ended to 2030. We've heard a lot in here about coastlines and oceans and rivers and lakes, um, many of which, um, you know, this is, the, this is the beauty of a geographical representative cis government and, par and legislature is that we all have these lakes and rivers and watersheds in our constituencies. We all care about them very much. Many of us stand up in this house at different times to celebrate them or advocate for their um, caretaking and safety. Um, it's in the bill, but again, we want to make sure it gets done and we want to make sure it's happening on an ongoing basis. So this is really simple to say, let's reach half that target halfway through and make sure that the work is happening. Thank you, Mixed Chair. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 8 carry? Oh, sorry. I, I missed a couple of being a lower pet. Shall, <laughs> shall the amendment carry? Clause 10. Sorry. I recognize the Honourable Member for Annapolis. Chair, I uh, draw attention to Change Sheet 8, Lib 8. Uh, propose the following amendment, page 4, clause 10, add the following paragraph immediately after paragraph B to implement the 2021, by 2021, the Nova Scotia Civiculture Guide for the Ecological, Ecological Matrix on Crown Land Harvesting. Uh, and there's much that is good in Bill 57, uh, yet the current bill suggests 2023 is the timeline to implement uh, the ecological approach to forestry. We're asking for a much more urgent response and if we're going to reference the climate change as an emergency, as all parties have, let's complete this transition right away and not wait another two years. We're a national leader in our response to the pandemic emergency, and I see no reason why we can't be a national leader in this one. A key step in this response is to implement the SGEM, or the Civiculture Guide to the Ecological Matrix. This important guide was released in July by the past Liberal government. Uh, a lot of work has been put into it. Consultation's complete. It's ready to go. I realize from speaking to the Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables that staff is being trained on this. It's moving forward through ecological forestry practice. But this, again, 2023 is too long a wait for this transition. This new SGEM is ready to use today. It's far from perfect, but the prescription they generate will finally move us from clear-cutting to ecological forestry. There's no excuse. 
Let's act on it today. Thank you, Mix Chair. I recognize the honourable member from Cumberland South. I recognize the honourable member from, for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mix uh, Chair. Uh, just in reference uh, to this, I appreciate the, uh, the comments from the member opposite. As, as it was stated in, in second reading, th th this was implemented, uh, I think it was the second week that I was in office that we signed off on it. Um, as an update from staff, the training is taking place on the ground. Um, it's, it's staff training, it's, it's people that are uh, acquired into licensing, um, but the, the, the process has started. It um, doesn't matter what government would have been on this side, you're very, very correct. Um, it, it was ready in July. It was signed off as soon as uh, as soon as we were able to take office, get briefed on it, and and I, I believe what what staff have indicated is we're actually going to see some some movement on the ground itself, in and around Christmas uh, mid mid winter time. So j just update the house on that as I as I did indicate in second reading as well. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? The amendment is defeated. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mix Chair. Um, I draw the member's attention to CWHB NDP 9, and I move the following amendment. At page 4, clause 10, add the following paragraph immediately after paragraph B. C, to introduce legislation that protects parks and protected areas from being delisted without public consultation by the government. Um, I move this amendment knowing uh, what the outcome will be because uh, we essentially voted on this earlier today. Um, we are told that the province intends to protect the remaining areas in the 2013 Parks and Protected Areas Plan. Um, they voted against our act today. Um, they've said they're going to do it, so why not have a commitment to it in the act? If they're going to do it, then let's amend the act and, and have it reflected here. Thank you, Mix Chair. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mix Chair. I draw the member's attention to change sheet number 10. Um, and I move the following amendment, page four, clause 10, add the following paragraph immediately after paragraph B, to protect the remaining areas in the 2013 Parks and Protected Areas Plan by the end of 2022, <laughs> change lettering and cross-references accordingly. Um, I think this speaks for itself, and I've basically already spoken to it, but this party is also previously committed to creating legislation to ensure that parks and protected areas cannot be delisted without public consultation. This is a very simple one-line amendment um, that you know suggests that 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 says that they will protect these remaining areas. So they've already shot down uh, consultation, um, but now we're saying uh, that we'll, that that now we're asking them to commit to just protecting uh, the, that land. Thank you, Mix Chair. Sorry, I got a bit mixed up on those ones. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mix Chair. Um, draw the member's attention to CWHB NDP 11. Um, and uh, move the following amendment. Page 4, paragraph 10C, delete 2023 in the first line and substitute 2022 with an immediate moratorium on clear cutting and all forms of even aged harvesting. Um, Mix Chair, we've been talking about this uh, for years, and the minister in his remarks on uh, Clause 1 uh, s cited a tweet from Bill Leahy suggesting that, it, that this was a good act. Um, I suspect if you asked Mr. Leahy years after his report was delivered uh, when he thinks it should be implemented, um, Maybe, maybe 2023 wouldn't be the answer. Um, maybe it would be 2020 or 2021 or next best, 2022, uh, which is what we're suggesting um, 
uh, here and and um, and 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 since it has taken some time, um, and and I appreciate the remarks of the Minister uh, of Resources and Renewables, and I've been in dialogue uh, with his office, and I know that there are parts of that review that are being operationalized as we speak. But nonetheless, uh, the review is not. Uh, you know, the, the report is not fully implemented. We don't have a particularly ambitious timeline for implementation in this bill. And so what we're asking for is the same thing we've been asking for for quite some time, which is while until the government is able to fully implement the report, we would like an immediate moratorium on clear cutting on Crown land because currently it is not taking place, uh, you know, in concert with the report that is now years old that was submitted uh, by Professor Leahy, and therefore um, we can both protect uh, the, the remaining forests that we have, particularly mixed species forests, um, and hopefully spur a faster timeline of implementation of the whole report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, thank you. Uh, just f further to uh, what my friend from uh, Dartmouth South has just said, it is important to, to understand the, the depth of delay that has been around this review. Um, this, is, um, this is not the, the normal um, a process by which perhaps some weeks or some months are uh, passed and people feel that there's you know, been some, uh, uh, some, some lack of expeditiousness. Uh, this has been a delay with a, with a capital D uh, of a sort that has uh, re really introduced uh, a lot of capital D despair for a lot of people about, uh, about the fundamental uh, integrity with which the government is proceeding uh, on these recommendations. Um, and it's, it's worth pausing for a second to remember um, the whole context of delay around this. So the original context in which uh, the Leahy Review was brought forward uh, was that the Liberal government had done away with the clear-cutting limits that had come out of the natural resource strategy. There, there was a, a, a great public outcry about that, uh, and, and the review was instituted. Um, and there, there was a long period when this same discussion about delay was being held uh, through, through those years. Uh, uh, when is the review going to come forward? Well, it's coming soon. It's coming in a month. It's coming in three months. It's coming in six months. Um, f finally, out of a, after a long period of discussion of delay, then we finally got uh, to the bringing forward of the, uh, of the review itself. Um, and so this three-year period of delay since then uh, follows uh, an already deeply established pattern of delay that had been uh, for years and years uh, before that. Uh, and the context at the moment is that everyone who has been involved in despair about this delay, now going back over years, knows now that the means by which the recommendations of the Leahy Review can be brought forward are all today at hand. Uh, this is the core piece of it. There's no disagreement about this. Everyone understands uh, that the technical, uh, mechanical, administrative means uh, to bring the Leahy Review and ecological forestry to life are present today in the hands of the government of Nova Scotia. So in this context, um, further, further delay um, is, is a, a very serious matter. Um, and it is, if the government feels it has solid reason to add to this, this sorry length of delay, the poor old Leahy Review, my gosh, if it, if it was a person, it would be going around on a walker with, with wrinkles and be bent all over. If the, the, uh, if, the, if the government has got some sound reason to accentuate and lengthen out this delay, then they owe it to the people of the province to give a demonstration of the integrity behind that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can do that by implementing this amendment and saying, in whatever time remains in this extended delay, uh, we, we uh, commit ourselves uh, to a moratorium on clear cutting until we get those recommendations implemented. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. Shall Clause 10 carry? Carry. Clause 11. I recognize the member for, for Dartmouth North. Thank you very much, Mix Chair. And I'd like to draw the uh, member's attention to NDP Chain Sheet 12. 
and propose the following amendment. Page four, paragraph 11B, delete and substitute the following. B, to address and mitigate barriers Nova Scotians face to testing and treatment of rural wells by 2026, including implementing the immediate removal of well water testing fees to detect the presence and level of, one, coliform bacteria at least every six months, two, arsenic at least every two years, three, lead at least every two years, and four, uranium at least every two years. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, thank you, uh, Mick Speaker. So basically, there is no reason we have to wait until 2026 to make a plan to address barriers uh, to well water testing. We can do this today. Uh, well water testing and fixing wells. So for us, this begins with ensuring that the cost of well water testing is not a barrier. Making tests free is a matter of public health and it's something we can do right away. And that's why we're bringing forth this amendment. It's easy, uh, it's, it's doable right now, and it's extremely important for many, many people. Thank you. Likes, or, or, or Atlantic likes it. <laughs> Shall the amendment carry? Oh. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 11 carry? Carry. Clause 12? Carry. I recognize the Honourable Member for Coal Harbour. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Madam Speaker. Ms. Speaker, uh, Liberal 9, page 4, clause 12, A, add 1 at the beginning, and B, add the following subclause immediately after subclause 1. 2, the Office of Equity Anti-Racism Initiatives shall support the goals to set out in subsection 1 by A, developing a consultation process to engage Indigenous, African, Nova Scotian, Black, and other racialized communities to collect data, both empirical and anecdotal, on the harms and negative health outcomes caused by environmental racism. B, consulting with Indigenous and African, Nova Scotian, and Black and other racialized communities towards developing and rec a reconciliation process to acknowledge and redress the harms and negative health outcomes caused by environmental racism. And C, develop a process by which applications, assessments, and approvals for projects located within five kilometers, five kilometer radius of indigenous, African, Nova Scotian, black, and other racialized communities include appropriate consultation, are culturally informed, and include a consideration for the economic development opportunities for those communities and their members. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. Thank you, Mix, Mix Chair, and I want to thank the Member for Coal Harbour for this amendment. Uh, Mix Chair, people in my riding of Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre, specifically the community of Whitney Pierre, have experienced environmental racism. Mm -hmm. They experienced it for many, many years, um, Mix Chair. In fact, learning about when I was younger, I was in grade six or seven, I believe, when, all, when the issue of the Sydney tar ponds came to a head, and I learned the term environmental racism for the first time. I was a grade six or seven, so I think maybe grade six. I think it was the spring, if, I'm not mis if, I'm, if my memory serves. And what we heard coming from the residents of the pier was high, high levels of cancers. Yeah. High and, and, and high rates of death, mix, mix here. It was, the, it was unimaginable. And if my memory serves, I believe the arsenic levels were somewhere between 70% or 75% higher than the, the federal average mixed chair. And so, 
This is something that is as, as the MLA for Cape Breton Center, Whitney Pier. Um, I, I really commend the, the member for Cole Harbor for bringing this forward because it is very important. And it's very important that we acknowledge the racism that was done. Um, like I said, my, my riding uh, was under the toxic steel coke ovens of the steel plant and many residents were displaced. Many got severely ill. Many died, mixed chair. And I think, the, and our st uh, yes, uh, to the member Cole yes, they are still, still dying and they are still getting sick, mixed speaker. They, we may have cleaned up the tar ponds, but that legacy still remains. And um, like I said, I, I commend the member for bringing this forward because it is important that we acknowledge it and it is important that we fix it. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member from Dartmouth East. I thank the Honourable Member from Cole Harbour for bringing forward this, this amendment. Um, certainly, uh, we agree with the spirit of the amendment. Um, as the Honourable Member knows, the government intends to introduce uh, legislation in the spring of 2022, and an all-party committee uh, to inform uh, that work is, is, is underway. And I want to assure the Honourable Member and all members of the House that environmental racism uh, will be a part of those discussions. Um, so there's also an amendment uh, that's, that will be tabled later on, um, uh, later tonight, that we believe gets to the root of uh, what's desired by the amendment that's been put forward by uh, the Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, and uh, we'll be accepting that uh, amendment later this evening. Thank you, Mixed Speaker. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 12 carry? carry. Shall Clause 13 carry? carry. Clause 14? I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I bring the member's attention to NDP change sheet number 13. <coughs> I move the following amendment at page 4, clause 14, delete and at the end of paragraph A, and immediately after paragraph A, the following paragraphs. B, to increase shellfish and seaweed aquaculture production by at least 5% by 2026. C, to implement an immediate moratorium on new leases for open net pen finfish farms. D, to fully implement the recommendations in a new regulatory framework for low impact, high value aquaculture in Nova Scotia prepared by Minor Doel and William Leahy with an emphasis on the value of social license and C, re-letter paragraph B as E. Um, Mix Chair, I can't resist the opportunity to build on the metaphor provided um, by my colleague uh, from Halifax Shabucto earlier. If, if the Leahy report were uh, a person who had aged significantly um, in the time since its implementation, the Doel Leahy report uh, <laughs> may be lying in the grave. Um, <laughs> this is um, a also co-authored by Professor William Leahy, whose name comes up quite a bit on the floor of this house for all of the wonderful work he's done on behalf of the province. Um, this, this legislation um, attempts to uh, amend the section dealing with aquaculture in a few ways. Um, and these all come out of, again, submissions that we heard at law amendments or that were provided to us by experts. One is to increase shellfish and seaweed aquaculture production by at least 5% by 2026. We're missing out, actually, on some economic opportunities in the aquaculture area. So seaweed, which is good for our oceans and a renewable resource and for which there is a market, um, that's, an, that's a budding industry and one that we feel like it would be great for government to support. Um, Similarly, shellfish, I mean, we all know about Nova Scotia oysters. Some of us are allergic, but those of us who aren't probably really enjoy <laughs> uh, eating them, um, and of course, lobster. But, you know, Nova Scotia produces almost no mussels anymore. And when you talk to people who, who eat mussels, um, the, the, bi the bivalve kind, um, the Premier has generously offered his mussels as examples of mussels that are produced in Nova Scotia. Um, as is evidence tonight, um, but uh, <laughs> but but 
but the bivalves, those mussels, um, that industry has almost uh, died. And, and that is because uh, neighboring provinces offer more support to that industry than we do, um, and more navigation. And again, um, you know, mussels, clams, like we, we've got family in Digby County, like you see those guys on the beach all the time, but they don't really have a market for what they're digging anymore. Most of that now is subsistence. Um, we think that we think that could grow. We think that government has a role to play in, in growing that industry. Um, and so that's what we're talking about in B. Um, and in C, you know, this is a conversation we've had. Uh, it is our position based on the conversations we've had uh, prior to the election, during the election, and more recently around the recent aquaculture bill, that there is not um, a clear social license for open net pen fin fish farms in Nova Scotia. Uh, that's not to say that, that there couldn't be in the future. I mean, it's, it's of course the government should test the waters. Uh, we don't believe it's there. And, and we know that in other jurisdictions in Canada, like British Columbia, there are moratoriums. And so what's happening? Uh, these industries that are being regulated out of existence in other perhaps more forward-looking jurisdictions because of the threat they pose to the natural environment, because of the threat that they pose to other seafood stocks, they're coming here. And they're coming here and they're opening their wallets and they're saying, Look, what, look at the economic benefit we could bring. Look at the jobs we could bring. But, but mixed chair, we need to look at the jobs they could cost. And we need to look at the economic devastation that those kinds of operations um, could, could in, essentially engender. And so again, we are asking for an immediate moratorium until it is clear if it ever is, that there is a social license for these kinds of open net pen um, bin fish farms, say that 10 times fast, um, to operate. Uh, and then D, um, full implementation of the Doel Leahy report, uh, which I might add uh, is the report that spells out that social license requirement. So when we say we want a moratorium, um, it's because this report has never been fully implemented. That social license have ne has never properly been acquired. And until that time, we believe it is a mistake to grant those licenses. Thank you, Mixed Chair. Shall the amendment carry? No. The, am the amendment is defeated. We're still in Clause 14. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Um, thank you very much, Mixed Chair, and I uh, draw attention to NDP Change Sheet 14. Um, and I propose the following amendment. Page 5, paragraph 14b, add, and to support the consumption of local food by developing a universal school fo food program that sources food from local farms by the end of 2023, at the end. Mixed Chair, uh, the goal of 20% um, uh, um, local food consumption by 2030 is not ambitious enough in this. So this is, this is one target that we believe is not ambitious enough and needs to improve. Um, the original goal was 20% by 2020 uh, added to the EGSPA legislation, legislation in 2012. So adding the goal of a universal school food program that sources food from local farms by the end of 2023 is ambitious, and it will address Nova Scotia's high rates of food insecurity in children. And making this a goal would also create the need to improve distribution systems for food from small and medium-sized farms. This is a completely doable and important, and very important uh, idea, and we just need political will, and we'd like to see it added to the act. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Mixed Chair. I, I feel compelled to speak on this because it's something we've been pushing for for quite some time. Uh, we do have uh, some food served in our schools, and I really want to take this opportunity, although it's 9.28, so who knows who, and it's not an answer, so nobody's ever going to see it, but maybe someone will tell the folks at Nourish Nova Scotia what an amazing job they do and what an amazing job the teachers and parents 
who volunteer to get breakfasts uh, to kids across the province do. But, Mix Chair, it is clear that that model is, number one, unsustainable um, based on the volunteer effort required, and number two, insufficient. So we have many times spoken of the child poverty reports in this house. Um, I don't have the reports at hand, but I think we can all acknowledge that child poverty is a massive issue in Nova Scotia. Um, we've moved the needle a little bit, but not enough. And the reality is, is in every, again, I suspect in every one of our districts, certainly in my own, there are kids who don't eat at school all day. And we hear about it from teachers all the time. And we hear about it in the form of fistfights or need for more supports or vandalism or things that sound like behavioral problems. But if you dig, uh, you know, administrators or teachers will often say, well, that mostly happens after lunch, right? Like, that mostly happens in the afternoon. And why is that? It's because kids haven't eaten all day. And it's endemic across our province. And we believe, again, that we have a role to play. And not only can we provide healthy, nutritious food to our students, but we can support our agricultural sector while we do it. We can increase our local food production. We can increase uh, the revenue for local farmers. And we can really create a virtuous cycle. Uh, so for that reason, um, I wholeheartedly support this amendment, hope the government will consider it. Um, and if they don't, be sure that it will come back again soon in some form. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 14 carry? Oh. oh, my apologies. I recognize the honourable member for Cumberland North. Thank, thank you, Mix Speaker. And I propose the amendment to Clause 14. A, delete and at the end of paragraph A. B, delete 2030 in third line of paragraph B and substitute 2025 and 40% of consumption of local food by 2030. And C, add the following paragraph immediately after paragraph B. C, to include in the provincial food strategy developed under clause, under clause and B, supports for both domestic and commercial greenhouses to increase local food production 12 months of the year. And next speaker, I propose this amendment uh, for a few reasons. Um, since I've been elected, uh, the members who have been here with me for that duration of time know that one of uh, the goals that I believe we should be trying to attain in this government is to, to inc increase local food production. Um, I believe and many experts believe that food security is something that we need to uh, make more of a priority. Um, the, the amount of money that stayed in our province has actually gone down. Um, in in uh, 2008, we had uh, our, sorry, I don't have the statistics. The library were going to send me in a document. I'll just say that the numbers have gone down. We've gone to 17%, down to 13% um, as far as the amount of food dollars staying here in the province. So I'd love to see this bill include some sort of a subsidy or some sort of a financial incentive for um, domestic use of greenhouses so people could grow their own food, not just during May, J June, July, and August and September, but at uh, 12 months of the year. And there's a lot of satisfaction in growing your own food, but more importantly, it, it will lead to an increased uh, amount of food security for families across Nova Scotia. And I also believe, Mech Speaker, there's opportunity for uh, our province to, to subsidize, to, to incent more commercial and industrial greenhouses throughout the province. We have a few now, but um, we, I know we have great geothermal potential in Cumberland, and there's other areas around the province as well, uh, Mech Speaker. Certainly when you read about climate change and the potential effects globally, uh, food production is one of the serious um, things that that uh, people talk about, and it's it's not just here; it's it's globally around the world. And one of the things that was discussed recently at COP26 was the possibility of tariffs being added 
uh, by some countries on um, any imports that come into their country uh, by countries that are not currently uh, using carbon pricing. So when you look at that theory and you look at the possibility of that happening, it's really a shift away from globalization. And so countries that are not taking climate change seriously and, and, and doing carbon pricing, we would be adding a tariff onto any import, including food, that comes into our country. And the fact is we import over 80% of our food to, to Nova Scotia. So that is going to be an added cost. It's going to be, um, it's also a risk. So, so mixed speaker, I believe for, for these reasons, we need to make food security, local food production, more of a priority. I am curious, and I will speak with the minister uh, privately about this, I am curious where the 20% target came from. I'm not sure if that's based on any type of research or recommendation by, by a, an organization like the Nova Scotia Federation of Agriculture. Um, I'm not sure where that target came from, but certainly the numbers that I've been reading over the last few years um, suggest that we should be attaining much higher amounts of local food production, anywhere up to 50%, so that we can ensure that we can feed our own people. And uh, food is one of the most basic needs, um, mixed speaker, when you're talking about health. Uh, and I believe we need to be ensuring the safety and food security of our people, and that food security should be made a priority. And for this reason, I table this amendment. Thank you, mixed speaker. <coughs> Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 14 carry? carry. Clause 15? Carry. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre, Whitney Pierre. Thank you, Mixed Chair. I draw the member's attention to Change Sheet NDP 15. And I and I move uh, page five, paragraph 15A, delete and substitute the following. A, on its own and in coordination with municipalities, expanding as soon as possible, extended producer responsibility for packaging and paper products and reduce, reducing the use of single-use plastics. Mixed chair, um, I, the, by, by moving this amendment, I'm, I'm encouraging this government to um, immediately adopt EPR. Um, the municipalities have done the, uh, done the work. While I was in CBRM Council, uh, we were told the work, the, municipal, the, the group of councillors that were together, and I'm sure some of my other colleagues within council would know this, that this group of councillors that were sent to be on the committee did the work. They did the work a few years ago, mixed chair. The, the, their recommendations on EPR for PPP was uh, presented to the minister of the time, and uh, it's been waiting, waiting for to be adopted. Um, it's collecting dust. Hope, I hope it's not, though, but it feels like it's collecting dust on the side of someone's desk. I hope that's not the case. I hope that it is not dusted. I hope that uh, someone is taking a look at it. But, mixed Chair, I believe it should be, it, it should be in this bill, that we should have the fact that we are moving on the adoption of EPR for PPP. And as I said, the work's done. The government need not drag, drag its feet. All they have to do is make it happen. Look at the document and do it. So, and we know, mixed chair, we already pay for the cost of EPR and in many of our products. There, and we know that there's a broad support for the adoption of EPR for PPP. Businesses appreciate the consistency of, EP, of EPR across many, many jurisdictions, a mixed chair. And so I, I implore the government side, I implore the government side to listen to this. I implore the government side to finally, after 
Oh gosh, I'm trying to think. 2018, 20, 2018, 2019, I believe that the work had been done, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so that's a long time to sit and wait. So I asked, um, I asked the members to, uh, to accept this motion and to put EPR for PPP in this bill because it is vitally important to our municipalities and it is vitally important to Nova Scotians. Thank you, Mix Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Uh, thank you, Mr. I appreciate the comments uh, from my colleague across the aisle. Uh, make no mistake, uh, this government will be moving to expand and extended producer responsibility for PPP and uh, our municipal units throughout Nova Scotia can expect uh, to be contacted by, contacted by this minister. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth South. Uh, Mr. Chair, I can't wait to vote on this because it sounds like we just got a commitment and if that commitment is real, let's see it in the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shall the amendment carry? No. We're still on clause 15. That previous amendment was defeated, and I recognize now the honourable member for Timberley Prospect. Thank you, Mix Chair and Change Sheet uh, Lib 10, page 5, paragraph 15B, delete 300 in the first line and substitute 200. Uh, Mix Speaker, I think this target is actually potentially the weakest, uh, to put it generously, in the, in the bill. Um, the government is taking a target for solid waste from uh, 2000, 2007. From the PC uh, bill in 2007, the, uh, the original egg spot bill, uh, which uh, it was, was looking the to achieve... The member for Timberley Prospect has the floor. We still had consultation, which we were going through, and I can guarantee you we would not have put 300 kilograms uh, in regulations because it already is uh, a target in law in the province. Um, and the reason why it's so weak is although we haven't achieved it, we are at around, I think, 400 kilograms uh, per person. I haven't looked lately, but uh, there are regions of the province and municipalities that have achieved it. Um, from memory, I know Digby was one of the ones that have advanced a lot, uh, and uh, HRM has done a lot of work with clear bags, um, and so we shouldn't have a target that's nine years away from now when we have regions of the province already achieving it. Um, there is a lot uh, to be said about the last amendment uh, around advancing uh, different EPR streams for paper and packaging, and uh, you can do uh, the government can do that beyond. Uh, those items uh, that will achieve uh, lower waste per person. Um, I mentioned clear bags. We can actually enforce uh, green carts in all municipalities. Uh, there are some that have exemptions. Um, and so there are a lot of different ways. Uh, we banned plastic bags uh, in the last government. Uh, the new government can ban more plastics. The new government can ban more items uh, that go into landfills currently. And I'm obviously uh, interested in what goes into landfills because uh, we, we host uh, HRM's landfill in my constituency. And so I took a keen interest in solid waste uh, before I, I was elected. And uh, this is one goal that I think, um, in terms of advancing the circular economy, um, that this one is a no-brainer uh, for me. Um, so we, we are proposing 200 kilograms uh, per person by 2030. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Mix Chair. Um, I just rise in support of this motion. Um, I think uh, as uh, the member um, said, this is again achievable. Like I think a lot of the things that we are uh, suggesting tonight it's an achievable target. It's a target we need to hit. Uh, we did, again heard presentations, uh, really clear ones about this at, at the Law Amendments Committee about the need to reduce the solid waste stream. Um, EPR is part of that, of course. I know there is support, uh, particularly from those who have worked at the municipal level on the government side and across this house. Um, 
it saves money uh, for different orders of government um, and it makes sense. So I urge again uh, the government to support this amendment and it has our support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shall the amendment carry? No. No. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 15 carry? Yeah. Clause 16. I recognize, the, I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to draw the member's attention to the change sheet NDP 16. And the amendment is as follows. Page 5, paragraph 16E. A, delete climate change education and sustainability in the first line and substitute environmental education, including education about climate change and biodiversity. And B, add immediate updates to the curricula and immediately after with in the second line. So 16E is to promote and support climate change education and sustainability through the knowledge and teachings of Ndugam and environmental stewardship and ongoing curricular renewal. The development of inclusive and accessible resources and professional learning that incorporates diversity and honors two eyed seeing. This request was made to ensure that these changes were made immediately so that they don't take years to take effect. Referring to, the, to environmental education as opposed to climate education recognizes the broader range of concerns. We would also move to amend the wording so that climate change and biodiversity are both emphasized, recognizing that these are twin crises that exasperate each other. We have seen such leadership, thank you. We, we have seen such leadership from our young people on this issue of climate. And as well, we've seen it uh, in presentation earlier today outside, because they are our future and they, we owe it to them to, to do the right thing when it comes to the climate change of, of our province. Um, we also owe it to them to invite them into this conversation with opportunities to learn and discuss these issues in their classrooms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 16 carry? Yeah. Clause 17? Yeah. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that. Um, I'd like to draw the member's attention to Change Sheet NDP 17. The amendment is as follows. Page 5, Clause 17, add and to create a panel to address environmental racism by the end of 2022 with recommendations for redress coming to the province by the end of 2023 at the end. So this goal is in respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and is to initiate in 2022 ongoing work with racialized and marginalized communities. And I'm, I'm extremely happy that um, there is support from all ends of this, uh, the tables here, but I, I also want to make, make it known that, um, you know, we have to recognize that environmental degradation, de degradation has been experienced by people equally in this province. And these examples include Whitney Pier, Africville, Shelburne, and the list could go on and on and on about environmental racism. So I'm glad that we're going to embrace this um, because it was a serious omission that was, met, that was mentioned by many of our presenters at Law Amendments. Um, uh, these words that I speak are people's amendments. These are the people that were outside. These are the people that were sending us emails. These are the people that we represent as an MLA in our riding. So I want to make sure that when we say the words that we say standing here, we're not saying it because it's us. We're saying it because people want us to be their voices. So we have to listen. I'm extremely tired. It, it is exhausting to stand up here and listen completely to the the. the constant no's and nays when we're supposed to be building up a great bill and, 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 and creating something together for our province. But I just, I just have to say that. So I appreciate um, you listening to my words and you will continue to hear it as we go along. I recognize the honorable member for Preston. 
Not much to follow after my colleague here. Uh, however, I wanted to just say that I think it's really important. Um, you know, African Nova Scotian voices have been a voice that, voice that has been left out of these conversations. So I really commend, uh, we put a bill similar, similar to this uh, to my colleague from member for Neat Halifax, Needham. Uh, and so I just want to just also just talk about a little bit about the importance of how this uh, legislation will be embedded in the African Nova Scotian community and Indigenous community. Um, I think one of the things that's obvious that this work has been ongoing and we wouldn't be here uh, really discussing this but for Dr. Ingrid Waldron. Uh, I had an opportunity to work with her on the Enrich Program uh, project and she did a phenomenal job. Uh, the other thing to that is this consultation that we're, that is being embedded in the legislation I think is even more important because it does give African Nova Scotians a voice at a table and we know that when there's diversity at tables better decisions are made and more opportunities are created. So I want to just uh, acknowledge the importance of this and then also that uh, what this bill will do in this new legislation will also allow access that hasn't been al allowed before and that we know there's communities in African Nova Scotia in particular the riding that I live uh, there's communities that oftentimes there's hazardous and uh, waste that are beside communities. People from outside of community are dumping in the area. So I think this legislation really speaks to the importance of the systemic historical context of environmental racism. And so I just want to commend uh, the legislation going forward and, and look forward to, to continuing the work uh, the, of, amongst all my colleagues at the table. So thank you. Shall the amendment carry? Yes. The amendment is carried. Shall Clause 17 carry? Clause 18? I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mix Chair. Um, I draw the member's attention to Chain Sheet NDP 18. And I move the following amendment. Page 5, add the following clause immediately after Clause 17. The government's goal with respect to offshore oil and gas is A, to end all fossil fuel subsidies, including research and promotion, by the end of 2022, and B, to end all calls for bids for oil and gas exploration, change numbering and cross-reference accordingly. Mixed Chair, uh, as has been mentioned tonight, uh, we undergo these deliberations under the shadow of COP26 and in the wake of a number of international reports, uh, each one more dire than the last. There is now international consensus among client scientists that fossil fuels must stay in the ground for us to achieve the target of climate reduction that will even approximate our children being able to live the lives that we have lived. There is no reason for us to be promoting an industry on the decline. We have heard commitments from this government, and we have seen commitments, frankly, Mix Chair, in this bill, which will pass tonight, to a low carbon, net zero future. And if those commitments are real, Mix Chair, they are simply not compatible with future oil and gas exploration. Now, I say this fully cognizant that required for us to do anything like this and be responsible representatives of our constituents is a concomitant plan for a just transition. The workers in these industries have the right to expect that their government will help them transition to good paying jobs of the future that will ensure that they are not the casualties of this transition. And it is in that spirit that I ask the government to accept this amendment. Thank you, Mix Chair. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 18 carry? Carry. Shall Clauses 19 and 20 carry? Carry. Clause 21, I recognize the Honourable Member for Sydney, Member 2. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm oh, sorry, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would like uh, members to refer to uh, Liberal Change Sheet 11 
page six, clause 21, sub clause one, add the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets and immediately after of in the fourth line. Uh, B, sub clause two, delete may in the first line and substitute shall. And C, add the following sub clause immediately after sub clause two. Uh, number three, the annual report referred to in subsection one must comply with the regulations established pursuant to clause 23 1F, uh, changing numbers and cross referencing accordingly. Uh, uh, mixed, uh, mixed speaker, uh, these amendments have been suggested by the East Coast Environmental Law and Law Amendments Committee. Uh, the addition of greenhouse gas emission reduction targets clarifies that GHG emissions are part of the annual reporting to the House of Assembly. Uh, the addition of the new subclause 2 is intended to express the intent and expectations that additional requirements for the annual report will be in future regulations. Uh, and that renumber clause 3 is to change from may to shall, seek advice from the roundtable in preparing uh, the annual report, uh, which governments in the past has uh, used the roundtable uh, in making many of the decisions around policy. So uh, that is uh, our change, uh, Liberal uh, change sheet 11. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 21 carry? Carry. Shall clause 22 carry? Carry. Clause 23, I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mixed Speaker, and I'd like to draw the member's attention to, I believe, the last change sheet of the night. I might be wrong. Is that right? Well, if you're that disappointed, we can, we can drum up a couple more amendments. Uh, so NDP change sheet 19, Mixed, speak, mixed Chair, uh, and I move the following amendment. Page six, add the following clause immediately after clause 22. 23 one, the governor and council shall appoint an environmental commissioner to work with the office of the auditor general. Two, the environmental commissioner appointed under subsection one shall report annually on the progress of the achievement of the goals set out in this act, as well as any other environmental matters considered appropriate by the auditor general. Change numbering and cross references accordingly. So, uh, mix chair, with all of this, an independent assessment is needed to make sure that we are achieving the goals we are setting forth in this very important piece of legislation. The, the planet depends on making sure that we actually do what we say we're going to do in this piece of legislation. We have seen the important work that the Auditor General has done in the past on many other uh, things. And so um, to have an independent environment commissioner working with the Auditor General on this only makes sense. This kind of arm's length analysis needs to be brought to bear on these targets and these goals. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 23 carry? carry? Shall the remaining clauses 24 and 25 carry? carry. Shall the title carry? carry? Shall the bill carry? carry. 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 <laughs> Look at you guys. Really? They just called for it. Are they actually calling for a recorded vote? There has been a call for a recorded vote. The bells will ring until the whips are satisfied.
there has been a call for a recorded vote. The clerks will conduct the, the vote. I recognize the clerk. Brad Johns. Yes. Tori Rushton. Yes. Barbara Adams. Yes. Kim Masland. Yes. Tim Houston. Yes. Alan McMaster. Yes. Carla McFarland. Yes. Michelle Thompson. Yes. John Lohr. Pat Dunn. Yes. Tim Hallman. Yes. Steve Craig. Yes. Dave Ritzy. Yes. Brian Wong. Yes. Susan Corkum Greek. Yes. Brian Comer. Yes. Colton LeBlanc. Yes. Jill Balzer. Yes. Trevor Boudreau. Yes. Greg Morrow. Yes. Becky Druin. Yes. Larry Harrison. Yes. Chris Palmer. Yes. John A. McDonald. Yes. Melissa Sheehy Richard. Yes. John White. Yes. Danielle Barkhouse. Yes. Tom Taggart. Yes. Nolan Young. Yes. Kent Smith. Yes. Patricia Arab. Tony Ince. Yes. yes. Angela Simmons. Yes. Zach Churchill. Aye. Ian Rankin. Yes. Derek Momberkat. Yes. Kelly Regan. Claudia Chender. Yes. Gary Burrell. Yes. Susan LeBlanc. Yes. Keith Bain. Susie Hansen. Yes. Kendra Coombs. Yes. Rafa Di Costanzo. Zo. Yes. <laughs> Ali Duale. Yes. Laura Lee Nickel. Yes. Keith Irving. Oh. Brendan McGuire. Yes. Ben Jessam. Yep. <laughs> Elizabeth Smith McCrossan. Yes. Yeah. Carmen Kerr. Yes. Braden Clark. Yes. Fred Tilly. Yes. Ronnie LeBlanc. Oui. Results of the vote, uh, yes, 49, no, zero. The bill is carried. <laughs> leader. Thank you, Mix Chair. Will you please call Bill Number 48, Town of Lunenburg School Annex Lands Act. Bill 48, an act to clarify the title to Town of Lunenburg School Annex Lands on the Tannery Road. I recognize the chair. Hmm? I recognize the clerk. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Chair, Bill 48 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Private and Local Bills on November 2nd, 2021, without amendments, and contains four clauses and a schedule. Clause one. 
Shall the remaining clauses carry? Two to three. Shall the schedule carry? Shall the title carry? Shall the bill carry? Bill is carried. The bill is carried. I recognize the government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you please call Erda McCann? Yeah. Club Act? No? No. i sorry. I can't roll my tongue like that. I'm sorry. Let's see if Bill 50, an act to amend Chapter 12 of the Acts of 1997. The Art American uh, Club Act. I recognize the clerk. <laughs> uh, Mixed Chair, Bill 50 was referred to the House by the Standing Committee on Private and Local Bills on November 2nd, 2021, without amendments and contains one clause. Shall Clause 1 carry? Carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. The bill is carried. recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mixed Chair. I move that you do now rise and report these bills. The motion is carried. This committee will now rise and report its business to the House. Order. The chair of the committee of the whole house on bills reports. I recognize the clerk. That the committee of the whole house on bills has met and considered the following bills. Bills 43, 48, 50, 61, 62, 63, and 64 without amendments. And bill 57 with certain amendments. And the chair has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favorable consideration of the house. That these bills be read a third time on a future day. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mix Chair. Um, before we end government business today, I would like to bring to the attention of the members that we do have a birthday girl in the house today. Uh, Minister Corkum Greek is celebrating her birthday here. I can't think of a better way to spend your birthday than here tonight with all of you lovely people. Happy birthday to Patricia as well.
concludes government business for the day. I know everyone's disappointed. We really could probably still pull in another dress and reply if you'd like, but <laughs> okay. I move that the House do now rise to meet again on Thursday, November 4th, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 11.59. Government business will include bills for third reading, number 61, 62, 63, 64, bills number 43, 57, 48, and 50, Committee of the Whole House on Bills 68 and 71, and address and reply. Thank you. The motion is to adjourn. Those in favour, say aye. aye. The motion is carried. We stand adjourned until 1 p.m. tomorrow.